All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody. We're going to get started. On behalf of my co-chair, Bob Gish and I, we welcome you warmly to uh, this uh, rendition of HBV HDV Act Connect. And if you're wondering what the Act stands for, first let me say it took us weeks to think of an acronym that we thought fit well, but it stands for Advancing Curative uh, Treatments, ACT. We all know that this is a very fertile area for investigation. Some of us are investing the preponderance of our um, professional time into trying to advance this field toward the cherished goal of uh, functional cure of hepatitis B. And uh, we've all participated to various degrees in uh, various trials, advisory capacities, and certainly uh, as clinicians. In addition to the uh, group here in person, uh, we have over 100 people online, and we welcome everybody equally uh, to participate in this program. Uh, several of our presenters will also be presenting virtually, but they will be available for uh, questions and answers and for the panel discussion. We've allotted a lot of time to panel discussion here. Uh, we think that's very important for an evolving area like this uh, to enjoy a, an open and free exchange of ideas. Uh, today, we're going to talk about hepatitis B and tomorrow, hepatitis D. Um, here are the two co-chairs, myself and my esteemed colleague, Dr. Gish. And these are our uh, equally esteemed uh, faculty consisting of uh, truly some of the world's thought leaders, uh, leading clinicians, uh, scientists, people who combine both in this very fertile field. We welcome uh, everybody and look forward to all the talks. This is our agenda for today. We'll have four talks uh, for the first session, followed by what's slated as a 45 minute panel discussion. And um, then we will uh, have a brief break and come back to have uh, four additional talks with another uh, generously timed uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'll moderate the first. Uh, Bob will, uh, will will moderate the second, but I, I think we'll each uh, come up to the podium. So the, both co-chairs will help in the moderation process and probably have an opinion or two to contribute as well. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Professor M.F. Yoon sitting in the audience, one of the world's most uh, prolific and distinguished hepatitis uh, B researchers who's made seminal contributions over many years. And one of the reasons I give you a shout out is, of course, we're grateful to everybody who came, but I think you have the distinction, M.F., of traveling by far the longest distance to get here, all the way from Hong Kong, and uh, we're very grateful. Of course, Adam has also joined us from Canada, and we'll be hearing from Jorg, who uh, is uh, not present, but... Uh, participating with equal enthusiasm. So with that, uh, we have a couple of more housekeeping items. Uh, actually, the hepatitis D program is tomorrow, and uh, we'll be ending again with another generous panel discussion with lots of ideas. We uh, profusely thank our supporter, Gilead Sciences, for supporting uh, this program as they have for so many in the past. These are the learning objectives. Uh, this is the accreditation statement, disclosure, how to claim CME credit. It's very simple. You just scan the uh, QR code in your conference booklet um, and then uh, just follow the, the directions. I think it's pretty intuitive. Um, if you need any help at all, the CALDF people will be very happy to assist you as they have me on so many occasions in the past for uh, similar and unrelated matters. So with that, let's get started. And I'll begin with uh, the first talk that I'm privileged to give called HBV Overview of the last three years for drug development. Um, it was initially called in the program phase two and three trials, but we really only have complete data for phase two trials. We're legally looking forward to phase three trials, but that's what I'll be discussing today. These are my disclosures. And the first question I'm going to pose uh, to the group is why aim for functional cure, which is our cherished goal of HPV infection in the first place, given the relative ease with which we can treat this already. And here are the potential advantages that you're all familiar with, avoiding risks of long-term drug toxicity, which are really minimal, reducing costs associated with uh, long-term or indefinite therapy. A very important one is avoiding the risks of hepatitis flares with discontinuation of therapy and reducing the risk of reactivation years after treatment under exceptional circumstances like the administration of certain immunosuppressive or chemotherapeutic agents. But I think the real reason for this uh, uh, cherished goal that we're pursuing uh, uh, so diligently is to improve clinical outcomes. And we do have evidence like this robust study from Asia from Professor Yip showing that in uh, the long term, cumulative incidence of HCC in this enormous database, enormous database of 20,000 people, um, the risk of HCC in the group at the bottom who had cleared HPSAG was very low. 
Uh, those with complete viral suppression fared better, and the patients who had incomplete viral suppression had the highest cumulative risk of HCC. So HCB, HPSAG clearance is clearly associated with a lower risk of HCC. Now, a concept that I want to introduce early in the whole program, really, much less my talk, is that of T-cell exhaustion as a product of chronic antigenemia and the potential benefit of immune activation by antigen suppression, because many of our current uh, clinical trials and the agents that we're using in those trials center around the idea that by suppressing certain viral antigens, and of course, most of that is focused on hepatitis B surface antigen right now, which has long been thought to suppress the T-cell response and result in this phenomenon of T-cell exhaustion are at the center of everything that we're trying to do with agents like siRNAs, antisense oligonucleotides, and so on. And this uh, slide nicely depicts cells becoming uh, literally exhausted from a physiologic viewpoint with longstanding exposure to antigens. The y-axis here shows HPV DNA, but I would ask you to transpose in your mind so this could be surface antigen if we manage to reduce that dramatically with therapeutic agents. Waking up these T cells, so on the right, they become activated and stop expressing uh, things like uh, PD1 or PDL1, other inhibitory receptors, CTLA4, TIM1, and so on. So we'll be talking a lot about that concept. Of the agents studied in phase two in the past three years, or the agents that have been studied in phase two in the past three years, the ones I'm going to focus on today are siRNAs and the CAMs, the capsid assembly modulators, and I've circled those in red. Um, there are others here, like the NAPs or nucleic acid polymers that have been studied, and interesting data came out about three years ago in an article in gastroenterology with interesting effects. But I, I, for one, have not seen much about this in the interim, and I really want to focus on what's been going on in the last couple of years. But perhaps we'll hear more about that class. And of course, there are many other ideas here that people are focusing on, and we'll hear about some of those from Professor Peterson. I want to talk about the capsid assembly modulators, or CAMs for short, short. And let's remember these are inhibitors of core protein. And the putative mechanisms of action include, first of all, um, potential to inhibit pgRNA encapsidation and DNA replication. That's number one. Then capsid disassembly. I didn't appreciate till we started talking about the CAM class that core inhibitors might, or capsid assembly modulators might actually and apparently do in vitro inhibit disassembly, but may require higher concentrations to do that. And that may have been the limitation of our first generation CAMs that I'll get to in a moment. And then uh, core protein also has regulatory effects on CC, uh, DNA, CCC DNA amplification and expression. And so perhaps that's a third mechanism by which core protein inhibitors might uh, put into effect some beneficial effects for patients. So we all know about Vebrocorvia, which was a first-generation CAM for treatment naive patients, and another study along with it. Um, uh, this one published by Mark Sulkowski, the other by uh, Professor Yoon. And I'll show you that in a moment. And this looks at effects on, on viral DNA and viral RNA in, uh, obviously, treatment naive patients, because treatment experienced patients on nukes don't express DNA. They do express RNA. And you can see that we were very excited initially when the capsid assembly modulator, Vebrocorvia, in combination with entecavir, sorry about that EVR, it's ETV, um, did affect more viral suppression in terms of HBV DNA and profoundly more suppression of HBV RNA, which is a marker that, as you know, is garnering great interest these days, than entecavir alone. Um, but the bottom line was that there was no uh, demonstrable statistically significant effect on hepatitis B surface antigen, antigen expression, uh, either at the 24-week time point, which is the centerpiece in this published paper in Journal of Hepatology last year, and none at later time points that have also been reported at meetings. And the ultimate bottom line is that no patient cleared hepatitis B surface antigen. If we look at Professor Ewan's paper, uh, which was a sister paper to the other, again, uh, the drug had no significant effect on hepatitis B surface antigen, either in E-positive or E-negative patients. So the hope for this class, and there's still considerable hope in this class, and Professor Yoon is going to talk at great length about this uh, in his uh, discussion in a, in a little while, um, is that perhaps more potent uh, core inhibitors or CAMs will inhibit those secondary or, if you will, tertiary mechanisms that I elaborated upon a few minutes ago, and I'll leave the rest to him. The anti-sense approaches will get a lot more of my attention because we have so much robust data and so many learnings, so to speak, that have emanated from studies with this class of drugs. So I want to remind you that there is a difference between small interfering RNAs, which are given medicinally as uh, duplex molecules, 
or single-stranded RNAs that are antisense oligonucleotides. With regard to the latter, ASOs, so-called, target messenger RNA of any target you choose to design that molecule against, and the resulting interaction results in degradation of the target mRNA by RNA, RNA H, which is pretty straightforward. The other is a little more complex, and the biology of it has been pretty well worked out, but under the influence of two predominant proteins called DICER and another one called Argonaut, an RNA inhibitory silencing complex or risk complex is uh, created uh, into which the uh, pharmacologic agent is uh, processed by DICER and then imported, and ultimately under the influence of the other enzyme as well, this results in degradation of the selected mRNA, in this case, hepatitis B surface antigen RNA, and potentially other viral antigens as well. But we really have focused on the surface antigen, as I've mentioned repeatedly. This is another of Professor Ewan's trials, the REEF-1 trial, um, which we were pleased to participate in along with many co-investigators. And um, this has been presented in final form, and um, I, I believe there are attempts to get it published at this time. There were six arms, but really the only arm that I'd like you to focus on is the one shown in dark blue, uh, the third down in the column on the left, the JNJ3989, the initial name for the drug, 200 milligram dose. Um, these agents are given weekly, uh, excuse me, yes, uh, they can, sorry, the antisense oligonucleotides require more frequent administration. I had that on a previous slide. The siRNAs require less frequent administration, have been studied most frequently with Q4 week intervals, and that's how they were given in this study. But they can also be given Q8 or Q12 weeks, as I'll show you with another siRNA, seemingly to fairly equivalent effect. The baseline characteristics shown here are that about a third of the patient were e-antigen positive. Liver stiffness was... Uh, fairly low. These are fiber scans, so 5.3, 5.4, pretty normal. And you can see some of the other demographic features at baseline. And one of the bottom line slides for this study is that the most, the, the greatest percentage of patients who reach HBSAG less than 100 IU per mil at week 48, week, at week 48 of therapy, this being the uh, prescribed duration of therapy per protocol, was in that, um, well, it was in the 200 milligram group shown in dark blue. But an interesting comparison has been made between the JNJ3989 100 milligram group and the 100 milligram group shown in green on the right, combined with the capsid assembly modulator uh, made by Janssen in this case. It's not the same one, but, but we think it's uh, pretty much equivalent in terms of its effects as a, as a capsid assembly modulator. And so we talked, a new cottage industry arose when this came out about a year and a half ago of trying to figure out why there should be an apparent antagonistic effect between the siRNA and CAN, and perhaps we can discuss that during the panel discussion, because um, I don't think we've come up with a magical answer yet, but observations from other studies that have combined um, agents of these same two classes have not reproduced this observation, so we don't even know how real or important it is, and I'm sure MF will have uh, things to say about that as well as the other discussions. The maximum decline, as I've already uh, strongly hinted, was in the JNJ3989 200 milligram group with a mean 2.6 uh, log reduction without the CAM, there was no CAM with 200 milligrams. And um, the uh, E positive patients had the most profound declines, as you can see in the bottom line, the dark blue line. You'll see uh, in a few minutes, that's in contradistinction to what you get with the ASOs. And maybe MF or some of the other discussants can explain or speculate about uh, why they should have uh, opposite effects. But here it was the antigen positive patients, specifically those not currently treated with a nuke who had the most profound decline in response to this agent. Um, the primary endpoint was the percent of patients meeting nuke stopping uh, criteria. And you see the same patterns here with uh, maximum uh, effects for the 200 milligram group, um, which also encompasses data acquired during the follow-up period, as well as the on-study period. The nuke stopping criteria are elaborated in the bracket on the right. Also notable is that ALT uh, flares occurred infrequently, uh, not only on treatment, but after treatment. At the bottom, I present to you that about 3% of patients reported ALT flares altogether during treatment, um, but about 7% of those in the 200 milligram arm had on treatment ALT flares. I think we're going to discuss ALT flares a lot, both during our talks and during the panel discussion today. One patient in the 3989 200 milligram arm experienced an ALT flare post-treatment after stopping uh, nukes. So in summary, this uh, very important trial showed that three quarters of patients did achieve surface antigen levels of less than 100 IU per mil, which was about a two log drop from baseline. 
and roughly 20% met the primary endpoint, uh, which uh, stated that they were to uh, have been able to uh, stop nuke by the uh, specified criteria in the protocol. But the bottom line is no sustained clearance of HPSAG. Uh, tolerability and safety were not problematic. This is Reef 2, which was strictly an uh, E antigen negative uh, population, and all the patients came into the study, which was 48 weeks in duration, already uh, virologically uh, suppressed on nukes. But the key point here, and the point you have to keep in mind when we go over this study briefly, is that all patients stopped not only study drugs and nukes at week 48, which gave us an opportunity, gave the investigators, I should say, I was not in this study, um, 24 and then 48 week follow-up time points at which to evaluate the uh, outcomes. You can see the suppression curves. And one thing that strikes you immediately um, is that there was nearly a, a mean two log reduction in the actively treated group, none in the new group during the first 48 weeks. And then a very slight return, but still a profound persistent viral expression, at least on average, down to a mean of 1.5 log. So uh, really patients uh, came back nowhere uh, near their initial levels of HPSAG for the most part. People have commented on the perturbations in the gray line, patients who had only been on a nuke and stopped, suggesting that those little wobbles and ultimately resulting in a mean log drop of about 0.5 in HBSAG levels may have, it probably reflect something biologically going on, perhaps a little bit of immune restoration. Um, we can talk about that in the panel discussion as well. And uh, this shows that uh, if you look at HPV DNA alone on the left or composite scores of various degrees of HPV DNA suppression and HBSAG uh, suppression, that consistently the patients who received the two active agents in addition to the nuke fared better. Um, moreover, rates of nuke restart by the criteria set in the protocol were over uh, three times in the placebo group that they were in the actively treated group. ALT flares were uh, quite notable here in a significant number of patients, uh, particularly in the nuke alone group. Uh, you can see almost 25% had ALT flares of over 10 times normal, enough to strike at least a little fear in all of our hearts, and certainly a phenomenon that in clinical practice warrants close observation and uh, the never-ending dilemma that comes with that of, well, should I start the nuke now or give it another week? Uh, and I, I'm personally rather aggressive about restarting, but then in my practice, I have to confess, I'm not particularly aggressive about stopping in the first place. That'll be another topic for discussion today. You can see the relative rarity of uh, post-treatment flares, that is after even the nuke was stopped in the actively treated group. So there's something very interesting going on about um, whatever extra degree of uh, suppression is occurring with the active agents um, help prevent post-treatment flares. Now, there was one very severe flare, and this is one of the most famous uh, individual uh, patient case reports in hepatology in the last few years. It actually got a mini paper of its own from Dr. Agrawal, who was the principal investigator, and this happened in the UK. And this was a patient who, per protocol, as I showed you, actually uh, stopped all therapy, at which time at week 48, the surface antigen level was 652 IU per mil, a level at which we would not stop, I believe we would all agree, in clinical practice. And this patient had a severe flare, which uh, despite all due efforts to reinstitute therapy and salvage the patient, he went into liver failure and needed a transplant. Fortunately, was reported to do well um, after that. But that's the outcome we fear even in clinical practice, much less a clinical trial when you stop all therapy. Um, finally, there's uh, one more siRNA that I, I'd like to note called AB729, and this study was given for 48 weeks, another paper from Professor Yu, and I told you he was very prolific, and this shows sustained S antigen decline at week 72, and if you follow the numbers, you can see that even though there was a lot of dose ranging here with uh, three different doses, um, and uh, Q4 week to Q12 week intervals that I alluded to earlier, um, all the patients did... Uh, pretty equally well, but the maximum reduction was in a group of patients who are E antigen uh, positive and uh, viremic. And two of the patients in that group actually were later reported at the recent ASLD meeting to have sustained clearance of HBSAG. So very happily, we no longer have to concede that nobody has yet effected functional cure um, with an SIRNA because it has happened and it's a fascinating and important biologic proof of concept, but clearly the numbers don't add up to a, a revolution ready to materialize quite yet. 
but very noteworthy anyway. Here's another siRNA called VIR2218, which was given alone or in combination with peg interferon. And I would like you to note that in the last group, the only group that got the siRNA and the peg interferon all the way out to week 48, uh, there was the most profound reduction in um, HPSAG level shown on the upper left, particularly in that last group, as I emphasized earlier. And you can see here, there were some S losses in this study to the tune of nearly a third of the patients shown in the column on the lower right that I've highlighted uh, in red for you. Well, uh, this has caused uh, me to have the experience of uh, sitting at several uh, ad boards and other kinds of meetings with esteemed colleagues. And we're always asked uh, by various parties, what do you think about the prospect of adding interferon to these regimens? And the answer is pretty much coalesce in my experience. And I have to admit this reflects my feelings to a large extent. 12 weeks is acceptable if it really moves the field forward. 24 weeks, maybe. I guess it would depend on how dramatic the outcomes are. And 48 weeks, I can only think of the phrase, please no, not again, harking back to the old experience with interferon. That too is something we can discuss uh, in the panel discussions. Very, very briefly, uh, these are uh, this is a monoclonal antibody study, again, from VIR 3434. I just wanted to show you the response curves for HBV uh, DNA and HBSAG shown on the left. In the initial uh, group of patients they studied who were not, vi um, not um, virologically suppressed, and pretty much the same curves on the right in a more recent presentation at ASLD. And, uh, you know, more to follow probably, I'm sure, on that combination. There are two ways that monoclonals might work. One is by a reduction of surface antigen, um, which we can speculate might reduce uh, T cell uh, exhaustion in the same way that the other agents um, might do so thereby promoting immune-mediated viral clearance. Many people put monoclonal antibodies uh, under immunologic therapeutics, but I, I think in this sense, they're really doing the same thing that we're expecting some of our uh, antivirals are doing. And second, we can speculate that neutralizing antibodies uh, may inhibit viral entry, and we're all interested in the entry inhibitor category. A very important study, and congratulations once again to MF, for um, publishing this paper in the New England Journal quite recently. In fact, it actually came out the same week as the ASLD meeting, which is a very nice uh, coincidence. I'm not sure it uh, was worked out so that that happened on purpose, but in any event, I would call it a historic publication, at least from the point of view of conceptual proof of concept and the quest for functional cure of hepatitis B. This was a forearm study, and here again, I'm really going to focus on the top group, which was uh, papiroversin, which we take the liberty of calling BEPI for short and for convenience, of 300 milligrams a week. Remember, it's more frequent dosing than siRNAs and with a loading dose at the beginning for 24 weeks and then the final outcomes at 48 weeks. And lo and behold, we have rates of uh, composite response, which was the primary endpoint of both HBV DNA clearance and HBSAG below the cutoff. Um, for the assays at 0.05 IU per mil in 9% of um, uh, the patients who were on nukes already and 10% of the patients who uh, were treatment naive when they entered into the study. Now, it's interesting that in both of these groups, uh, the rates at which HBSAG cleared at the end of treatment was over twofold these rates of sustained HBSAG clearance, which again is very interesting and promising um, from a conceptual viewpoint, um, I don't think these rates would hold up as a viable drug unless it's in a selected uh, subgroup of patients, perhaps like those with particularly low levels of HBSAG. But nevertheless, uh, this is what makes it a landmark study, certainly from the points of view of many of us. Now, interestingly, um, E status had the opposite effect here on efficacy that the siRNAs did, a theme that I told you I'd get back to, and I'm doing so very briefly right now. Um, and you can see that uh, on the left. And as you might intuitively expect, um, baseline HBSAG was also a predictor of uh, clearance or uh, at least response. Um, similar patterns were seen. That was in the treatment uh, experienced patients, but similar patterns were seen in the naive patients. Um, ALT flares were a bigger theme here. Again, we can talk about the putative mechanisms by which this might be the case than with the siRNAs. But in brief, 39 participants in this study had an ALT increase of over three times the upper limit of normal uh, on therapy. And most of these elevations occurred, as shown in the representative case in the graph, um, in which there was a, an obvious temporal correlation between the HBSAG decline and uh, what I think we can call the ensuing ALT flare. So that really does give justification to this uh, central concept that we have 
of uh, perhaps suppression of viral protein, in particular the surface antigen, reactivating T cell activity. Again, we can talk about all that. Well, the esteemed virologist in the hepatitis field has been active for many years in Paris, Jean-Michel Pavlotsky, published this uh, editorial in Lancet, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, the very same week. I think that must have been a coincidence, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, and it gets to this age-old question by now of whether ALT flares are, quote, good or bad. So he wrote, the occurrence of ALT flares is a reliable marker of immune restoration and possible subsequent control. Therefore, the occurrence of ALT flares should not be a concern with new HPV drugs and should be expected as a necessary marker of subsequent efficacy. And then he went on to discuss quite appropriately the dangers inherent as exemplified by the patient in Reef 2 of having too much of an ALT flare, too much acute hepatitis when you withdraw therapy. So one thing I want to discuss with the panel is whether they subscribe to this idea that if we don't see an ALT flare, that we're not going to get efficacy. I think that probably is going a distance too far, but I, I will ask the panelists for their opinions about this. There are immunotherapies um, that have garnered a, a lot of interest, immune checkpoint inhibitors, as you see, therapeutic vaccines, which currently consist largely of uh, various viral vectors expressing, in particular, the surface antigen, core antigen, and polymerase, which um, uh, scientists who've worked in this area um, say is particularly seemingly immunogenic, and then uh, toll-like receptors including toll-like receptors 7 and 8, which have begun to undergo study. And very briefly, because Dr. Gehring is going to cover this as well, I'm going to show you another nice proof of concept, which is a PDL1 antibody called Envifolimab, given with nukes to a substantial size cohort of patients. And the bottom line is that uh, three patients actually had sustained HBSAG loss after this um, uh, form of therapy. Uh, and uh, two of them had ALT flares. So that gets back to the whole issue of whether in particular immunotherapeutic might actually be expected to cause ALT flares and with it, hopefully a therapeutic benefit, but not hopefully perhaps too much of a flare. We haven't seen that yet with this agent to my knowledge, but with this and like agents, it's certainly gonna be something we look at as these studies are conducted. There's an ongoing trial right now, just to give you an example of what's happening. And again, I'm gonna leave a lot of this to Adam. Uh, on BEPI, followed by therapeutic HPV uh, vaccines. So 24 weeks or 12 weeks of BEPI at that therapeutic dose that's been selected for further development of 300 milligrams per week. And then uh, three different therapeutic vaccines at four dosing periods in the latter part of 24 weeks out of 48 weeks with one week in between um, versus 12 weeks. As I said, I show you the types of vaccines at the bottom. Uh, no data yet, but of course, uh, this study is garnering a lot of interest, as are um, other therapeutic uh, uh, efforts in the immunologic space. So where do we stand in early 2023? Well, first, siRNA therapy and MOOCs cannot bring about functional cure, or FC, on their own, more than perhaps rarely. ASOs capable of functional are capable of functional cure, but not frequently enough to become a standalone therapy. Perhaps maybe in patients who have selected criteria like particularly low HPSAG levels, but that's open to discussion. Uh, post suppression, uh, uh, suppression, post treatment, excuse me, post treatment suppression. What are the mechanisms? Um, the importance of ALT flares is crying out for further study. Um, what is the correlation? Uh, we need a really robust analysis across studies. I've discussed this with MF recently, um, looking at how ALT flares correlate with therapeutic outcomes in these patients. And I think we need to do that separately for each class of agents. The interest in CAMS is being revived um, as um, in the case of several uh, largely in vitro studies presented as he'll do from several companies of more advanced CAMS, which he will talk about. And perhaps there may still be a role for this uh, class, which uh, had great expectations a couple of years ago, and hopefully those can be revived. And then finally, um, I think right now the field is going in the direction of various combinations, either antiviral plus antiviral or antiviral plus immunomodulatory. And we'll talk about all of that. That's really what the hepatitis B part of this program is largely about, um, in addition to some of the nuances of current therapy. So with that, I'll stop. And it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jörg Peters uh, from the University of Hamburg. And I think Jörg, I'm going to hear from you right now. Now, thank you for your attention today. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the kind invitation. My name is Jörg Peterson. I'm sitting in the office uh, in Hamburg, Germany, and I'm pre-recording my talk um, since I will be at another meeting in London the same weekend. 
The task of my talk are the emerging therapies for HPV in the next three years, preclinical to phase one. Here you see my disclosures. And this emerging part um, of HPV has a little bit of a prediction um, using a crystal ball. The outline of my presentation will include um, a brief summary of the functional cure phase two, three studies with the aim of the durable HBS antigen loss and the problems we have with that. And instead of that, I will focus um, on what we should um, focus on in preclinical and phase one studies. I will ask for the use of more preclinical infection models. We will need many more intrahepatic data in preclinical and phase one studies. And at the end, I believe it will come to combination therapies in the future, but which combo is the most promising? And you heard a very nice presentation just um, a minute ago um, by Ira Jacobson. So I don't need you to remind you on the uh, targets on HPV. I believe Ira um, covered had covered that um, briefly beforehand. There are many new substances. And if you just look at this one, which I got from the HEP B org treatment and management drug watch, mid of January this year, there are many drugs in preclinical and um, clinical phase one state right now. And the same holds true for uh, therapeutic vaccines. The first problem is already that we have only very few um, peer-reviewed papers on novel HPV drug candidates available so far, but we need to listen to many abstracts and meeting reports. Um, so we are awaiting here many more results in the future. Coming to functional cure, um, what is the guidance of ESL and ASLD? You heard that already, HBS antigen loss is the treatment endpoint for chronic hepatitis B phase two and three studies, 24 weeks post-treatment. The phase three studies should aim at 30% HBS antigen loss. That's what we wrote in a paper at uh, Hepatology and JHEP in 2020. And those were the discussion points of the recent um, treatment endpoint conference in Washington, June three and four in 2024. But there are several problems with the use of HBS antigen. Double-stranded linear DNA can integrate, it, integrate into the host genome at double-stranded DNA breaks via non-homologous end joining. We and others have published uh, about this many years back. And this may act as a source of HBS antigen production and chronic HPV infection. And there was the very important paper from Dr. Woodell in Science Translational Medicine 2017. By the way, it was done in a preclinical um, CHIMP model. There are two sources of circulating HBS antigen, CCC DNA and integrated HPV DNA, which you see here on the right-hand side. The latter suggested to be more important in HPE antigen negative patients. There is, and that's the problem, an inability of current tests to differentiate between HBS antigen derived from integrated HPV DNA or from CCC DNA. So this may raise doubt about the use of HBS antigen as an optimal endpoint of therapy and is questioning the clinical utility of HBS antigen as a surrogate marker for viral replication. Therefore, for preclinical studies, we should directly focus on the matrix of viral replication, CCC DNA, and its other surrogate markers too, such as pregenomic RNA and correlated antigen. This brings me to some of the key open virological questions in HPV re research. We don't know still what the half-life of the viral matrix is of HPV CCC DNA. We are studying this molecule now for 25 or 30 years, but we don't know the half-life yet. What are the factors and interventions that suppress or destabilize the CCC DNA in infected hepatocytes? And moreover, what is the role of HPV DNA integrations in viral protein production and genome instability? There's only very limited availability of robust infection models and of liver tissues from chronic hepatitis B patients so far. This brings me to my first, the first part of my presentation and the clinical studies to the background of SMUC 5 sex complex and HPV and infected cells. 
SMUG56 stands for a structural maintenance of chromosome complex, which is degraded in HPV infected cells. HBX protein binds to DD1, promoting assembly of the Kalin 4E3 ubiquitin ligase complex to induce ubiquitination and proteasome degradation of the SMUG56 complex. Or in other words, SMUG56, which is shown here in liver tissues in a mouse model at the UPA, a chimeric mouse model, SMUG56 complex acts as a host restriction factor, promoting CCC DNA suppression in the absence of X, or here in X minus mutants. Now, the very important and beautiful paper from De Cossier in Nature 2016, it was shown that SMUG56 is involved in chromosome stabilization and DNA repair. It recognizes unusual DNA configuration, double-stranded circular DNA, to promote their compaction. So the question for us here is then, what are the studies of, uh, what can we study? Um, what factors are affecting the CCC DNA activity? We're in the first part now talking about CCC DNA activity. Or in another way, can treatments able to reduce the levels of HPV transcripts abrogate HBX production and promote SMUG56 mediated CCC DNA suppression? And I believe yes, and we have already some of the tools at hand, the SIRNAs and ASUS you just heard about by Ira Jacobson. So in a preclinical mouse model by our group here in Hamburg, published last year in GUT, we were able to show that um, the treatment with siRNAs was targeting all HPV transcripts. And in those studies, you see was the ARB1740 molecule used. And what you can see here very nicely, as even shown um, briefly before by IRA um, in patients, that the serum HBS antigen with the use of siRNA was drastically reduced. Furthermore, treatment with siRNA lowered all HPV markers, including X, but not what you can see here in the southern blot, intrahepatic CCC DNA levels. But siRNA enabled the reappearance of SMUG56 complex, which is shown here in green in the center in the mouse model, in that beautiful staining, it's recruitment on CCC DNA and suppression of CCC DNA transcription. Or in other words, siRNAs are showing a dual mode of action, HPV RNA degradation and CCC DNA silencing. Why am I switching now here to bulivertide? Bulivertide, as you all know, efficiently blocks HPV and HDV infection in mice and intrahepatic virus spreading post-infection. We and others have published many years back um, those results. And you will hear tomorrow in the um, HDV session much more about this um, entry um, inhibitor that is um, acting um, against the NTCP receptor of HPV and HDV. The drug is approved by EMA for a conditional use in Europe since July 2020. And we are using this in patients already uh, in clinical routine uh, every day in HDV. But here, please focus on HPV. Because once we have cleared some cells from CCC DNA or silenced that, we need to shield those hepatocytes from reinfection. So we need to maintain the CCC DNA silencing. And again, in a preclinical mouse model that we published in 2021, we were able to show this. Mice were treated for four weeks with an siRNA, and then following um, for eight weeks, they were treated with bulivertide. The study design was a follow-up studies adding bulivertide at the end of siRNA administration to assess whether CCC DNA silencing could be maintained in SMUG56 positive primary human hepatocytes. And the block of NTCP entry pathway indeed maintained the CCC silencing in SMUG6 positive primary human hepatocytes. Or in other words, again, new infection events ap appeared needed to re-establish CCC DNA activity, which is shown here on the right-hand side. So, to summarize this first part, 
there is a therapeutic shutdown of HPV transcripts that promotes the reappearance of the SMUG56 complex and silencing of the viral genome in vivo. Or in other words, targeting HBX in preclinical and early clinical studies could kill the CCC DNA engine and is becoming possible already with some of our therapies. I'm jumping here to other abstracts just shown on recent ASLD meetings. What might be other tools in preclinical to phase one studies to affect CCC DNA? The CPEMs. I know that MFUN will talk in greater detail later on, but in respect to CCC DNA, I need to show you some results with two of the molecules. There is the one ABI4334, which is a novel HPV core inhibitor on campsite assembly and inhibition of CCC DNA formation via multiple pathways. And this is shown here in the center. We know that pgRNA and capsidation and DNA replication is a primary target of the CPEMS. And we know that there are attempts to further um, show a capsid disassembly and CCC DNA formation or to block the CCC DNA amplification. But the problem with the first generation drugs was that um, there was uh, not a, a, a too high concentration needed of the drug that it showed um, clinical side effects. So in, in first generation CPAMs, that was not possible. But again, I want to um, make here a point. We're talking only about the de novo formation of CCC DNA, which is affected. Again, is the question, what about the half-life of CCC DNA? Nevertheless, with the ABI 4334 um, from Assembly Biosciences presented at the recent ASLD meeting in November in Washington, it was very nicely shown that in a nanomolar range, there was a disruption of capsids here on the left-hand side and the inhibition of the formation of CCC DNA um, shown. On the right-hand side, there was even the disruption of HPV capsid containing a, a duplex linear DNA. This is important because double-stranded linear breaks, I've shown you in the beginning, um, is the important aspect to maybe able to reduce viral DNA integrations. So to shut down the part that makes things in HBS antigen production so complicated. And furthermore, there's an impact on CCC DNA formation via intracellular amplification. So just look at the very beautiful southern blots here. So these analyses are the most pertinent of these types of studies. There's an impressive increase in potency in the nanomolar range with these new drugs, reaching um, CCC DNA formation inhibition at nanomolar concentrations, at least in primary human hepatocytes and preclinical uh, models. Another um, interesting substance is from Aligos, the 184, that was used in a phase one clinical studies in e antigen positive chronic hepatitis B. I don't have the time to get into details, but again, not measuring CCC DNA intrahepatically, but using HBS antigen production um, as a kind of tool to show the impact on this drug. You see here four patients in the center in brown, the HBS antigen, which is reduced after four weeks of treatment with this um, novel generation um, drugs. And this is in sharp contrast to the first generation CPEMS that for 24 weeks showed no um, effect on HBS antigen. This to me is a clear sign that there is there or might be an effect on CCC DNA. But again, do we understand here truly the mode of action of this drug? We are only hindering the de novo CCC DNA formation. CCC DNA activity and half-life remains a question. Finally, I want to jump here to novel anti-HPV combination treatments using CRISPR-Cas, targeting the HPV uh, genome and sup uh, suppressing um, DNA repair mechanism. Again, I don't have the time for details. Um, those um, studies have been presented at um, ASLD 2021 uh, and 2020. And you see here in orange, just a summary and three um, preclinical models in HEPG2215 cells. 
in primary human hepatocytes on the bottom here in HEPG2 NTCP cells, that by using this technique, that yes, there was an effect on HBS antigen, E antigen, HPV DNA, and pregenomic RNA, as well as CCC DNA. So gene editing, targeting the HPV genome, exerted antiviral effects with reductions in proteins, pgRNA, HPV DNA, and CCC DNA. And the um, investigators even added um, another drug, Olaparib, which increased the antiviral effect by inhibiting um, DNA repair mechanisms. But by using this, it's a novel scientific approach, but at this stage, it is far from application in patients. We don't know what the risk of in vivo gene editing, including both off-target and on-target aspects is, which might cause trouble, double strand breaks, genomic instability, and lifetime risk of cancer. This risk, of course, will be further increased by Olaparib by hindering the host DNA repair machinery. There's a second aspect. There's a barrier to success in vivo um, by, of in vivo CCC DNA editing because there's a somewhat low efficiency of current uh, liver targeting systems that can edit only up to 70% of the hepatocytes, whilst 99% of CCC DNA editing may be required to prevent relapse. And finally, there is a paper that has been published by Fabien Zolim's group, which I would call at this stage this um, a little bit um, a nail in the coffin um, for, for that drug, because using um, that system, CRISPR-Cas targeting of hepatitis B virus, a CCC DNA, generated transcriptionally active episomal variants, and they were transcriptionally active. So this is something what we don't want to see, of course. Next point, what is the impact of cell proliferation on CCC DNA stability? We wrote a paper in 2000, back in 2005, um, hepatitis B virus CCC DNA clearance killing for curing question mark. There's another paper from our group I want to mention here from in gut published in 2018. Cell division provoked a strong decrease of CCC DNA copies. Um, 2.4 lock in the serum and copies in the liver, indicating that CCC DNA was indeed diluted and partially lost in the liver of seri serially transplanted mice, again in a preclinical mouse model. This is here um, drawn in the, the, on this little graph. So indeed, you can reduce uh, the amount of CCC DNA if you are able to induce cell proliferation or cell death in a clinical setting. What is the impact of cell proliferation on stability? Um, a complete CCC DNA eradication in that mouse model, which shows for a couple of weeks a strong uh, repopulation and um, cell division, was not achieved, and inf infection markers reappeared as primary human hepatocytes proliferation relented. The reason was that there was a, a persistence of very few HPV-producing non-proliferating primary human hepatocytes that served then as viral reservoir. Nevertheless, again, treatment with bulivertide at the end of that period prevented hepatocyte reinfection. So shielding again with these entry inhibitor um, cells from de novo infection might be a useful tool so that we are uh, should think about maybe using and combin further combination treatments bulivertide as well. Entry inhibition, therefore, strategies appear crucial to protect cured hepatocytes from HPV reinfection, because remember, this is a dynamic process. Finally, what can we combine? Um, I want to show you one example here, combining CAMs with interferon. This have, we have shown this here um, with the Novira drug, 3778, again, in the mouse model. And the interesting part is, that this was done in another series of, of studies in patients. And you can see you have the exact same picture. There was a stronger decline of serum pgRNA using CAMS plus an immune modulating agent. Here, a very simple one, if you like, with, with interferon, which has, of course, direct antiviral um, effects as well. So CAMS lowered pgRNA and serum, but not in the liver, and only pegylated interferon reduced intrahepatic pgRNA. And again, in the mouse model, we were able 
to get intrahepatic data. And I think this is something what we need um, urgently in early clinical studies, at least in a subset of patients, that we add some um, liver biopsies. Finally, this is um, the outlook. What might be the combination in the future? Um, this paper by Ulla Protzas group published in Gastroenterology 2020, Thomas Michler is the first author, has been shown in many, many presentations about future combination therapies in HPV because it shows again in a preclinical mouse model that a combination is needed reducing antigen, HPV antigenemia, and then adding immunotherapy. And in this elegant mouse model, um, siRNA in transgenic mice, so not a fully um, replication competent mouse model, um, was used um, with high HBS antigen titers. And using only siRNAs, um, the investigators were able to show a three lock drop in HBS antigen that was not associated with immune restoration, which you see here on the left hand side. But combining the siRNA with an immunotherapeutic vaccine led to HBS antigen loss and H uh, anti HBS with some restoration of CD4 and CD8 in all mice. And, and I'm, I'm happy about the, the, the next presentation by Adam Gehring. He will go into much uh, greater detail, I hope. There were some humor, uh, humoral um, immune responses as well. And this is, of course, suggesting that HPV antigen suppression is needed for immune reactivation. And my very last slide is um, a little bit of a question mark as well. Um, Adam, I would like to get your comments later on in the Q&A session. Um, there is a new um, regular um, vaccine, Heplizav, um, that is available in the US and in Europe. And this combines recombinant HPS antigen with the cytidine phosphate guanosine um, oligodeoxy nucleotide CPG ODN tor like receptor 9 agonist adjuvant. This is much more Im immunogenic. We are using this um, for primary non responders in, in regular HPV vaccinations and the clinical trials, in the clinical um, day to day clinical practice. I'm sorry. Um, but what was shown here was a very small poster um, by Robert Perillo at ASLD um, 2022. He wanted to show in 10 patients using um, this vaccine that the, this, to me, some form of therapeutic vaccination, um, that it is HBS antibody induction, that this is possible by using this Heplizav vaccine in patients that had had contact in the past um, with hepatitis B. Those patients were HBS antigen negative, HBS antibody negative, and were at the start of the um, trial only anti-HBC IgG positive. And what you can clearly see, just focus here on the four patients that um, before they um, uh, they were already on some kind of immune modulating drugs due to psoriasis or rheum uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis. By using two or three shots with a just a regular dosage of this Heplizav, in those patients, um, it was shown that they all reacted with anti-HBS production for 24 up to 60 weeks. Too easy. What we have seen is just something um, for the Q&A session at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize and conclude. I believe strongly that preclinical phase one HPV studies should directly focus on CCC DNA and all of the surrogate parameters, not on HBS antigen, because I have shown you the problems that we have with HBS antigen quantification. The mode of actions and many virological aspects can be studied in small animal models, virological aspects, not immunological aspects. Phase one, two clinical studies should generate intrahepatic data and more intrahepatic data in the future, at least in a subset of patients. I think we need to know uh, what's going on in the liver in patients.
And from the many compounds under investigation, it seems that combos of antiviral plus immune modulating drugs will be studied in greater detail in the coming years. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jörg. We'll see you shortly. It's now my great pleasure to introduce somebody who I was just told by Dr. Gish may not have made it had his plane not arrived four hours late, but just in time. And here he is. Adam Gehrling is a senior scientist at Toronto General Hospital, one of the world's foremost experts on the immunology of hepatitis B infection and the potential for immunotherapeutics. I've had the privilege of listening to you speak many times, sometimes at the same table, and I love listening to his incredibly lucid explanations of pretty complex concepts. Adam, welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Ira and Bob, for the invitation. And yeah, I'm glad that Air Canada didn't blow my four-hour complete four hour window to get here ahead of her cushion. But anyways, I made it and uh, I'm happy to give this talk because you know, we've heard sort of great summaries from Ira about what's in, in phase two and, and moving into phase three and sort of a look ahead from Jorg. Now I wanna talk about what I think are the immunotherapies that are gonna push a lot of these, hopefully direct acting antiviral studies over the finish line to get to functional cure in these patients. So these are my disclosures. And then you know, just always like to start out with fundamentals. And we're talking about functional cure. We're talking about really a finite course of treatment, right? So these, these patients have to stop treatment at some point. And the thought is you're going to need a durable immune response to maintain the suppression of hepatitis B. So uh, I put this slide up here thinking I might have a pointer, but don't, don't worry about looking at the cartoon. It's just meant to be a visual there. But we know what the real barrier to functional cure is. And I think Jorg highlighted it quite well. It's the persistence of the CCC DNA. And that really resides in the nucleus of the hepatocyte. It has a long half-life. It can be replenished. But we also have integration of the hepatitis B genome linearized into the chromosomes, which produces surface antigen, mainly in the antigen negative patients. So these are these are the primary barriers we have to overcome. And this schematic here gives an example of really the explosion of direct acting antivirals that we've seen target many different aspects of the hepatitis B replication cycle. So you can start at the top from viral entry, uncoding with some of the CAMs. And then you get to the nucleus and you notice there's nothing there. And then out the other side, you have these RNA interference strategies with sRNA and antisense oligos can knock down the transcripts of hepatitis B, reducing viral load, viral antigen production, assembly inhibitors, again, to prevent encapsidation, nucleoside analogs, and even drugs to actually prevent secretion. But the thing that really is missing is what's happening in the nucleus. All these are upstream or downstream of the CCC DNA and the viral replication cycle. So because they don't target the viral template, they're unlikely to achieve functional cure at the rates we want to see. And you can look at this. I've just pulled out a couple of examples here just to kind of get the point across, moving from the top left. You know, we know now for a while that nucleoside analogs are not durable. These patients could be on nukes for a decade or more. And when they stop, seen by the dotted vertical line, all of a sudden HPV DNA can come up within weeks and followed by potentially severe ALT flares. And we know too that the CAMs can be suppressive for up to three years in the middle, but then as you stop them and the purple lines on the right, they also rebound very rapidly. The RNA interference drugs show different kinetics of rebound. And here I'm using, I represented the VIR data earlier, so this has different cohorts, but the idea is for the siRNA that you get the concept that after 24 weeks of treatment and you stop these siRNAs, you get this uh, slow rebound in uh, HBS antigen in the, in the plasma. And the last one here is a summary graph from the Bapiraversin study from GSK at you know, the end of treatment there, at the end of the orange bar, there's 26% of the patients have achieved HBS antigen loss. And you can see during the 24-week follow-up that this starts to erode, right? So the virus is coming back. And when you look at the direct acting antivirals, as I mentioned, they block intermediate steps because they don't target the template. And the kinetics are different for the rebound for each of them, but the rebound generally occurs in most patients. So, you know, it's it, the potency which with the DAAs can actually suppress viral replication now and viral protein production is really quite astonishing compared to, you know, 10 years ago. 
the question is how can we then take these DAs and combine them with immunotherapy to really push them over the finish line? Because we know that T cells can eliminate the infected and the integrated hepatocytes. B cells, of course, are important for antibody production. They're producing anti-HBS. Uh, they can clear the residual HBS from the circulation, even from the integrants to make the patient's HBS antigen negative. And then inflammation in the liver, and, and Ira alluded to this a little bit with the comment from Jean-Michel, but you know, inflammation in liver damage drives hepatocyte turnover. And this could potentially lead to a dilution and elimination of CCC DNA. This is kind of coming down to these good versus bad flare concept. So before we jump into the immunotherapy aspect of it, I'd like to kind of lay out what we think of the fundamentals of an immune response, because these are maybe not universally known. But when you think about an acute viral infection, flu or COVID, these, unlike hepatitis B, happen over days. But what happens is the virus comes into the tissue and activates pattern recognition receptors. And these pattern recognition receptors induce inflammatory cytokines. And these cytokines serve as the program for the T and the B cells. They read this program, traffic to the lymph nodes where they undergo proliferation and expansion, gain effector function, and then go back to the tissue. And this is where they then affect their function. So the B cells are producing antibody, as you can see, to mop up virus. And the T cells are going in and killing infected tissue resident or tissue, tissue epithelial cells or hepatocytes in this case. In a chronic hepatitis B infection, the profile we know is much, much different. So at the beginning, we don't really understand what leads to a chronic infection. And most of the times in vertical infection from mother to child, it's probably immaturity of the immune response, um, but it's not been very well documented or maybe some immune deficiency in adults. But nonetheless, what happens when this progresses to a chronic infection is that you start to get this buildup of viral antigen and viral and virus in the circulation. And this circulates for decades. And so your immune system is constantly confronted with this antigen, so it leads to constant activation. And you can think about when you work hard for a long time, you start to get exhausted. So asking you to do more and more and more is harder. And so what happens to the immune response is you see this progressive decline in function, and that's highlighted on this schematic on the right. And as these T cells reduce in function, they increase inhibitory receptor expression. And so they produce less cytokines, they proliferate less, and they're actually prone to dying when they get to become activated. And what happens is you end up getting these layers of suppression that actually suppress the immune response. Exhaustion driven by the high antigen and HPV virus exposure and the, in, in the propensity for cell death and apoptosis reduces the number of HPV-specific T cells that you can find in these patients. And as I said, as they get exhausted, they have reduced function, and they don't proliferate, and they upregulate inhibitory receptors. So these are just some of the layers that actually uh, confront the immune response when we're trying to talk about re restoration. But we know what a good response looks like in hepatitis B because we can look at patients that resolve infection. And so a successful response is a coordinated response. You have CD4 and CD8 T cells. And the CD4 T cells are really critical to supporting a CD8 T cell response. And the CD8 T cells themselves are producing interferon gamma that leads to non-cytolytic control of the virus, but it also goes directly to the liver and they start killing the infected reservoir. And of course, the CD4 T cells also help B cells produce antibodies. And this is something that's very easy to measure. Um, in an immunology lab, you could just do an LA spot. And what I'm showing here is the T cell response from a patient who's resolved hepatitis B. So each one of those black bars on the graph represents a T cell response to a different antigen in hepatitis B, directly ex vivo, readily detectable. And when you do the exact same experiments in a chronic patient, majority of the time, you'll see a blank graph like this or a blank plate because it's just, they're so infrequent, the frequency is so low and so weak that they're difficult to detect. And so you think, well, if they're that low, let's just boost them, right? And uh, and so this, of course, has been tried and this, this paper is a little bit of out of date now, but it still highlights, I think, the take home message from our previous vaccine studies. And I'm gonna contrast them with what's coming in the down the pipeline. And, you know, 
really what they saw, you know, and this is really trying to retool the prophylactic vaccine. And when DNA vaccination became very popular back in, say, the 90s and early 2000s, but had no immunogenicity in humans, they really got weak, weak induction of the T cell response. And that's because you're trying to put 50 micrograms of antigen into a patient that has 100 milligrams of antigen in their blood, right? So the, the numbers don't add up. And they were also had very limited production of surface antigen antibodies and no impact on HPV replication. They didn't move the needle. I mean, there's some caveats that we can think about for these old vaccines. I mean, one is they had a misdirected immune response. So the vaccine antigen is different than the virus. I mean, that may be true, but there's a lot of genotype cross-reactivity in the immune response. So it's probably not the main driver. What it probably is is the stimulation is too weak. You're giving most of these with alum or just DNA, and it's just not driving a strong enough program to boost the T cell response. And I'm going to go into that in the next slide or two. And then the antiviral therapy was really suboptimal. If you look back at these, it's a defavir and some of these early nukes that were used, maybe just a few months of, of, of nucleoside analog treatment. They didn't have the sRNAs or the antisense oligos or the anti SP antibodies to really drive profoundly drive down HBS antigen in the past. And so that's where I'm coming into now. What are the vaccines that are most promising that are coming down the pipeline for hepatitis B? And so the first one I want to highlight is the Vaxitec data. And I mean, you may know the adenovirus is, was, was part of the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. So the safety has been well proven, but they've taken the adenovirus vector and combined it with a modified vaccinia ankara. So this is another type of virus. It's also carrying the same HBV proteins, but it shows the immune system, the antigens in a slightly different way because it's a different virus. So you have two different viruses activating immune response in slightly different ways, but it's always to the hepatitis B antigens. And so it gets a further boost. And what you can see in the graph on the left with the orange lines here, the two arrows indicate the vaccine schedule and the orange lines indicate a boost in the T cell response. What you can see is, you know, for, for a vaccine in chronic hepatitis B patients, this is an enormous boost of the T cell response. And the graph on the right, I'm sorry, the y-axis is missing, but this is S antigen. And you can see the vaccine alone is moving the needle, at least in some of these patients on the S antigen to some extent. And one thing I want to point out here is it's, it's also important to remember that all these patients have a boost in their T cell response, but you don't see S antigen going down in all of them. So that tells us those layers of suppression are pl probably playing an effect. And I'm going to get into that in a few slides. And this is a very similar strategy coming from GSK, right? So GSK is also using an ad, a, a chimpanzee adenovirus with the modified vaccinia anchor vi virus prime boost strategy. But in addition to the viral vectors, they're adding a recombinant antigen boost to the end of the viral vector strategy. And the purpose of this, you know, the hypothesis is, is going to be better for CD4 cells because the data from GSK that they recently presented has higher resolution. You can see on the graph on the left, the core specific CD8 T cells are boosted very, very strongly from these viral vectors. And we know that's what these viral vectors do. But if you look at the CD4 cells on the right, it's flat. There's nothing there. And so the hypothesis is that bringing in the recombinant antigen after the boost of CD8 is going to further drive the CD4 T cells for help. And then another one that's uh, another viral vector vaccine that's in development is from Gilead. And this is just presentation from SLD looking at the non-human primate toxin and immunogenicity studies. And these different, these viruses are different than the previous ones. These are arena viruses. So the Pachende virus and the LCMV virus. And the way that this vaccine strategy was used was every four weeks, they would alternate the virus. Again, giving the immune something, system something different to look at. And so they saw induction of good immunity in the non-human primates. We'll see what happens when this starts to move into hepatitis B patients. So this brings us back to these uh, schematics I had before. And what the vectors do, they really provide that adjuvant effect. They substitute for what a virus would look like in a chronic infection. So it activates toll like receptors, drives the inflammatory cytokine program, and then that program helps the T-cells, uh, T-cell numbers, uh, boost the T-cell numbers and function. But again, you're boosting the function, but you still have all the S antigen present. And you know, I really alluded to this, you know, it may be a direct acting antiviral, but the, the anti-HBS monoclonal antibody from VIR, which is this VIR 3434, 
the way this works, it's a sub subcutaneously delivered. It actually goes to the plasma, then binds up the surface antigen. And the secondary mechanism of action is thought to be immunological, where it drives the antigen to the, uh, to the dendritic cells and monocytes, activates them because they're immune complexes with the hope of st stimulating T cell responses that will then go to the liver and kill hepatocytes. And so the HBS antigen reduction activity of this has been well characterized now in multiple studies from VIR. The big question, which is under investigation, you can ask me about it later, but I'll just say it's under investigation. And everybody wants to know, is there a vaccinal effect? If you drive this antigen to these dendritic cells, will it boost the T cell responses? And I think that's something that we are yet to, yet to see. So... You can use the vaccines to boost their number, somewhat their function, but they got to get to the liver and they've got to be, and they've got to perform, right? And that's where they run into these other layers and particularly inhibitory receptor expression. And when you think about inhibitory receptors, it's been mapped pretty well in hepatitis B specific T cells. And when you look at the hierarchy of inhibitory receptors expressed, PD-1 is at the top. So this PD-1, PD-L1 access is really key to uh, is the primary exhaustion factor. And it's also what's been developed in cancer for similar reasons. And so what does this uh, interaction do when PD-1 interacts with PD-L1? Well, it actually suppresses signaling through the T cell receptor. And when you can't signal through, when the cells can't signal through their cognate receptor, they reduce cytokine production, reduce killing, reduce proliferation, everything we saw that sort of drives the antigen. But if you block this, you can release the brakes on T cell function to some extent. And so, you know, this has already been brought up to some extent by, by Ira, but the, the first pilot studies are done, you know, well, it was published four years ago, but it was probably done six or seven years ago where uh, Ed Gain in collaboration with Gilead, they had uh, tested low-dose nivolumab in a group of patients. And one of the patients, uh, you can be optimistic here, lost S antigen to functional cure. But again, now this is being used much more significantly in, uh, in a much more regimented way. And this is the Escletus data that um, Ira also referred to. And in this case, these patients are getting repeated dosing of anti pdl one antibodies. And you can see a few of these patients are, uh, are losing HBS antigen. Other patients are having a decline in HBS antigen. And in anticipation that... Uh, in anticipation that more would be needed, Vaxitec had a second arm to their study where they gave their prime boost vaccine, but the second boost was in combination with nivolumab. And again, here in the traces for S antigen on the right, you can see that some of these patients are actually seeing a decline in HBS antigen. So they're boosting the T cell response in the periphery and trying to release the breaks in the liver. So in addition to the antibodies, there's other modalities that are coming into clinical or in clinical trials right now. And Roche is developing one that is an antisense oligo that's actually targeting the PDL1 in hepatocytes. And the antisense oligo for this works very similar to how bapiroversin works, but just to make sure that everybody is clear on how they work, we have to remember the dogma in, in biology, right? So you have your DNA and chromosomes that goes to messenger RNA, and that produces the PDL1 protein. And the way these antisense oligos work is this is galnet conjugate, it'll go, to mon it'll go to the hepatocytes, and the antisense portion of this ASO will recognize the pdl one transcript and host enzymes, RNase H, will degrade the transcript, no transcript, no protein, no protein, you release the breaks and hopefully get a more robust T-cell response in the liver. No data to present on this yet, but hopefully we'll see something soon. So... Using checkpoint inhibitors, I mean, we think about them use, use in oncology where the patients have very little option. It's very different in the setting that we're going to be using them in for hepatitis B. So there has to be some concern because they can release autoimmunity. And there's been well-documented and immune-related adverse events. But I think one thing that we do have to keep in mind is that when you're doing monotherapy with PD-1 or PD-L1 or one or just a handful of doses, the IREs are much less frequent and usually much less severe. Um, and there may be differences between PD-1 and PD-L1. I think we're going to have to see how that plays out. And what we've seen now is it's clearly in a fraction of these patients it's highly effective in reducing S antigen. Now, the goal is to understand why. We need biomarkers either to improve patient selection for those patients that will respond so we can tolerate the IREs or 
we need to understand why those patients are responding to better combine them with different drugs. So then to summarize uh, what I've presented, I mean, the new vaccines in particular are highly immunogenic. They are the strongest boost to HPV-specific T cells that we have seen in chronically infected patients. The anti-HBS monoclonal antibodies, it's clear they rapidly remove hepatitis B and the surface antigen from the circulation, but I think it'd be a uh, key to understanding if there's a secondary effect, a vaccinal effect to boost these T cells. And then, you know, in the terms of checkpoint inhibitor therapy, it's, it's you know, we've seen it in, in, in a couple of studies now, as I mentioned, it works in a fraction of patients and we need to understand the immunotoxicity of dosing in hepatitis B patients. We're using sub lower doses than they are in oncology, probably less doses. It's going to be in monotherapy. So, you know, the toxicity is probably going to be less than we see in cancer patients uh, because the dosing will be less aggressive. But I think, you know, this will obviously have to be carefully watched. And the ability to predict uh, responsive patients could balance these side effects with the clinical benefit. So I'm going to stop there and I look forward to fielding any questions during the panel discussion. Thank you. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much for a beautiful talk. And uh, now, last but not least in the session, uh, Professor M.F. Yoon, who is chair of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Hong Kong. And I can only express one more idea to um, accord you the respect that I think you deserve for your contributions. I've decided that from now on at, ASL, at ESOL and ASLD, instead of having you coming up and down from the floor constantly, they would have put a chair for you on the podium so you could just keep giving your presentations. With that, I'll introduce Professor Yoon. Uh, first of all, very thank you to uh, Iwa and Bob uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, my talk today is entitled Emerging Concepts and Data, CPEMS, the third and the fourth uh, generation. So here are my disclosures. And please note that the agents that I'm going to discuss today are not um, FDA approved. Uh, I will already uh, mention this slide. And in fact, uh, supposedly the CPAM core protein aerostatic modulator has two main uh, mode of actions. As highlighted in the green, uh, the primary action of the CPAM is to inhibit the epigenomic RNA encapsulation and also DNA replication. Its secondary action, highlighted in yellow, is actually to inhibit the capsid assembly and hence the CCCD uh, DNA formation and replenishment. And there are two classes of CAM. Uh, class one or class A uh, belongs to CAMs which actually formed aberrant nuclear capsid. And then class two or class E belongs to CAMs which produce an empty but uh, normal nuclear capsid without housing the genomic, I mean, HPV genomes. And please also note that um, the boxes highlighted in gray, the CAMs, the development of these CAMs have been determined, uh, determ uh, terminated because of the liver toxicity. And when you look at the, these two CAMs, these two classes of CAMs, they look quite differently under electronic microscopy. Uh, already mentioned by York uh, that uh, this is the first prototype of CAMs being studied um, in hepatitis B, NVR3778. In this study, this CAM actually showed that um, CAMs can reduce HPV DNA and also HPV RNA just over 28 days of therapy. Um, using the dose of 600 milligram to 1,000 milligram per, uh, per twice, a, twice a day, the reduction of HPV DNA was around, the median was around 1.5 log, as well as 1.5 log reduction in the RNAs. As already mentioned by York, that um, the magnitude of the reduction of both the DNA and RNA could be augmented when this chem was combined with interferons 
over 28 days of therapy has highlighted as highlighted in the wet lines. Because of this promising results, uh, there are more camps being developed uh, afterwards. And this first or we call first or second generation CAM, Vibicofia, was studied uh, in patient, treatment naive patients for four weeks. And you can see in D positive patients, the HPDNA was reduced by around three logs. And for D e negative patients, the HPDNA reduced was around 2.5 logs. When we look at the reduction of the RNAs, it's around 1.5 logs uh, using the highest dose. Uh, the the, the, uh, the uh, uh, 300 milligram dose of Rebecca In fact, another group of, I mean, another CAMS, Rasekafia, was also studied over 28 days of therapy. Again, you can see uh, there was around 2.8 log reduction of HVDNA after 28 days of therapy. And both Rebecca and Rasekafia. Do, do not actually reduce the surface antigen over 28 days of therapy. The third generation CAM, the Vancofia, was also studied for four weeks. And you can see that in uh, using this uh, uh, compound for four weeks, the HPDNA reduction was around three logs, whereas the HPRNA was around 2.8 logs, using the dose of 600 milligram uh, daily. Another newer uh, uh, CAMS, EDP514, again studied for uh, 28 days. Uh, compared to the previous uh, generation CAMS, uh, the use of this CAM for 28 days was associated with a 3.4 log reduction of HPDNA and 2.8 log reduction of RNA using the dose of 800 milligram daily. And the most recent CAM, uh, Allegos from Allegos 184, uh, show a very promising reduction of HPDNA and RNA. And you can see that uh, in the negative patients, highlighted highlight in the purple box, uh, 50 milligrams of um, uh, this uh, compound is, was associated with a, around 3.8 log reduction of HPDNA and nearly two log reduction of uh, HPRNA. More promising, will be seen, a more promising result will be seen in D positive patients. And you can see the HPDNA was historically higher compared to the uh, previous CAM, uh, which up to 4.2 4, 4 logs. And HPRNA actually had a reduction of three logs, just using 100 milligram of this uh, newer CAM uh, for 28 days. Although, um, um, all these studies were done uh, over four weeks, and direct comparison is not fair uh, because of a limited number of patients and also different characteristics of patients in different trials. Um, it seems that uh, we are now getting more potent CAM down the line, even using a lower dose range of individual CAMs. How about the effect of CAMs uh, given for more uh, prolonged period of time? Uh, over 24 to 8, 48 weeks. And this study uh, examined the effect of Vibicofia for 20, 24 weeks in patients who were already on nucleocyanol therapy. And this study showed that uh, combining or adding this Vibicofia to nucleocyanol treated patients in both the E positive and E negative population would increase, would increase the um, uh, proportion of patients getting target not detectable HPDNA and also unquantifiable RNA um, um, after adding this Rebecca compare to basically no change in terms of the HPDNA and RNAs for patients who are just on nucleoside analogs. This study was, has already, already been uh, um, alluded to by um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Ewa, Ewa that uh, adding um, Rebecca to treatment naive E positive patients will also increase the reduction of the HVDNA as well as the RNA in, our, in these populations. In fact, not only Rebecca, but Sakafia also study 
was also studied for 24 weeks. Um, instead of uh, bothering you the details of different groups of patients, I just want to let you or ask you to pay attention to two things, two fact uh, findings. Number one, as highlighted in the blue circle, that uh, adding Bersacafia uh, to the positive treatment naive populations, they actually, this drug can actually increase the HB DNA reduction compared to uh, nucleoside analog alone. Second, uh, in the uh, two uh, lower diagram, uh, adding um, Bersacafia to uh, uh, treatment naive as well as virological suppressed patients, it can further decrease the HB DNA and also the HPV RNAs um, uh, in both groups of patients. And the effect was more prominently seen in the treatment naive population. 48 weeks of CAMS was also studied by a watch uh, using Nivenkofia. And in this very complex, I would say, uh, uh, study, I just want to get you through by very simple uh, findings. Uh, looking at the cohort C patients, where they are treatment naive populations receiving three uh, compounds number one, nucleosinologs, number two, interferons, and then number three, nivacofia. When they look at the D positive treatment naive population with really, really high viral load, defined as seven more than seven logs, uh, using this combi uh, triple combinations for 48 weeks, 78% of these patients with high viral load can achieve HB DNA below the lower limit of quantification. For, sorry for the, for the typo, it should be HBD, uh, HBV RNA. And in um, patients, uh, in, in, in uh, 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 look suppressed patients in core one, just uh, core A, just receiving the looks plus uh, lymphocofia, 93% of these patients, they actually had undetectable RNA at the end of 20, 48 weeks of therapy. Highlighted in the box, in the treatment uh, live patients, either receiving uh, um, leukocyanolox plus lymphocofia uh, uh, or, or leukocyanolox plus lymphocofia and pregulated interferons, 88 to 100% of these patients achieve RNA undetectability at week 48. At least uh, 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 the um, uh, 20, uh, two locks of reduction of HPV RNAs was maintained even after 24 weeks of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 cessation of this lymphocofia. And finally, 28% to 44% of patients remain to have HPV RNA undetectable even after 24 weeks of uh, stopping of therapy. And in fact, when we look at uh, the surface antigen of this study population, you can see that uh, in loop suppressed patients in CO1 receiving the double uh, uh, therapy, there was no obvious surface antigen change. And in patients, who had who received the uh, dual uh, treatment? Uh, limited effect of surface antigen was seen. Uh, only two out of the uh, ten patients had the maximal surface antigen decline by 0.4 to 0.4, uh, 1.4 log. However, when we look at the treatment naive population, the triple combination therapy it was associated with the mean surface antigen decline of uh, around 1.4 log. The D positive patients had at FH of 1.6 log declined and generally sustained uh, after uh, post-treatment in the post-treatment period. As I already mentioned, this is the newest uh, uh, capsid or CPAM uh, being studied in the, in, the, in the clinic. And as I already mentioned, this CPAM actually have a very profound suppression of the HB DNA as well as the um, HB RNA. The most uh, phenomenal features of this uh, CPRAM is that um, after four weeks of treatment, we start to see, see some patients with meaningful surface antigen decline as uh, highlighted in the boxes, in the table, as well as in, in the graph. And we really want to know whether this uh, surface antigen decline is related to the suppression 
or inhibition on the CCC DNA. And we are very eager to look um, forward and uh, look forward to seeing more patients, a more study or with long term, more long term therapy using this more potent uh, CPEMs. So um, after, after presenting you all the data of the CPEM, uh, what, what are the emerging concept, concepts of CPEMs? I can think of several. Number one, uh, is there any potential effects or benefits of better HPV DNA suppression and also additional RNA suppression on top of the looks? Number two, is there any concern on the development of viral resistance if this kind of CPEMs were given as monotherapy? Number three, uh, do all these CPEMs have any action on the CCC DNA? And number four, obviously, we need to know more about the safety concern, uh, safety data on more long-term treatment for CPAM. I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to illustrate some examples or some of my thought on the first three uh, uh, issues uh, listed in these slides. And obviously we don't have a very long-term data in, uh, in, in terms of safety of the CPAMs. Uh, I think um, the additional HV DNA and RNA suppression by CPEM on the leukocyanide treated patients may further reduce HCC. This is because we find that um, residual HV DNA and epigenomic RNA uh, viremia is associated with the uh, HCC development, development in hepatitis B, even on leukocyte analogs. So by further suppressing or reducing the HV DNA and also additional RNA suppression, we think that um, CPEM may further reduce the risk of HCC. In addition, uh, furthermore, we know that continuation of leukocyanolog for more long term, we can see a reduction of the integration uh, burden in the, in the liver. So theoretically, if we suppress the HV DNA better, if we suppress the viral replication better by CPEM, then that may also reduce the integration burden of, of the liver in the liver. And obviously that will also reduce the risk of HCC. We know that in the first and the second generation of CPEM, uh, it is, they are associated with a higher risk of uh, viral resistance, um, even during a very short period of treatment time. However, I would like to draw your attention to the his developmental history of leukocyte analogs. When we have the lamifidine, a defovir as a first and the second generation of uh, loops, we do, see, we do see many resistance. However, with the high potency of um, leukocyte analogs, for example, tenofovir and tecofir, we don't see uh, uh, resistance even on long-term. So by the same line of thought, if we can have the more potent CPAM, can we just use a CPAM as a monotherapy uh, without the worry of the emergence of resistance? I just want to show you an example of to compare the potency of CPAM over four weeks between uh, CPAMs and also leukocyte analogs. When you look, look at the TAF, TAF, look at the antiquivir. Four weeks of um, and this treatment, they, they are usually associated, associated with two point neck lock reduction of DNA. When we look at the allergos ca uh, camps, we are now seeing four lock reduction. So with this, then we may think, all right, uh, can the CPAN be given more as a monotherapy without the um, um, uh, worries of resistance? And we need to know in a lot more long-term data. And this is very provoking because we don't have studies just studying um, uh, CPEM on its own without the uh, leukocyte analogs as a backbone. And finally, the CCC DNA activities. Uh, we, in general, we, we, we said that, that we don't see surface engine reduction by, by CPEM. And in fact, when we look closer to the data, particularly in the positive treatment naive population, we did see some, although not much, surface antigen reduction. Uh, for example, in, in the study using the Brasovkevia and also uh, Ribicovia, uh, uh, particularly on the core related antigen. So with this lower potency CPEM, we do see very minimal 
or maybe some surface antigen in knee positive treatment naive populations. And also, as already mentioned, uh, we now have a more potent CPAM. We saw surface antigen reduction even uh, 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 after 20 days of CPAM. And we are very eager to look uh, into the more long-term effect of this potent CPAM, whether it can uh, reduce more patient, reduce the surface antigen in more patients and reflecting the activities against the CCC DNA uh, in, the, in the liver. I think I missed out the conclusion. Oh, there's no slide. Uh, uh, in, uh, I would say, I mean, in summary, uh, we know that CPAM can actually reduce the HV DNA and additional RNA reduction. And we know that CPAM, the first and the second generation CPAM may have very minimal role on the surface engine reduction. However, we are really looking into the initial positive result of the more potent CPAM on the surface engine reduction. And finally, I think that uh, we should uh, look into the uh, effect of CPAMs on a uh, more long-term basis uh, in terms of the safety, as well as the surface engine reduction and Maybe we may think about whether CPAM can be given in, as a monotherapy in the future. With that, I would like to thank for your attention. Wonderful talk, MF, and note of optimism, I think I detected for CPAMs. Uh, class of agents that's looking for optimism from people like you. <laughs> okay. And I think, do we have Jörg? Uh, I'm here. Uh, hi, Jörg. How are you? I, I'm fine. I hope I, I hope, hope you can, can hear me. Can we turn the volume up on him? Any questions? Yes, I did want to start also with this comment about um, many patients are described when they're going on new news, like a mom or whatever, those times that you sleep about a mom. have so many new files, so many technologies. I would like to get rid of those words forever and definite and talk about hope for the future. There's new therapies coming. You'll be on these therapies until we have finite therapy or higher S loss rates. Would everybody agree with that uh, statement now? Uh, definitely, Bob. I, I think, I mean, uh, in, in the past, we have been talking about, I mean, when we talk to our patients, we start you on leukocyanol and you are prepared to take it for, for life. But now, I mean, over this past 10 years, we have more data. And I, I think we, we are seeing more, I mean, I mean positive uh, uh, in the sense that um, uh, some patients in the near future, we can actually stop. Uh, if, I mean, sort of lifelong looks. This would be very encouraging because many patients don't want to start because it's indefinite therapy or they don't have a specific timeline. And then it also leads to problems with compliance. And I think we can really enhance our patient care by this, I think, reasonably optimistic communication. Ira, are you ready to do that in your practice? Definitely. Okay. All right. I have that much trouble convincing most of my patients to go on. And most of them are content with staying on. I have transparent discussion. I mentioned this at the case discussions this morning. I get a quantitative HBSAG whenever I can. It doesn't always come back, as I've discussed with you to inform the discussion that I want to have with my patients when they're four or five years out into long-term viral suppression. I'm not particularly keen to stop them because of the obvious concerns, albeit at a low frequency, particularly the non-serotics, but it's so simple to keep treating them that I generally don't end up doing that. I do feel, however, that every patient has a right to have that discussion presented to them so that they can, I, I don't have to wait for them to say, oh, I really want to get off, to even give them the information that they need to participate in making a decision. But by the time the discussion's finished with me, I generally say, stay on. And it's all easier to do so when the HBSAG is above 100, which it usually is anyway. Jorg, are you telling your patients forever and indefinite? Or are you giving an optimistic tone and you're in clinic? Of course, I'm always giving an optimistic tone, Bob. Thanks for that comment. But um, most, of, most of the patients are willing to, to take the medication and they go on with it without any problems. And, and as you all said, I mean, we are now talking about the nukes without probably only without any side effects. I mean, both of the drugs and Tecavir and Tenofovir have been on, on the market for 15 years. 
But there are, of course, some patients, and usually these are younger male patients in my experience. Um, just, just a note, the majority of patients we are treating in Germany are patients with a migration background. Um, and I'm having my problems in a while sometimes with, with younger patients, let's say of Turkish origin. When you, when you count the pills and they are telling you, yeah, I'm still taking the pills, and, but you can see that it's not the truth because they should need a new a refill of the prescription. Then I'm starting to talk with them in respect uh, of, of the amount of HBS antigen, if it makes further sense to keep them with a low adherence um, on the drug or in those patients, I'm starting the discussion that it might be more wiser under those conditions in patients with a low HPS antigen, as Ira just pointed out, to, to stop the medication. And we'll get back to this discussion in the next section. So maybe we'll be a little bit more specific. And this is for Jorg and Adam. Is the immune system involved with, or is it able to remove integrants? Or is there another process that we're going to either use naturally, or we're going to have to use new technology to remove integrants? I mean, I, I'm happy to start on that. I, I do think that the T cells are playing a role in the reduction of integrants. I mean, when you look across the phases of hepatitis B, we've seen in other people published it, the sort of the T cell response is inversely correlates with the amount of S antigen. I mean, these are only associations, um, but these inactive carriers that are E negative, they generally have more robust T cell responses. And you kind of see this maybe slow decline in S antigen in a lot of these patients, right? So this might be sort of, not clinical level liver inflammation, but there may be some slow turnover and targeting of these. I mean, it's been difficult to actually prove that, but I would feel that it is still playing a role. And, and you know, I think some of the other studies where you're removing S antigen very rapidly from the circulation shows that there is anti-HBS in some of these patients. And so this is probably also masking some of the HBS coming from the integrants um, in these patients that may achieve functional cure. You know, it, again, it's it's... It's, it's been hard to actually get to the exact data to, to, to prove that hard and fast. Adam, how important is it, do you think, to clean the integrins? And obviously, you'd like to get rid of integrins to eliminate the theoretical possibility that they could contribute to HCC uh, pathogenesis. Although, if you leave integrins, but you have an HBSAG negative patient, the risk of downstream HCC is quite low. I think we all believe that. And if it's important to remove the integrins, is it more important to remove transcription reactive integrins, or do we just need to get rid of all of them? You know, it's it is a it's a difficult question to answer because the functional cure patients will probably still have integrins in them as well, and even active CCC DNA for the most part, just it's undetectable. So. You know, I think the major concern is that transformation event that might lead to HCC. So the more of them that you can get rid of, theoretically, the better. Uh, yep. But If we get to a day when we have that magical serum assay that can distinguish integrated you know, HBSAG arising from integrins versus CCC DNA, could we learn to live with a definition of functional cure where we're satisfied that all the HBSAG is coming from integrins? Uh, Would that be our functional cure definition includes that? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yes, I, I do believe that'll be the case. And I probably that assay will become available at some point. They're getting, I mean, there's more and more data coming out that it's going to be likely to discriminate. But um, yeah, how different are those patients that would say be DNA negative, but have a low level of S antigen yeah. on no treatment? Look, I know you're yeah. interested in that issue. Go ahead. Well, I would. I would just just add two points here. In, in clinical practice, as, as Adam pointed out, when we stop um, nukes in, in some of the patients, we do see actually that they have a persistent low level of HPS antigen. But even after stopping um, um, the drugs, they, they are not showing again HPV DNA reappearance. So from that point of view, that might be some of those patients that um, have, especially in e antigen patients, e antigen negative patients, which is the majority of ours, that that show this this phenomenon that that they're from integrins HBS antigen is being produced without uh, being produced uh, CCC DNA that is still there in in an active shape. Um, furthermore, I think just adding two points here, um, we have had 
discussed at several meetings um, the fact that um, the, there were presentations that showed um, even after long-term nukes, there was a reduction in, in, in uh, viral integrations. And I think the last point I would like to make here is, um, as a matter of fact, the, the, the new third and fourth generation of, of, of CPEMs, um, especially the one that I showed um, for the CCC DNA. What I found very interesting is that in, in those um, preclinical studies, it might be possible for the first time to specifically target double-stranded linear DNAs to avoid um, further um, HPV DNA integrations in those patients. No, oh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, quick question. Um, this, this was a wonderful session and thank you for it, but just a broader question from the drug development standpoint. This is a, an ep a global epidemic that affects many resource limited countries. And I'm wondering how drug developers are thinking about functional cure treatments that have components that include subcutaneous or intravenous uh, uh, therapies and how these, these might be scalable to places where, um, where therapy is needed. Yeah, John McCutcheon gave a beautiful uh, talk from a historic viewpoint about the challenges we still face even with uh, antiviral therapy for hep C and uh, similar parts of the world that I think you're alluding to. And none of us are drug developers, we're drug explorers in the academic clinical sense. Um, but do you have any comments or have people who are in the industry talk to you about this? Bob, you're also involved with this. I campaign. think, I mean, uh, nowadays with all the new drugs, I mean, you were talking about SRNA, ASO, uh, they are, they're given, I mean, in, I mean, subcutaneously. But the thing is, I mean, if we can actually somehow expand I mean, in, uh, in, in terms of the frequency or the time for, for the injection, that will be great for the drug development. And uh, I mean, companies are now, I mean, looking into every eight weeks, every 12 weeks injection, other than every four weeks, for example, for SRNA. So I think, I mean, we, we still, I mean, I mean, every eight weeks, every, I mean, even every four weeks, if you give it, you are given for say a year or so, then I mean, people may get, I mean, acceptance on this kind of, I mean, potential finite therapy. I was gonna make a comment in that many cultures around the world, people don't believe a medication can even work unless it's given by injection. And thus we get to what we call hyper injection societies. It actually occurs in New York City in the Asian communities where they go in for injections for B12 or IV fluids and in Egypt, one of the problems with breaking the hepatitis C cycle is they have clinics in Cairo and other cities that are injector clinics where they, patients come in for medication injections, antibiotics, vitamins, whatever. So I don't see injections as being a major issue as long as you know they're not too frequent. Bulevertide will have a challenge because it's a daily injection. But fortunately with daily injections, it's got very few side effects. So we were, even Bulevertide isn't going to carry a major issue and people take insulin injections daily. Um, there's other medications that are self-injectable. So I, I don't think it's a big barrier. Our friend from Baltimore. Yeah, hey, I'm Dr. Williams from Baltimore. This is for Dr. Yu. We was part of where we go in the trial. One of my patients, after completing the trial, 12 weeks later, she cleared the surface antigen. You know, the, this was an antiquity and he had the native patient. And I was wondering whether if, if you could have followed, I don't know whether you have seen any other patients in the trial clearing the surface antigen. You mean after stopping of the drugs? After completing the trial, so 24 weeks, you know, she was part of the trial. I continued to follow her. One weeks later, is almost 36 week after completing the trial, you know, trial, she cleared the surface antigen. Then I start the surface antigen, she's zero converted to surface antibody. I mean, I mean post-treatment, post-treatment, um, I mean, surface engine loss uh, will be more often seen in, I mean, therapy using, I mean, immunomodulators rather than direct antivirals. So, so is it, I mean, my only question is, did CAM have anything to do with that? You're talking CAM. Correct, I will be going, right. She was in the trial. We we don't see yet uh, any any loss of surface engine in the CAM uh, programs. 
No, that's what, and my patient did do that. That's what. Good anecdote. Thank you. Um, MF, there's an important point in his question as well. We talk many times about whether it's pleasant to see anti-HBS appear or whether it's desirable or even necessary. I think we'd agree it's not necessary. Yeah. But how important a variable is that to document and look for in our trials, especially when we report the results? I think, I mean, uh, we really want to have the service engine laws definitely during, during therapy or even, I mean, just after the therapy. So I think, I mean, now all the trial we, we, are, we are designing uh, are still aiming at the loss of surface antigen. What about the appearance of surface yes. antibody? Yes. Is, is that um, I, mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, from the immunological point of view, I mean, yeah. clinically, clinically, I, I mean, to me, I mean, the appearance of antibodies of surface antigen as one, I mean, uh, importance is the lesser chance of getting reactivation after receiving immunosuppressive yeah. therapy. And as far as, as far as the, the, I mean, clinical outcomes in terms of XGC development, uh, cirrhosis, I don't think we have data to prove that uh, patients yeah. who have positive antibody versus negative, they have any difference. It's certainly a feel good endpoint, but is it an important endpoint? Adam, please. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, it's, I think it depends on what kind of anti-HBS antibody you're talking about, because a lot of the vaccines that have been used with therapeutic vaccines can often induce anti-HBS antibody with no effect on S antigen levels in patients too, right? So this might be a case of where I was talking about misdirected mm -hmm. immune responses in this case. So I think it just depends on what 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 kind of anti-S you're talking about. Can I ask a question for Jorg first and then back to Adam about this issue about uh, anti-core immune response? I think there was data 20 or 30 years ago that this is a, a very important part of viral control and viral clearance. It's been less emphasized recently, but now core antibody titers are coming back to be a hot topic and um, is really inducing a core anti-core response essential as part of drug development. Well, I can be short on this. I, I, I have no clue on that. I'm not an immunologist, but but I'm skeptical, let's say it this way, I'm skeptical and I'm, and I'm uh, afraid I cannot tell anything anymore to, to core antibodies. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna cop out of that one a little bit too, but I, you know, when we see inflammation, we definitely see the anti-core B cells also increase. So there is some sort of correlation there with what's happening, either maybe it's something associated with immunopathology. And when you look at the T cell response, you know, the, the core T cells often get a lot of attention because they're detectable, right? So we can measure them in patients with inactive disease, probably equally well as, as the polymerase. So, you know, they are robust responses, but yeah, I don't know what the anti-core actually at this point would, would inform sort of the progression of disease. Dr. Kim. Thank you for that interesting and helpful discussion. Um, I'm trying not to sound like an old, ordinary old guy. At the beginning of this whole conversation of functional cure, um, I thought, why not the definition of sustained biological response, like hep C? You treat a patient for a while, and six months be beyond, the surface antigen might be positive, but everybody becomes inactive carrier. That's an improvement from indefinite therapy. And um, the enthusiasm for functional cure at that time was so much that I got completely shut out and I didn't get invited back to the conference. Um, but we're going from functional cure to partial cure. Um, you know, the bar seems to be getting lower as we um, try to find the right solution. Is, is that sort of a uh, turning things off so that patient can come off treatment? Is, is that in the path of going to functional cure? Is it sort of, sort of a different direction biologically that we should always go for surface loss? Or is that an intermediate step going there, a, a, a place where um, turning patients in an active carrier off treatment and going there for a while? Um, is that a reasonable strategy? You're an expert on predicting. You've done a lot of work on the issue of predicting HCC. My, my only thought about that, but that I'd like to hear from the others, was the slide I showed um, uh, showing uh, from YIP in uh, Asia, uh -huh. showing that patients who had long-term HBSAG but no HBV DNA, uh, so complete viral suppression but no S-clearance, did have statistically higher rates of HCC. They may have been low, 
but they were statistically higher than the patients who cleared HBSAG. The, is that plausible to you, or do you challenge that, you know, the, the reliability of that conclusion based on that study? But I don't think anybody knows, even if you lose surface antigen by function or cure, would have any impact on HCC, right? We're presuming, based on observational data, patients who lose surface antigen either on nuke or naturally, their HCC risk is lower. So that's a good thing, but that's, that's different than, you know, clearing surface energy and its impact on HCC. So I, you know, I'm going back to the first part where we started that we are sort of a giving a sentence of life, lifelong therapy to our patients. But to me, uh, if we can interrupt it and say, you're gonna be on this for a while, but after that, you're gonna, we're gonna turn everybody into inactive carrier some of whom will uh, clear surface antigen, not as the ultimate goal of all this effort, but I'm wondering, uh, listening to MF's talk, that you know, CPAM has to be, you know, it was a, it was a good thing and then it was not worthwhile and then it's, it's becoming hot again. And that may be an example where by um, looking at the endpoint slightly different from functional cure to something less than that, but still desirable compared to what we have, that may be relevant. I'll just comment from the patient's perspective, breaks. We do all these surveys with Hep B Foundation. The patients want S loss. Of course, I don't that, dispute that. Right. And that S loss wish has to do with their compliance, their willingness to take new therapies, their willingness to take three new drugs or four new drugs with unknown side effects. So I think that the patients are why we're all here and that's what their next goal is because of stigma and other issues as well. And but I agree with delivering. I mean, that's the, that's a problem, right? So we, I've been telling my patients for about eight, nine years, in five years, we'll have something close to cure and we're not there. So, you know, how do we get there? I, I don't dispute that we need to get to surface loss. Um, but if we, if we set our eyes goals too high to that, are we missing an opportunity where, we, where there is a reasonable endpoint that we could take patients off and be okay while we work on the S loss program? That's my question. Let's bring Jorg back into that. Jorg, what do you think? Is that intermediate step acceptable for an alternate endpoint? Well, I'm 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 skeptical, and and there's there's another point. I agree with what was said in 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 the skepticism about having this kind of intermediate step. Um, don't forget, uh, is a kind of a worldwide problem. And what you said, Bob, with stigmatization is interesting in another aspect. Um, it, it, inactive carrier state means the patients are still um, infectious, so they might transmit the disease. So we need to discuss then what is our aim. When we, when we let people um, have a kind of viremia, and we know as an HPV, as a DNA virus is rather infectious. So I, I would see that as a problem. Any other comments from MF, Adam, on this? I, I think, I mean, that functional cure and partial cure are, are, are not exclusive, put it this way. But then, but then, I mean, uh, uh, we uh, mentioned a good point is that uh, how we, I mean, utilize the resources to achieve the, the goal, and I mean, I mean, it really depends on how potent the drugs that we are now developing, and uh, if we have a very reasonable time of time frame that we can achieve a certain percentage of functional cure. Now we are not that uh, there yet, but I mean, I mean. I uh, presented the, the real data with, although we are commenting 48 weeks of interview one, we are, we are getting 30%, although mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a small trial, but we, we, are, we are actually, I mean, heading there in a, I will, I will, I will assume in the near future. So I, I think, I mean, I still go for <laughs> functional cure. So yeah. I mean, MF, he's, I think Ray is asking about patients, for example, in Reef One, Met nuke yes, stopping criteria, yes. and you had a chance to. Well, I guess the one to you, yeah, you had a chance to watch HBSAG positive patients and see what happens to the DNA. And in other words, if, if, if those patients extended out a year or two, they're achieving the endpoint that Ray thinks might be a viable endpoint. How many such patients were there? 
I have I have no data on, on hand, but I, I think I mean if they keep I mean have a more long term data of looking at the surface entry profile after the reef one, then then we probably will see more I mean patients with reasonable reasonable lows of surface entry I mean uh, uh, surface entry of less than hundred, but my my personal I mean feeling of hundred is not good to me right. either. I mean we saw I mean we have study recruiting 100, I mean, service engine below 100. I, I can tell you 70, 70% 70, 70 at least. They have HPD and they, I mean, re, I mean, relapse greater than 2000. And I mean, I mean, people are saying 100. I, I personally, I don't think this is a good item for partial cure, I would say. Last June, there was an endpoints meeting that ASLD held with Easel in Washington, D.C., but I have yet to see a manuscript published from that endpoints meeting. So I think there's still a lot of dialogue going on in the background about- Oh, it was written, was written. And then, I mean, but it's a, I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, they, they are now, I mean, going for, uh, um, I mean, publication, I mean, submission. Great. Yeah. 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 Try to try paper, to is done, paper, yeah. paper is done and ready to be submitted. Say again, your paper. I can just agree. MF paper is done. All the work is done and is ready to be submitted. It's on its way. Okay. Um, I, I tried to embed a couple of questions and throw them out um, in my talk. A couple of things I'm very anxious to ask you. This is for Adam as well uh, as for everybody else. I mentioned the difference in responsiveness of antigen positive to negative patients that were diametrically opposite with ASOs and with. SIRNAs. Any thoughts about that? What's the explanation for that? I I, you know. I don't I don't have a good explanation in okay. terms of the difference between these two agents or yeah. different uh, E positive and E negative. But one thing is, I mean, when, when we look at all this, I mean, reduction of surface antigen or response, et cetera, uh, we really don't know, I mean, how many patients they have, I mean, go far beyond the undetectable level and that actually limit limit the log reduction that you can see in, 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 the, in the trial. So it's a matter of how you present the results in, in different studies. And that you, we, we need, really need to look at the, the, the rooms for the improvement for different individual yeah. trials. That's, that's why we may see, I mean, some, I would say conflicting results in terms of the service and I mean, the, uh, in different groups of patients. Actually, you, you answered an even more important question, but the question I meant to ask that I don't think I was clear was the differential effects of the presence or absence of E antigen in determining, because they were exactly the opposite, right? The ASOs work better in the E negatives, the ASIRNAs and the E positives. Maybe you took my question correctly, but I guess you're saying no thoughts about that either. We just don't have an answer, yes. right? Now, getting back to the most important question, HBSAG clearance, clearly the ASOs did better. The ASOs also were associated with a higher rate of ALT flares on yes. therapy. There's no doubt about that. We talk about ASOs having modulatory properties that perhaps may exceed those of siRNAs, and we're talking about, you know, TLR um, agonism. Uh, and Adam, I know you're going to get into this as well. Are all those things uh, themes linked? Perhaps the greater in the modulatory and the stimulatory effect from made immunity pathways uh, for ASOs, the eight NLT flares, and that gets into the whole that I had from Jean Michel about whether ALT flares are necessary. And I'm not sure whether in your study of the BEPI uh, drug, MF, the ALT flares correlated with better hbsag related outcomes. But maybe, yeah, why don't you come to the regulatory properties that we think are uh, present with the ASOs? First of all, is that correct? I do think it's correct. It's like a, a almost an, an inbuilt uh, combination therapy almost. I think the data that's been presented, you know, what pattern recognition receptor, what TLR is not really nailed down yet, but the kinetics and of most of these ALT flares would be consistent with that sort of early initiation of uh, an, an innate response driving sort of a progressive uh, activation of Im Im the immune response, infiltration of cells and causing liver damage. I don't think it, I, I also wouldn't think in, in that level of time, you know, this is three to five weeks is where most of this action is happening at the beginning, that it would, HPV that it would be HPV specific T cells. So it is getting an antiviral effect that's being induced. I don't think it's going to be HPV specific at this point, but 
it seems to be potentially interferon gamma mediated, which we know has some antiviral effect. And there may be something about the sensitivity of infected hepatocytes versus uninfected hepatocytes to some of the cytotoxicity that's happening that helps drive that down. And then the antiviral activity of ASOs keep that going down as that initial flare of ALT increases. And, and actually the kinetics of ALT, and, and maybe MF, you can correct me, but the fact that Bepi keeps going, but the ALT is only at the beginning, right? So you're triggering something and I have hypothesis of what that will be. It depends on where the target and the HPV RNA is. And then that RNA gets eliminated. And so you lose your immunological stimulati- stimulatory effect. And then you get the antiviral effect that continues to suppress it down. So clearly I think it's a synergistic effect because these patients are doing much better in terms of the S decline, what the exact mechanism is actually something we're working with them to identify now. And again, MF in the uh, uh, Be Clear study, the Bapiro Versin study, in, I don't know if you've done the correlative analysis yet, but do you have an impression of the patients who cleared HPSAG at the end of treatment, certainly those 9 to 10% who were clear, uh, even really more actually were clear, they just didn't have that composite score. It's important to remember that the primary endpoint was a composite score of HPV DNA negative and uh, HPSAG less than 0.05. But regardless, are those the patients who had more flares, or do we have that analysis? In, in fact, not only in the B clearly, in the, in the phase 1B study using a BAP-P, we, we actually consistently saw that the, the degree of surface engine actually correlated very well with the, the chance as well as the magnitude of ALT flare. Okay. So that is for sure, uh, in, in the, I mean, in, in the context of using BAP-P for, for, for hepatitis B. Yeah, are you putting together an analysis or for oral present or for presentation or paper? No, but I mean, I think I mean we actually put that that, I mean, that supplementary paper? materials in the New England Journal okay. Medicine paper. Yes. Okay, so, good. Actually, I want to ask him if a question on this. These that be based because I was looking at the New England Journal paper actually just last week again, and the ALT flares. My impression is they're higher in the untreated patients versus the nucleoside analog treated patients. Uh, this is again a very, I mean, a consistent phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we saw, I mean, in other studies too. I mean, if we are using ASO or even as RNA in tumor naive patients, and they, they, the flare actually actually is is worse. I mean, in terms of the level of the ALT. And that's why I think the immunomodulatory effect comes in because when you're not on nukes, all that viral RNA is present, it potentially is present in macrophages and something mm-hmm. else, and so it's engaging the RNA and probably is becoming some sort of a innate immunomodulator at that point. That's my hypothesis on how it's working. Dr. Kuo. Hi. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, great, great discussion. Thanks so much. So MF in the Bepi paper, do you, was it analyzed how many of the individuals, not who met the primary endpoint, which is, you know, was service antigen clearance, but who actually maybe adjusted down maybe surface antigen log by two logs. So in other words, instead of, you know, being at a thousand, they were at 10 or you know what I'm saying? I mean, just to talk about endpoints and we're all obviously still going for functional cure, but did that finite course in a population, could you identify a group that you actually reset the immune, you know, um, uh, equilibrium in such a way that these individuals now have lower surface antigen levels? We, we do. I mean, we actually have the figures of how many patients or proportion of patients that ha- achieve, I mean, different levels of uh, uh, surface engine at the end of therapy as well as 24 weeks of therapy. So, I mean, again, in the arm, th- I mean, in, in the arm one, they actually had the biggest proportion yeah, of patients. Weeks. That was a 24 week arm. No, it's also on the post 24 weeks of therapy. Both are actually mentioned in, in, in the paper, but I can't remember exactly the numbers. But I mean, that after 24 weeks of, I mean, after 24 uh, 20 weeks of, uh, uh, of paratherapy, some patients they actually with a rebound of service antigen at the 24 weeks post therapy. And that was also listed um, in, the, in, in the paper. Okay. Yeah. Can we have everybody back in 10 minutes? We are going to get into part two of today. You're all set? Yep. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. Actually, good answer. Okay. Good afternoon. It's almost good evening. Fantastic first session today. Our first presentation of this next section is Dr. Afdal, who's based in Boston. He'll be here with us virtually. And there's two reasons about this stop discussion. 
The first one is, I just want to remind everybody from our Hepatitis B Foundation surveys that 40% of patients stop their own nukes without telling their provider or they tell their provider later. So stopping is just part of the hepatitis B culture. There's many reasons why people stop. We can get into that in the Q&A. And the second reason is, is that the FDA is having dialogue with many pharma companies about drug development and requesting or requiring or stating that they want these studies to be stop studies like what we saw with the reef. So finite therapy is what patients want. The FDA is really pushing for finite therapy. So we really need to get our arms around this stop world. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Afdal for the first presentation of this section. Hello and welcome. I'm going to be discussing stopping therapy in HBV clinical trials and what should be the criteria for discontinuation. These are my disclosures. There's a difficulty in understanding when to stop in clinical trials because there currently exists a controversy about when we can stop in clinical practice. And this controversy creates uh, quite a difficulty in terms of determining the appropriate way to stop treatment for our patients. You can see here the different guidelines that are available from the three major liver scientific societies for stopping nucleotide therapy on HB antigen positive and HB antigen negative patients. You can see that in the HB antigen positive patients, there's a prerequisite for E antigen seroconversion to E antibody. And then both ASLD and ESL consider that you can stop after one year of consolidation therapy in the non-serotic patient. ASLD is a little more conservative, saying that you could alternatively treat until surface antigen loss. Apazel has a preferable three-year consolidation period. Now, I want to remind everyone that this is simply to stop nucleotide nucleoside therapy and have continued suppression. This is not for surface antigen loss. For the E antigen negative patients, the guidelines again are very difficult. ASLD is indefinite treatment unless there is a compelling rationale to stop, and it may be considered with surface antigen loss. Easel says that you can discontinue after surface antigen loss, and in certain selected non-serotic patients, after three years or more of virological suppression, and that is complete virological suppression to undetected over three years. In a puzzle, it's hepatitis B surface antigen with surface antibody conversion, or one year post hepatitis B surface antigen consolidation. And they also have this caveat that you can consider it after two years of complete virological suppression. So you can see that we don't even know when to stop treatment in uh, our uh, patient population. What we do know is that hepatitis B surface antigen loss rarely occurs during nuke therapy. Here you see the seroclearance on either entecavir or tenofovir, our best nukes, over a period of time, and the cumulative loss at 10 years, 2.11%. Now, this is very slow. This is a real-life study of uh, almost 5,000 chronic hepatitis B patients, and you can see the annualized and cumulative rate of loss within the table. So we can say that it is unusual. I give you a caveat here. What we are seeing now as we're entering patients having been on nuke therapy without resistance for 10 and sometimes 15 years, we are beginning to see, I believe, a slightly higher rate of uh, surface antigen loss. Uh, at least that is my own personal clinical experience, and we'll wait to see some data emerging from real-life studies uh, in this area. Now, these studies also show the factors associated with spontaneous surface antigen seroclearance. And you can see that these factors include the baseline HBV DNA. The lower the baseline HBV DNA, the better the chances of surface antigen seroclearance. And also, I think more importantly, and used widely in clinical practice, is the new quantitative hepatitis B surface antigen. And you can see that those patients with uh, lower levels of quantitative S, 
class had the highest rates in terms of serial clearance of hepatitis B surface antigen. This has been translated somewhat into clinical practice in terms of when to stop treatment for patients with uh, uh, who are on nukes. Now, why should we stop nucleotide and nucleoside therapy? If you think about it, nukes are now predominantly generic. They're relatively cheap. And there are multiple reasons why uh, you can stop. One of the reasons that has been suggested many times, uh, based initially on studies that came from Greece, is that stopping the nuke may actually facilitate surface antigen loss. The concept being here that you stop the nuke, there's a slight increase in HBV DNA. The body sees this slight increase and it starts to develop an immune response against the virus and clears the virus. However, this is not absolutely uh, 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 written in stone and it hasn't really been validated that there is such a thing as reactivation of immunity after stopping a nuke therapy. Now, there are risks associated with it. Those risks, in, uh, the predominant one that most people uh, are aware of is ALT flares. And these flares can be significant. They can be five to 10 times the upper limit of normal, but they can also be 20 or 30 times. And rarely they can cause uh, hepatic decompensation and death, usually in patients who have cirrhosis. Uh, and again, if you remember the guidelines, all of them state that you should not stop therapy in patients who have cirrhosis. One of the reasons why we do this and one of the reasons why we're pursuing functional cure of HBV is that patients have a desire to stop therapy. The idea of an indefinite long-term therapy is difficult for patients with an asymptomatic disease and an unknown outcome at the end of that disease. I know there's a risk of uh, HCC and a risk of progression to cirrhosis, but these are risks that many patients don't uh, adequately understand. Now, there have been studies that have looked at nuke withdrawal in patients with chronic HPV and, and have attempted to see whether this nuke withdrawal can result in loss of surface antigen. These studies have been done globally. This is the Retract B study. Uh, the aims here were to do nuke withdrawal and to see if there was durable and sustained surface antigen loss. This was a retrospective look after, at about one year after stopping the nukes. You can see the study population population in the table on the on the right the study population is uh, predominantly asian interestingly 11% of patients were cirrhotic prior to nuke cessation and the nuke duration was a, a, a mean of approximately 3 years the surface antigen quantitative at the time of nuke cessation was relatively high at 2.6 logs uh, and the patients were followed up for a one year time point you can see next the results of this. 57% of patients had a virological relapse, 36% a biochemical re relapse, 24% a clinical relapse, and almost two-thirds had at least one relapse in the year post-stopping uh, a nuke. So we really did not see a significant number of patients uh, develop even a sustained virological remission as defined by a DNA of less than 2,000 and ALT of less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. When we look at this, you can see that uh, uh, the patients who sustained remission or HB surface antigen loss total is about 30%. Uh, without loss, uh, again, over time, off treatment, you can see that there's a steady decline in those who are able to sustain a remission. And these graphs simply show the biochemical, virological, and clinical relapse across the patients. Overall, uh, HB surface antigen loss was uh, uh, relatively low. Only 30% of patients remained in sustained remission, and the success is lower in Asians. So we can't really uh, determine uh, whether this study gives us a rationale for stopping treatment in these uh, chronic HBV patients, since we really don't see a significant loss of HBSAG or functional cure. We do see a percentage of patients who have a low level of HBSAG, but that is not what we're going for when we're trying to achieve functional cure. Another study was STOP B. This has uh, received quite a lot of attention. This was uh, uh, done in a number of Australian centers. It's a good study in that they look at 96 weeks of follow up. These are patients in whom the nu nuke was stopped uh, and they had been suppressed for at least 18 months. 
Another caveat here is that many of these studies have very different variations in how long patients have been on nukes before stopping. And this, uh, this can definitely affect uh, the success of these STOP trials. You can see the patient population there. The, in this study, predominantly entecavir treated patients, about two-thirds, the other third were on tenofovir. Uh, the viral loads in terms of uh, surface antigen levels are quite varied, with approximately 20% of patients with a surface antigen level of less than uh, 100 at the time the treatment was stopped. Safety was quite good. There are a few patients with elevated bilirubin, uh, uh, and some of these had to restart their, their treatment. There was no real liver failure per se. These are the clinical outcomes. You can see here, if we focus on the bars of surface antigen loss, uh, you can see that there are very few patients that actually had surface antigen loss. You can see that overall, by week 96, 6% 6, uh, uh, of patients had surface antigen loss. And those patients that had surface antigen loss were those who had uh, very low levels of uh, HBSAG prior to treatment. In fact, predominantly, they were patients who were in the group who had a surface antigen level of less than 10 prior to treatment. Again, this study tells us that after stopping nukes, surface antigen loss is extremely rare when there is the presence of surface antigen, unless it's at very, very low level. Uh, these are the ALT uh, uh, issues here. You do have a proportion of patients that have an ALT that increases to two times the upper limit of normal. Again, there was no evidence of liver failure or need for liver transplant in this population. One interesting fact was the patients on entecavir uh, took a longer time to relapse than those on tenofovir, but that just requires longer follow-up. There was no difference in actual loss of HBSAG. We've talked about the fear of flares. There are studies that look at the risk of flares in patients who uh, uh, are uh, uh, on treatment with, uh, with uh, nukes and have nukes stopped. Uh, this is a large study of almost 10,000 patients from an eligible initial population of 218,000 patients who were monitored. There were severe hepatitis flares, and there were patients that died in this study uh, and who had liver transplant. But what's really important about this study is that 11% of patients had cirrhosis, 5% of patients had a history of hepatic decompensation. These are not patients in whom there are any recommendations to stop treatment. And in fact, treatment was stopped because these were the uh, treatment guidelines of, uh, of Taiwan where this study uh, was performed. Uh, and you can see here that the real risk factors for complications are previous diagnosis of cirrhosis uh, is the biggest one by far, and also older age. Uh, so it's important that if you're even thinking about stopping uh, nuke therapy, that you uh, uh, consider age and the presence of cirrhosis. So that's the ba that's the background. How does this translate to novel therapies and combinations? Well, the first thing you have to do is look at the mechanism of the novel therapies. What is the strategy in which you're trying to obtain a functional cure of HBV with loss of surface antigen? So there's the viral suppression, viral production, targeting CCC DNA, and immune strategies. All have been proposed and all have different rationales for when and to stop all treatment, including nukes. Some commonalities do occur, but most of these are related to the hepatitis B surface antigen level at the time that you stop uh, treatment. What is clear is that there's pretty good safety data uh, that's come from real world studies and clinical trials that it is safe in the non cirrhotic patient. This is a study with Vebicorvir. This is a drug, as you know, has been discontinued due to lack of efficacy. It's a study uh, which is very complex, but essentially uh, patients were treated with Vebicorvir uh, and they uh, were followed with significant viral suppression. The viral suppression in this trial was measured down uh, not just to less than 10 IUs, but to less than 6 IUs. Uh, and the uh, patients were stopped when they met the criteria for stopping treatment. Uh, there was uh, no uh, surface antigen 
clearance on treatment and the mean surface angina at the time of stopping was about three logs. Uh, after stopping, no sustained DNA or, or uh, pregenomic RNA suppression. In fact, very rapid relapse took place in terms of both the uh, relapse uh, in for uh, uh, HBV DNA and pregenomic uh, RNA. So this deep suppression for up to uh, 76 weeks did not result in the ability to lose surface antigen. And when all treatment was stopped, suppression uh, viral uh, recurrence was uh, great. Suppression alone, this is a difficult approach. You know, we talk about finite therapy for HBSAG loss. Finite can be one year, two years, but it can also be 10 or 15 years. What we don't know is whether these drugs will accelerate surface antigen loss after a longer period of suppression. These are almost impossible to do in clinical trials because nobody wants to do a five or 10 year clinical trial. So duration is critical. Uh, the E-negative patients suppressed on nukes for a long term probably represent the best target for a suppression strategy alone. Uh, uh, and there is this evidence, as I alluded to, of continued uh, uh, quantitative surface antigen decline in clinical practice when you continue with nuke-based therapies. I think suppressive strategies will need combination approach, and we are going to need to see at least a decline in surface antigen, probably less than 100, preferably less than 10, prior to stopping treatment in the suppression alone paradigm. The siRNA and antisense therapies are a little different because these therapies are geared to actually have a direct effect on on, on virological production of HBSAG and other uh, uh, viral uh, uh, replication proteins uh, and uh, obviously on RNA. And in the clinical trials, we do see a lot of people with very low level of hepatitis B surface antigen, either undetectable or less than 10, uh, with normal ALT and no detectable DNA. Uh, these trials have all predominantly used the variable fixed duration of therapy rather than waiting until pre-specified stopping rules are achieved. And this is the, this is the complexity in clinical trials. Should we have a pre-specified stopping rules? And they've also included both E-positive and E-negative patients, variable degrees of nucle nucleotide suppression, and naive patients as well. While the strategy is okay for phase two, this is much too complex in a phase three and could be highly confounding as to the success and the results of the trials. Some of these trials have done immunological evaluations at the time of stopping, and these are useful to see if there is any immune reconstitution, but they remain, I think, in my mind, still not definitive as to whether this occurs. So when we look at this, what we're going to look at is the B-clear bepireversin data. As you know, this is uh, a uh, antisense that is used. Uh, and in this trial, they did a predefined treatment period, but without any predefined criteria for stopping. Patients uh, with a with, uh, uh, a low surface antigen titer at baseline had the highest rates of surface antigen loss, and there's continued on treatment follow-up to determine whether functional cure or loss of HBSAG can be achieved. There are also ALT flares associated with this treatment. You can see that stopping treatment in hepatitis B is complex. We have uh, differential responses according to the type of patient, the age, the presence of cirrhosis, the duration of treatment, and even the type of nucleotide used. We're trying to incorporate this data into how we design clinical trials, and this is extremely complicated and depends frequently on the mechanism of the drug use. The only thing that we can truly say is that the best time to stop is when there is no surface antigen detectable, uh, and that stopping when surface antigen is detectable uh, usually does not lead to the possibility of surface antigen loss in the short-term follow-up periods. 
we're going to cre have to create different stop rules for different mechanisms of action. And the role of duration of therapy remains extremely unclear. This concept of finite therapy, there's finite for drug trials, which is short, and there's finite for patients, which can be relatively longer. And it's unclear whether consolidation should or should not take place. In other words, should we stop everything all at once, or should we have a consolidation period where the patient stays on a nuke or an immunomodulator uh, at the end of treatment? There should be different stop rules for nuke naive versus nuke suppressed. I, I'm I'm very uh, confident that this will develop, and also for e antigen positive versus e antigen negative, uh, and there will be different stop rules perhaps based on the baseline surface antigen levels. Maybe those with low surface antigen levels can go for shorter duration versus those with high greater than three logs uh, going for a longer period of time. You know, this uh, is a difficult talk because I don't have an answer. And all I can say is that all that we really know is that functional cure is difficult to achieve. Thank you for your attention. That was great. Helped us answer the questions that we still are questioning. All right, <clears throat> Ray, we're welcoming you to talk to us about this great uh, difficulty. We're choosing which nuke to use and is TAF and TDF really better? Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Ira, for inviting me to do this. Okay, so uh, compared to all the um, novel, uh, innovative, interesting topics uh, that preceded me, I have a relatively uh, mundane but real life situation. So that topic is, is there a real difference between entecavir and tenofovir for operations in terms of relapse and HCC? So as you look at the, the triangle, I think about at least four different domains where the two nucleoside versus nucleotide um, uh, types may differ. And the center is antiviral efficacy. That's sort of a no-brainer, important aspect. But there's obviously safety difference, but there may be um, some immunological and cancer biology difference uh, between those two uh, categories. So I'm going to talk about antiviral efficacy at the beginning and relapse impact on HCC and give you some biological data and end with the take home. I'm gonna start with a case. This is a case that I inherited a few years ago from a colleague who retired. And I saw him this Monday and went like, oh wow, this is a perfect person I need to talk about. So 30 year old Chinese American person had been diagnosed in childhood and he was treatment naive. This was 2011, E, e positive. You can see at time zero, he had a very high viral load. ALT was the 108. And he was put on entecavir 0.5 once a day. In six months, the viral load went down to 57,000. ALT decreased somewhat. And then in another six months, his a, uh, DNA stopped decreasing, if not went up a little bit. And ALT went down a little bit, but not really impressively. So my question to you with a quick show of hands, uh, who wants to stay on course for another six months and reassess if it goes down? Anybody? Who wants to switch? More hands, okay. No, this is naive. Yep. I'm sorry? Adding. Adding, well. All, all good ideas, but that's not what happened. So um, ASLD guideline took a little bit of beating this morning, but this is pretty safe area where we compare uh, the efficacy of different uh, approved pro products. And you can see the Antecavir is there, uh, TDF, TAF, and PEG interferon. And on the E positive side, you can see a noticeable difference in the viral suppression. You note that these were older data that uh, the sensitivity limit is, is higher than what we used to seeing. But 61% E-positive patients in Tecavir clear virus compared to 76, 73% and uh, PEG interferon much lower. So on the E-antigen positive side, you can see that there is a suggestion of difference. On the E-negative side, as you can expect with a low viral load, um, the difference goes away. But there's a big disclaimer, these are not head-to-head -head comparisons. So are there head-to-head -head comparisons? And I'm aware of two data sets. The first is uh, this uh, Thai study where they compared 
uh, entecavir versus TDF, a pretty good sample size, about 200 individuals. About 50% were E positive, with the mean viral load is what you expect, seven logs for E positive, five logs for E negative. The left panel is um, combining E positive, E negative patients. At two years, 89% entecavir treated patients cleared compared to 94. But if you go to three years, they catch up, almost catch up 91 versus 94%. So that's what their overall data is. The right panel is focusing on E positive patients at three year time point. If you look at E loss, 33% versus 44, E uh, conversion, 27% 34. So you get the impression that um, uh, tenofovir is a, a slightly better than entecavir, but in spite of the relatively good sample size, there are no statistical significant difference. The second data set comes from Japan. This is only a 48 week trial, uh, tenofovir versus entecavir. The study was set up as a non inferiority um, comparison. So you will not see the p values comparing TDF being superior. So, first impression, primary endpoint, the white score is a little bit lower entecavir than TDF up to 48 weeks. That's consistent with what we've been seeing. And then if you break that down to E positive versus E negative, exactly what has been shown before that E positive patients, you can almost see that the 95% confidence intervals don't overlap. So one can argue that there's statistically significant difference out to 48 weeks for E positive patients, but virtually no, di no difference E negative patients. So I think that's totally a totality of data that if you start generating this um, scorecard comparing entecavir versus TDF, efficacy-wise, tenofovir is better. We know that, right? Um, but marginally in terms of head-to-head -head comparisons, and that is more pronounced in E-positive patients. So our back to our case, he was switched to TDF. We, we, we are not as brilliant as doubling entecavir dose or adding TDF. But it worked um, that in six months, he became undetectable and ALT went down further. But my colleague was anxious that his ALT is not going down enough. So he took a biopsy and he showed what you expect, grade one inflammation, F0 fibrosis and mild steatosis. So we went on and by year four, which is when I took, took over, he had undetectable DNA, ALT normalized, then he had zero converted, E antigen negative, E antibody positive. So the question to you again, quick show of hands, what do you do with the zero conversion? Do you stop TDF after some period of consolidation? Stoppers? We don't know. Okay, who would, who would not stop? More hands, okay. So it was stopped. Um, after one and a half years of consolidation. And then three months later, we brought him back, viral load went, went up, ALT went up. So I, I, I saw him a month later. It's completely clear that he needs to go back, he need to go back on treatment. So um, uh, with ALT of 542, the TDF was restarted and thankfully he remained E antigen negative, antibody positive, that didn't get changed. And as of year nine, which was last year, now Bob, a, our, QHS, Q, uh, uh, quantitative surface antigen is 220, which is lower than I, I expected as of, as of that time. So that's, that's where we are. So we can talk maybe, um, you know, do we feel uh, audacious enough at this point with that low surface antigen? Do we, do we try to stop uh, uh, antiviral treatment at this point? And the other question that I'm asked is, are, is he really better off being on TDF? Or perhaps we should have doubled his entecavir and see what happened in terms of relapse risk. So that's the next topic. Um, so as Bob alluded to, uh, Taiwan had a system where you treat patients for three years and everybody had to get off unless you're cirrhotic or something like that. So they generate this data that patients who relapsed after treatment discontinuation, this particular slide shows E antigen positive patients Left panel is viral relapse with DNA greater than 2000. Right panel is clinical relapse, ALT over 80 on top. And you can see there's a dramatic difference in the virologic relapse, TDF versus entecavir, 
over 40%, highly statistically significant, and clinical relapse was also very different between TDF and entecavir. So that is, that is pretty noticeable. And my question here is, are these patients comparable? So maybe the TDF patients were more treatment experienced, harder to treatment, harder to treat, and the virus would come back quicker than entecavir patients. And there's a little bit of a difference. There's a 10% difference in uh, TDF patients being not treatment naive, but I don't know if that is enough to explain this difference. The next slide is E antigen negative patients. The difference is smaller, but statistically significant difference in terms of the rate of relapse, uh, both for that viral um, relapse and clinical relapse. But the trend is there. This is a first data set. This slide has been shown multiple times, a retract B study. And, um, and, and these are E negative patients whose treatment was stopped and their, their surface antigen quantity uh, determines their ultimate phase, fate with regard to surface antigen loss. That's what the slide shows. But the point is that they looked at TDF versus ETV in that setting. So these are a bunch of patients whose um, treatment was stopped. And um, looking at the fine, rip, uh, uh, fine prints, the first data set, Taiwan, Taiwanese data set, uh, the investigators were part of this study. So if there's a patient overlap or not, um, I'm not sure, but the, the sample size here is much larger. You can see that the pattern is exactly the same, that E negative patients, as we saw two slides ago, uh, viral relapse, clinical relapse is higher in TDF patients than entecavir patients in this data set, there's no difference in treatment naive um, status. So very consistent, as far as I can tell, between the two data sets about relapse. However, if you look at more harder endpoints with regard to treatment reinitiation or surface antigen loss, there was no difference. So what does that mean clinically? That remains to be seen. So the scorecard, the next line, uh, relapse and tecavir seems to be better, but this is emerging data. What it means clinically, we're not sure at this point. How about cancer? We heard about this a lot, so I'm giving you a shameless plug of, of my paper. Uh, this was a US study where we accumulated entecavir, tenofovir treated patients over about 12 years of, of, of data. And this is a claims database data. We collected 10,000 patients and the time frame is relevant because this is a period where we have a pretty uh, uh, steady state practice pattern with regard to entecavir versus tenofovir. These were treatment naive patients, about 4,000 on entecavir and 6,000 tenofovir. When we followed them forward with all kinds of complicated statistical techniques, the hazard ratio ended up being 0.58, favoring tenofovir patients at lower risk of HCC. And you have seen many, many, many of these data. Oh my goodness. Um, so that slide showed that um, there were 32 studies, same topic, and there were even six meta-analysis, meta-analyzing the same data and somehow coming up with different results. But it's a point to estimate difference, but if you look at, the overall totality, everybody lines up around has a ratio of 0.8. The latest uh, addition that we did was to do an individualized meta-analysis, which showed the same thing. So the final scorecard about, okay. So the right panel is the individual, um, individual meta-analysis that showed entecavir, people keep going up about two or three years after TDF, the line starts to go down. So the ultimate has a ratio of 0.77, large number of patients, 43,000. So the last line in the scorecard, it looks like TDF, if tenofovir is better, um, albeit this is observational data, randomized clinical trial with a cancer endpoint is unlikely to materialize. So that's the summary that I have so far. And the question is, what, why would this be? Um, there's a, you know, a signal going in different directions. So I'm going to show you quickly three sets of experimental data. 
And the first one shows that nucleotide analogs induce better immune response uh, interferon lambda three than nucleoside analogs. The inter interferon lambda three is the famous IL-28B uh, we, we are familiar with from the hepatitis C experience. On the left-hand side, you can see that nucleoside treated patients have lower serum levels in interferon lambda, whereas nucleotide treated patients had generated more interferon response in the serum. On the right-hand side, downstream molecules from interferon show that at the death of ear treated cell lines into, uh, generated more downstream um, molecules it responses than entecavir or control. So that's number one. Number two is IL-10 versus IL-12. IL-10 is more a pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine, IL-12 being more immune potentiating. It's, it's a better, it's a, it's a, it's a good um, responder. If you can look at the left side, adefavir, tenofovir bars are more towards IL-12, whereas entecavir is more towards IL-10. And the, the cartoon on the right-hand side shows the AKT to PAKT conversion is the key step. And if you block that with adefavir and tenofovir, you will see anti-HCC uh, response and anti hep B uh, as a result of IL-10, IL-12 balance. You have a beneficial effect as a result of that. And the picture in the middle is that we will see lower activation on the membrane of TDF-treated cells in terms of AKT and PAKT compared to antecavir. So there's a pro and anti-inflammatory and immune stimulatory effect between the two. And the third part is, is a cancer biology. Telomerase, as you're familiar, uh, the length of tel telomeres reflect biological uh, senescence. As chronic liver disease progresses, you see shortening of telomere in the liver cells. That's sort of a, what the, the uh, natural history is. But if you, if you go from there to liver cancer, then telomere goes back up as a result of telomere, telomerase uh, activity going up to so cancer cells preserving itself. And the, the data on the right-hand side shows in the HIV uh, data that tenofovir compared to lamivudine and emtricitabine, um, the, 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 the gray, gray area is where the physiologic level is shown. You can see that telomere, telomere rays activity is lower in physiologic range uh, for TDF versus nucleoside analogs. So there are multiple pieces of data that suggest that they are biologically different, but the bottom line is there are arrows going in different directions. So again, tenofovir seem to be better in certain things and entecavir somehow is uh, relapse preventing, so to speak. So despite these uh, data suggesting advantage of TDF or tenofovir clinical data are mixed, for high viral load E-positive patients, tenofovir may be preferred for better control of their viremia. For relapse purpose, further data are needed. So for example, would you switch a patient stable on TDF to entecavir before you take them off treatment for CE0 conversion or low surface antigen quantity? I don't think we're there yet. For cancer question, to me, new high-risk patients, high viral load, fibrosis, family history, 20% reduction in HCC risk. That was the hazard ratio, right? 80%. 20% plus reduction in HCC risk in a high-risk patient is a meaningful reduction to me. So preferring tenofovir may be reasonable, but in existing patient who is under well-controlled and, and the risk is low, 20% uh, lowering of a low risk is too small for me to go uh, to change uh, from, from other antivirals to tenofovir product. And always we talk about this with patient with informed um, in, uh, preference generation on our patient's part. So I hope that made some sense. Thank you very much for your attention. If you don't mind, Ray, can we do a Q&A and the sure. audience can bring your questions up? Feel free to have a seat. Um, Dr. Aftal is not online yet. He'll probably come online for Q&A a little bit later. So we're going to do, if that's all right, uh, take some uh, questions to Dr. Kim and Ira's hopping up. Yeah, Ray, that was fascinating. I, congratulations on that work. I hadn't been aware that you've done all that. Is, is that a little published already? The, everything you just presented about your meta-analysis. Okay. 
So uh, the fascinating question to me is, yeah, in tech, it may be better to prevent relapse, but if you're in the clinic and you've got a patient on tenofovir thinking about switching, there's a piece of information you'll never have, which is whether that patient would have responded to entecovir in the first place, because you only know that the entecovir treated patients from the outset have lower relapse rates. So I, it doesn't seem that attractive an option to me, but what do you think? Yeah. Let me ask you about another setting in which that difference in initial responsiveness might be more attractive with tenofovir, but I'm not sure it makes a difference. The chemotherapy, immunosuppressive therapy, patients who have to be prophylaxed, it seems intuitively might like you might want the more potent drug, but entecovir is still a very potent drug. So I don't think it really matters probably, but it, it's something it, that would influence me. I already use tenofovir pretty much anyway, but if I didn't, I, I, I don't know if that means, do you have any reaction to that? Mm -hmm. Middle to either way uh, in that setting. If so, you're 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 trying to prevent relapse. You're trying to prevent reactivation in right. a cancer patient, let's say, who has HBSAG or even anticore, getting rituximab or the like. Um, I I can't. I don't think I can answer that on an evidence-based basis. But you know, my gut feeling is that the patient who doesn't have a significant degree of viremia at baseline and yeah. trying to react uh, prevent reactivation. I think, you know, uh, entecovir um, being a less potent drug, but in that setting might be enough. And my, my experience, in my experience, I haven't seen that outcome um, yeah. using entecovir. Yeah. So I, I have to say. I agree. Um, it probably yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. Thank you. So Dr. Afdal has joined us. Nid, can you hear us okay? We see you've got your phone. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So we're doing a, an interim Q&A with you and Ray uh, pending the next two lectures. And Ray was just describing this entecovir tenofovir uh, dialogue that's going on. And I will pose a question to both you and Ray. You get called to an ad board for a company who's got a CRISPR or some epigenetic modifier, some really new technology to treat hepatitis B. They're going to ask you which nuke to put a patient on, or you're supposed to be uh, nuke uh, ignorant or uh, tolerant of any of the nukes, would you advise them to choose TAF, TDF, or Entecavir, or say, oh, we'll treat them all the same? It's a really good question, because it depends what it is you're trying to look at. So, you know, there's a lot of data, and I think I, I actually uh, made some suggestions that uh, when you're on Entecavir, there's a lower rate of, uh, 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 there's slower rate of recurrence with entecovir. There's also the issue of the cancer issues with entecovir. I think it depends what it is that you're trying to look at. I think that if you're doing a clinical trial, uh, perhaps uh, you want to get the results as quickly as you can so that tenofovir might be the better choice in that situation because of the, the more predictability of early relapse. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to say. I think it depends on on what agents you're looking at. But you know, again, uh, uh, I think that for a lot of our pharmaceutical friends, they're trying to get the answers very quickly, and tenofovir might give you a quicker answer than entecovir. Ray, you're on the hot seat now. Same question. Yeah, I, I'm still intrigued why that there's difference between entecovir and tenofovir in terms of relapse and. You know, although there were only 10% difference in the treatment naive um, status, I, I, I wonder, you know, there's a patient difference. So none of the studies really did like a propensity score matching to really level the playing field. So um, I don't know what the right answer for is, but my, my confidence that entecovir is a better drug to pre prevent patients from having 
more uh, pronounced relapse is, is not very high. Uh, next question, Nid, this goes to your stop um, you know, presentation, which was fantastic and really walked us through the, the challenges. I don't know if you heard during the intro, though, that Hepatitis B Foundation has done these surveys and monitoring. You know, we monitor 10,000 patient interactions a year. This goes back over a decade, so it's a lot of information. 40% of patients are stopping their nukes on their own, either short, intermediate, or long-term, sometimes telling their providers and sometimes disappearing. So in this environment of what our patients are doing, how does that influence your decisions either in the patient population to stop a drug or in study designs? Is it best since people are, half people are coming off anyway? Let's get to short-term finite therapy across the board. So I think that's one of the critical questions of why it is we're doing what we're doing. So we're doing what we're doing in trying to develop finite therapy and promote a functional cure because we know as clinicians, because we treat patients, we know that patients come off drugs. That's very different to what our regulatory authorities know. So we know, that, and I would agree with 40%, that many of our patients stop their treatment very, very early uh, and without telling their physicians. And uh, this puts them at risk, obviously, of flare. Uh, and it also, it also really changes the paradigm of the concept of long-term suppression and reduction of clinical outcomes. So because we know that, we want functional cure. So uh, what it really tells us is that we need to continue to strive for functional cure because functional cure will make us much more comfortable if our patients do spontaneously stop treatment. I mean, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change how we approach it in terms of study design or drug development, but it changes it as clinicians in, in, in the reality that we need this. Uh, that, that, to me, is the most important aspect of that type of data. Right. My patients don't stop treatment. <laughs> Ray, if you if you really if you really think that, Ray, you're no, no, smoking no. you're smoking something, brother. Yeah, I, that, there's definitely a selection bias, right? So a patient who stop treatment, they don't come back to see me. So I don't know that they stop. I think that's part of it. Patients who continue to show up, they are on therapy, and we can verify that because they remain undetectable. So um the compliance issue, uh, staying with medical care is a larger issue. Um, by and large, I'd say 90% of patients that I treat start treatment is E-negative patients with relatively low viral load. So I'm not super nervous if they skip treatment for a week or two uh, or something like that and they get back onto it, they will get suppressed. The, the risk of resistance is low. I, I, I have to say, I, I am unsuccessful to take uh, talk to patient on day one that um, I, I recommend you to start treatment. Very rarely patients say, okay, I'll take it for the rest of your life starting today, right? It, it takes uh, uh, at least two visits for me to sort of warm up the conversation, convince the patient this is the right thing to do. And um, I think that I, I'm not saying I'm thinking things perfectly, but uh, getting a buy-in from the patient and have an intellectual level agreement that this is uh, what they need for their health. I think that that helps, but I don't know what the rate at which my patients stop treatment because I, I don't capture that data that effectively. So 70% of hepatitis B care in the US, I think the same probably in Canada and Mexico, although I don't have quite as hard a data. Um, maybe Adam can give us a little bit of a hint there are in primary care and they're being managed in primary care. So where we live, well, I should say where the ivory towers live, it's very different. I'm definitely more in a, I call it a secondary setting. So I'm embedded in three large groups. I'm in a rural clinic and an FQHC. The problem we have in there is I do the same. I feel like my patients are all taking their meds they're coming in for their refills. Um, but I'm gonna say 30% of my patients decide to stop on their own. They come in six months later. Why'd you stop? I don't know. Why are you taking the medication? I don't know. They don't remember the 20 minute discussion I had with them at the first appointment. So I think primary cares are moving at eight minutes a patient. Um, and these patients are also moving. We did a hepatitis C study at the FQHC 
and half of our hep C patients came in antibody positive, RNA positive. We didn't treat them because they disappeared. Mm -hmm. They had moved physically or moved to a different health plan or dropped out of healthcare. And I think this is important back to study design because that's really what this meeting is about is you know drug development. And you just have to realize that people are on relatively short courses of therapy. They're stopping on their own. They're changing. They're losing insurance. Or then they, I call it the tenofovir wars right now. I'm getting all these insurance companies saying, oh, you can't continue TAF because you have to switch them to TDF and then prove that they have bone or renal problems to put them back on TAF. And the patient gets caught up in this uh, cycle of insurance pre-authorizations. Yeah. So, Bob, what, what you're saying, Bob, is completely correct. You know, we're we're in ivory towers. And yes, I, I'm with you as well, Ray, that most of our patients, they're there because they are compliant. They're, they're usually pretty well educated. They want to stay there. Reality is, is exactly what Bob's saying, is that 40% plus of patients and certainly more globally stop. And globally, there are limitations to the duration at which treatment can be given, including in some very major countries like Taiwan, et cetera. So, you know, there, there, there are issues here that really speak to the importance of continuing to strive for functional cure. Because, you know, all of us agree, I think, that loss of surface antigen gives us another layer of security in terms of the prevention of uh, relapse and or complications related to HPV. Fantastic. I'm going to check with our electronics. Is everything stable now? Wow. Multiple thumbs up. Uh, Ray, Nid, any closing comments on your sections where we are right now? No, I, you know, my, my, my one comment is, is always the same. The complexity of knowing when to stop is very, very difficult. And the complexity of the patient populations entering is very, very difficult. And I think that what we need is, is to try to rationalize for different drugs when to make the choices of, of, of when to stop. And of course, I'm, a, an, I'm an enormous believer in generating data. So in other words, looking at immune responses at the time of stopping, in other words, looking at virological responses at the time of stopping and trying to create something. Look, we are trying to do what we did for HCV in HBV. And in HBV, it took us a long time to figure out when to stop treatment and what was the right duration of treatment. And these are complex questions. And all of our trials as we develop them need to ask those specific questions. Right. The patient engagement is very important to me and um, talking to patient and give them the information that they, they can buy in and uh, decide on their own and uh, doing the best to, to help them to do so. I think that's very important. And in patients who um, who says this, doc, whatever you decide, um, I will follow. You know, I really think like, what if what if this was my uh, family member? What do I do? And really relating that to the patient seems to work for me. But it's a difficult question. Uh, we're talking about uh, patient stopping treatment versus long term treatment and physician initiating uh, th that discussion for stopping. So multiple moving factors, I think getting, in the, getting the patient engaged is the, uh, the least we can do. Quick yes, no answer for both of you, Ray, first. Are you checking quant S now at least annually on all your patients as well as baseline? It depends on the level. So I, I, our patients, 220, I would check definitely uh, annually, but most of my patients I find between two and three thousand, they don't go down that quickly. So I, I would give them two, three years before I check the next. Nid, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. We're going to move on to part two of part two. <laughs> All right. thank, you. thank you, Nid. Have thank a good weekend. You. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Guo is a close colleague of mine who works in uh, Doylestown uh, through the Hepatitis B Foundation and the Bloomberg Institute a super expert both in CCC DNA and HBV DNA integration. We've already gone to a little bit of this level earlier today, but I think we're going to develop this uh, more. And what about endpoints, new assays, uh, about both phase two and phase three studies? Dr. Guo, take it away. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to share with you the recent findings in HBV DNA integration research 
and discuss the potential impacts on the antiviral therapy and the new therapeutic developments. This is uh, uh, my uh, disclosure. Upon infection of hepatocytes, HPV genomic DNA is transported into uh, nuclear to convert into uh, CCC DNA, which serve as a transcription template to produce all the viral RNA to support translation of viral protein, as well as reverse transcriptional replication of HBV DNA and progeny viral production. In addition to CCC DNA, uh, HBV DNA occasionally also integrates into host chromosomal DNA. How could this occur? This is uh, because during the HBV DNA replication, the two forms of HBV genome was produced. In 95% of the chance, it's resulting in a circular, relaxed circular DNA genome. In 5% chance, it's produced a, a double-stranded linear uh, DNA genome. Mechanistically, Upon the uh, reverse transcription of the uh, pgRNA into minus strand uh, uh, DNA, the five prime terminals of the pgRNA, the about 18 uh, nucleotides, this short RNA will be translocated into the uh, DR2 region of the minus strand DNA to prom pro uh, primes the uh, uh, plus strand DNA synthesis. After template switch, the genome was circularized and the further elongation of this uh, plus strand DNA results in the uh, RC DNA. However, in 5% in chance, this RNA oligo will not translocate and primes the uh, uh, plus strand DNA in situ that results in a double-strand linear DNA. While this RC DNA can be faithfully repaired into a CCC DNA to support HBV replication, the double-strand linear DNA have two uh, potential destinations. One is uh, circularized into a CCC molecule. However, Distinct from this authentic CCC DNA, the double strand linear uh, DNA derived CCC DNA usually have the uh, insertions or deletions in the uh, junction region due to the uh, end processing uh, through the NHEJ DNA repair uh, pathway. In addition, double strand linear DNA can also integrate randomly into host chromosome at the double strand break uh, points. Therefore, the factors that can cause host cellular DNA damage, particularly double strand DNA break, can promote HBV DNA integration. As expected, molecular analysis shown that integrated DNA, the viral DNA, uh, uh, breakpoints is clustered between the uh, nucleosides 1600 to 2000, this region. That was exactly the uh, terminal region of the uh, double-strand uh, linear DNA. This molecular analysis uh, further validates that uh, uh, double-strand linear DNA is a primary precursor of uh, integrated DNA. Because uh, uh, integrated DNA lose the upstream uh, core promoter and uh, enhancer too, so they cannot transcribe pgRNA, therefore cannot support uh, viral DNA replication. However, they do have the functional trans uh, transcription cis element to uh, initiate transcription from the uh, pre uh, uh, PS1 and uh, S promoter and also X promoter. However, due to the loss of the downstream transcription uh, uh, termination uh, uh, signal, 
So the viral host Comerica RNA will be produced. And those RNA will able to uh, support the translation of the L, M, and S surface antigen, as well as uh, X protein with C terminal truncation or mutation. Therefore, the integrated uh, DNA that may play an important role in viral pathogenesis in many aspects. Then I will uh, briefly introduce the method for detection of integrated DNA and uh, the time, uh, the time and the frequency of the. HPV DNA integration in the natural history of its infection, and their roles in viral pathogenesis and implications in antiviral therapy and the development of the new therapeutics for functional cure of chronic hepatitis B. HPV DNA integration into host cell chromosome was first discovered in 1980. Uh, by Solon Bloch's uh, analysis of the HCC uh, uh, DNA. However, those methods with lower sensitivity and cannot uh, detect HPV DNA integration in no cancer cells. Currently, there are uh, three methods was used. The first one is called uh, inverse PCR. This method was invented by Dr. Mason in about two, uh, 20 years ago. This method is actually very sensitive and can detect uh, uh, one copy of the integrated DNA uh, in about 10,000 cells. And uh, currently, most popular methods for a high throughput identification of the integrated DNA is through the capture in which the next generation DNA sequence or RNA sequence. And uh, the study uh, thus far clearly indicates that integrated HPV DNA can be detected within a few days post HPV infection of cultured hypothesis and can be detected in acute. HPV infection or also clinical phase of a chronic HPV infection. Generally, the longer the HPV infection, uh, the higher of the uh, fre uh, frequency of the integrated DNA can be uh, detected in the infected liver. For example, it's about one after uh, 10,000 hepatocytes have one integrated DNA in the acute hepatitis. But since uh, uh, immunotolerant phase or HPV positive uh, HPV infection phase, the chronic phase, is about one out of 1,000 hepatocytes have an uh, integrated uh, copy of the DNA. In the HPV uh, E-adjun negative phase of chronic infection, the integrated uh, uh, frequency is increased to about uh, one. Uh, up to 100 hypothesis. And it's also important to notice that integrated DNA can persist it after the resolution of acute HPV infection and HPV surface edging serial clearance of the chronic HPV infection. The liver uh, is uh, uh, the size is maintained by hypothesis self renewal or called uh, hypothesized turnover. And the integrated HPV DNA can serve as a hypothesized lineage marker to track the uh, you know, uh, hypothesized clonal uh, uh, expansion or proliferation during the uh, chronic HPV infection. Dr. Mason used this method and found that even in the uh, so-called uh, immunotolerant phase, significant clonal expansion of hypothesis uh, is actually occur. This finding indicates that in this immunotolerant phase, that uh, significant HPV infected hypothesis killing may occur. 
Concerning the uh, distribution of the HPV uh, integrated HPV uh, in the H, uh, in the host chromosome, thus far, no uh, integration uh, hotspots have been identified in the uh, no cancer uh, uh, tissues. However, recurrent recurrent HPV DNA integration region can be identified in tumor tissues. The most common recurrent HPV integration occurs in a group of genes with oncogenic or tumor suppressive functions, such as TERTs, ML, L4, and the CCNE1. Those region, uh, HPV integration around these regions can account about one third uh, of the HPV, uh, uh, HCC tissue. Exact. Mechanistically, HPV DNA integration can promote HCC carcinogenesis uh, through insertion activation of tumor promoted gene genes or insertion inactivation of the tumor suppressor genes. It may also through expression of the virus viral uh, oncoproteins and uh, induce of the chromosome uh, instability. The integrated uh, uh, DNA as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, for a long time, you know, despite the uh, people know that HPV DNA integrates into hepatocytes, however, it's always considered that only a small fraction of hepatocytes have the integrated DNA, despite this one, uh, integrated DNA have a potential to uh, express surface antigen. It may never contribute significantly to the surface antigen in the circulation. However, this opinion has been changed because the studies of the sRNA therapy in uh, chimpanzees and chronic HPV infected patients. And the finding is that the sRNA targeting X region can efficiently reduce surface antigen production from RNA transcriptional CCC DNA, but not from the uh, integrated DNA due to the lack of target sequence. Another significant study uh, shown that uh, integrated DNA supports the widespread surface antigen production in the livers of the e antigen negative patients with high level of surface antigen and the low virus load. The significant hypothesis uh, clonal expansion in the immunotolerance phase of chronic HPV infection clearly indicates that the immunotolerance phase is not pathologically dormant. Although the killing of the HPV infected cells does not result in LT elevation at this phase, significant hepatocyte turnover looks does, uh, does occur. Therefore, antiviral therapy should thus be started before the immunoactive uh, immune phase to reduce uh, liver damage and the expansion of the potential precursors uh, hepatocytes. Moreover, uh, recent studies show that Long-term nuke therapy can significantly reduce the frequency of the integrated DNA and reduce the uh, hepatocytes clonal size. As shown here, after 10 years of the uh, uh, tonophilus therapy, the uh, integrated frequency can be reduced by 90 uh, uh, folds, and the uh, hepatocyte clonal size can be reduced by uh, uh, by about uh, Tenfold. The findings that the vast majority of the surface antigen are produced from RNA transcript from uh, integrated DNA, particularly in E antigen negative patients, question the utility of surface antigen as a surrogate marker for the functional cure of chronic hepatitis B. Although long-term antiviral uh, therapy significantly reduced the frequency of the integrated DNA in the liver, uh, for the subpopulation of the uh, chronic hepatitis B patient with widespread integrated 
derived in direct DNA derived self-set expression. So repeated inactivation of the uh, integrated DNA is most likely required for the functional cure. I will stop here and uh, we'll take questions in the panel discussion. Thank you. All right, that raises a lot of questions. We'll talk about it at the panel. And Adam, we're gonna have you come back up for this FNA liver biopsy in drug development. And I think this does fold into this integrant CCT DNA concept as well. So welcome. Thanks again for that four hour round. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thanks again for the introduction. Uh, Bob, yeah, this was the, the topic I think it was originally given. I'm not gonna read the whole title because I'll run out of time. But we'll get into some of these questions, I think, in the discussion is where I left most of it. What I really wanted to do is give my experience is what we've done. And I will say that my experience is heavily biased towards the FNA approach. We haven't done a whole lot of core liver biopsies in the lab. We're just starting to do some spatial work with them now. And I think that's where it's going to be particularly um, useful. So I just want to jump into it. My disclosure is the same as before. They're up there. Um, I just want to jump into it because I put this slide up because it's a nice overview for what a fine needle aspirate is. Because you know, we, you, you probably heard me or many of you might've heard me talk about this all the time. And we, we say that it's useful because you can do regular sampling. And if you look at the sizes of the needle there, the FNA needle is a 25 gauge spinal needle. And when you think about blood draw, you use a 21 gauge needle for a blood draw. So it's much, much smaller than even a blood draw needle and a lot smaller than what you would use 16 to 18 gauge for a core biopsy. And so that does pose a much lower risk for the patients, it's very minimal bleeding, very minimal pain, especially if you freeze the skin and the liver capsule with lidocaine or anesthetic before doing the FNA, which is the standard procedure in our unit. Um, and you can do the sampling frequency. We can do it usually, uh, we've done it as early as uh, two weeks, two to three weeks in between intervals of sampling. So it gives you the real opportunity to get dynamic changes. It does come with caveats though. I mean, the access in the small needle, you get variable size or variable number of cells out, you know, you get blood content. And I'll go through some of this in a little bit. The parenchymal cells are less collected. They don't maybe not under, undergo the shear stress of the aspiration as much. And you don't get an architecture because it comes out as a, a cell suspension. I will say, I, I've always put this picture up, but now I actually have a video. So if anybody's squeamish about needles, you may not want to watch in the next video. And I thought I'd just give everybody an idea of what it looks like. I mean, you can see the needle is almost so small that you can you barely see it. And this is uh, one of the passes that we do. And we routinely do four passes uh, for each patient that comes in at each time point. And there is audio that comes along with this, but um, this is an instructional video that we produced that is uh, part of a paper that was just accepted at hepatology. And here's the aspiration. So there's negative pressure on the syringe. It goes in, you leave the, aspirate, the, the negative pressure, and that's it. So that is undergone four times, and I can attest to that it's minimal pain because that's me, and I've undergone the procedure twice. So, you know, to understand what the patients go through, I thought it was important, and also just to kind of highlight the, uh, how safe it actually is. So when I talk about the blood content that comes out in these, you can see these are four different passes from a study or from a, from a sample that we've collected, and each of them have a different degree of red. And what we've done is establish like a, an OD value. So you just use spectroscopy. You take a small aliquot, you put it in the spectrophotometer, you read the OD 450. And the more red the sample gets, the more it looks like whole blood. And so this is the first figure here is looking at the CD4, CD8 ratio. In the liver, you get more CD8 T cells than you do CD4. And as your OD goes up, that CD4, excuse me, frequency goes down and starts to look like what it does in the whole blood. If we can get more sophisticated about this, you can do looking at naive cells for CD4 and CD8 with the OD450 along the x-axis, the higher the OD gets, the more naive cells you get. So, and then the far right under the B is where the whole blood is. The idea was to use the OD to give an approximate quantification of how much red blood cells or how much peripheral blood might be in these aspirates. Uh, you can't use it as a cutoff because you can't ethically not use the patient sample if you're going to enroll them in the study. It just gives you a metric to measure for the clinical study, and that way you know what to look at. Um, and this, sorry, this is the, the paper, too. You'll be able to find that video. It should be out in hepatology ahead of print online soon. 
So one of the ways that we've really looked into studying these fine needle aspirates is single cell RNA sequencing. And I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of details here, but we really wanted to take a holistic approach initially because it's really the first opportunity to do so in a dynamic way using longitudinal and serial time points. And one of the major advantages, obviously, of epinase is you're getting liver tissue or liver cells. And I just want to spend the next few slides of showing what the advantages of FNAs are when we think about employing them in clinical studies. And macrophages, first, to start with, I mean, these cells live in tissues, right? They're not there in the blood. And this is just single cell RNA sequencing data from one of our patients where we have matched blood and liver FNAs that were done by single cell RNA sequencing. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the single cell RNA sequencing data, each of these different colors represents a cluster of similar cells. And so in this case, looking at macrophages, there's actually five different colors represented. So that means there's five different types of macrophages, quite a bit of heterogeneity. And the only place you can actually find them is where we'd expect them. They're in the liver. They're not in the blood. And this is important because macrophages regulate the environment in the liver. They're going to control the inflammatory environment. They maintain the tolerance. So they really play a central role in facilitating immune responses in the liver and being able to study them is critical. And then we can use the data to really look at individual markers that distinguish each of these individual clusters. So it captures the heterogeneity of the macrophage population in the liver. Now that didn't come out very well, but oh, let's look better up there. Another study that we just recently published was looking at a population. We turned we turn them hepatotoxic CD8 T cells, also called autoaggressive CD8 T cells. And this was a population of CD8 T cells we identified in the FNA single cell RNA sequencing data that could be activated in a bystander fashion to kill hepatocytes in a non-specific manner through fast ligand. And so when we looked at these, hopefully you can see it, but there's a trace in red on the top. And this is a single population, again, of these CD8 T cells, and this is in the liver. But when you look in the blood, these T cells aren't present. So if we didn't have the FNA, we wouldn't know what cells we're looking at. We wouldn't have identified these mechanisms. So in addition to sort of the more fundamental or basic research that we do with the FNAs, you can start to think about biomarkers, right? So you have the peripheral blood, you have the serum of these patients. And this is a study that um, uh, was part of that CD8 T cell paper, but we looked in the plasma and we looked for some of these inflammatory markers that were associated with hepatitis. And so here is baseline week 12 and week 24, and these are patients with active disease that were started on TAF therapy. And so after 12 and 24 weeks, ALT goes down and HVV DNA goes down. But CD163, IL-18, and Collector 9 were significantly elevated at baseline. And so when we took the FNAs, the longitudinal FNAs from these patients, we started to look and see where these transcripts are presented within the liver. And you can see that there's these two clusters of cells right here. And uh, as I was just talking about macrophages, this is where they're localized. So we can then use transcripts to identify individual cells within the FNA where these cytokines and these peripheral biomarkers are coming from. So when you get into mechanism of action, for instance, this becomes quite important, particularly in novel phase two studies, phase one and phase two. So in addition to immune cells, which uh, we're particularly interested in, we can also capture hepatocytes in these FNAs. And you would expect, if you're looking at a biopsy, that the hepatocytes would represent most of the cells. In the liver, obviously, they do. But as I mentioned, they're underrepresented to some extent in the FNA just because of the collection. But we still capture them. And um, this, unfortunately, did not transfer at all. The, the second figure there, I don't know where this one even came from. The second figure was actually a figure that was going to show you where the HPV transcripts were, and they were localized to the hepatocyte cluster. So we could take our single cell data, not only get the immunology out of it, but you could actually identify HPV transcripts within the hepatocyte cluster. And so what we did with the help of some bioinformatics tools in collaboration with Sam Kim is to look and see in our single cell data if we could identify the individual HPV transcripts within these hepatocytes and then see how those transcripts might change as you start TAF therapy. So this is a baseline and we've linearized the hepatitis B genome here across the bottom. And basically what's highlighted is the PGRNA start sites for the HPV transcription. 
And so at baseline, these patients all have active hepatitis. They had relatively high DNA. As you start to have therapy 12 weeks, you still see detectable DNA in the serum. ALT is normalized. But then by 24 weeks, what we start to see is a loss of the, uh, the pgRNA in these patients. And this was consistent across all the patients that we actually had in the study. So that tells us that in addition to the immunology, we can actually get some virology out of this too and even monitor the effects of nucleoside analog therapy. And this observation was actually quite surprising for us because we didn't expect pgRNA to go down. And you can think about using this technology now with the siRNAs and the ASOs and some of these other drugs. You should see everything sort of flatline when, uh, when these drugs are introduced. So where do we use these? Um, some of the study of the data that I didn't present today, we've used these in patients stopping nucleoside analogs where we sampled the liver at baseline and then again at four weeks to try and get immunological data on what's going to predict an ALT flare eight to 10 weeks later. And we've got some evidence and this is actually under review right now. And the, a lot of the data that I showed you from these patients that were starting nucleoside analogs. So these were uh, immune active patients Antigen, some were antigen positive, some negative, but they all had elevated hepatitis. They start their DNA or so started, they start TAF, and then we sampled them at baseline 12 and 24 weeks. We've also done a study now because you can do elective sampling where we sampled each of the different stages, including functional cure patients. And so this is a big data set that's still in the process of analysis. So I don't really have any data to show on this yet. And then we're also involved in a number of studies where you're having novel drug interventions and in either late phase one or early phase two studies. And we're really trying to get the key time points here to understand and provide that translational data as to what's happening in the periphery of these, uh, of these patients during treatment and during follow-up. So I have a few more slides, but on the conclusions here on the FNAs, you know, I, my feeling is that they provide us with critical mechanistic insight and really provide the opportunity for biomarker discovery. And this I think is critically important while we're still trying to define the optimal targets, the optimal regimens and the strategy to go about for hepatitis B cure. And yeah, I think it, it, was, it was clear that when you have these FNAs, you have access to cells that are not accessible in the blood. And this is critically important for hepatitis B, especially in particularly the, in the macrophages that can control the, the liver inflammation. Uh, I think using the data to look at the antiviral effects of therapy is something that we weren't sure we would be able to do. So this was very exciting. So this gives it another dimension of these samples that you can take. And, and we've done it with single RNA sequencing, but we've also done direct qPCR on these FNAs, and you can also get the viral, uh, the viral genomes and the viral transcripts out just by using straight PCR that's not nearly as expensive as single cell data. So when and how to use the FNAs, I mean, this is the question, right? And so I think we've done enough of these now, I have a pretty good experience and a good feeling for where this should be used. And what I've noticed is that when you get too early on in the development schedule, you don't know the dosing, you don't know the frequency, you get too much variability to, to go in and, and ask the patients to give an FNA. So I think they're best used when in the drug development process, when you know your timing, you know your dosing. And in that case, because you go in, if you want to use single cell data, you can do 10 or 15 patients and get an enormous amount of data out of this. So now immunology, potentially some virology. And it's really important it's very helpful to know the inflection points of the of the treatment cascade, right? So if you're seeing a, sort of a consistent window for flare or a DNA decline, because if you just sample inactive carriers at different times, they all look the same and you really don't get a whole lot because it's just, there's nothing really changing there. So it's key to kind of know your inflection points and that provides the most meaningful, meaningful data. And you know, it's, it, even though I said it's painless, there's a limit to patient tolerance, right? So nobody likes to be stuck in the, in, in the liver with a needle. And most patients, when you ask them for an FNA, they think biopsy because a lot of them had a biopsy in the past and they think it's going to be painful. So it's hard to get them enrolled, but then oftentimes we're quite good at maintaining them in the studies. We have very few dropouts and our feeling is about three FNAs is about the max you can get out of uh, for, for a consent that's, that's tolerable for a study. But there are limitations, and I mentioned these, right? So we still need further validation of the, of the virology. What I showed is more of a proof of concept study than sort of what, what I think should be going forward. I think it can be optimized. 
I've been told by uh, Fabian Zalim and Massimo Lebro that we can actually detect CCC DNA in some of these FNAs if you're doing drop to digital PCR. So we, we do need to do more work on see how much the virology is going to be representative um, from what you can get out of a core biopsy where a lot more hepatocytes are going to be present. Because as I mentioned, the hepatocyte capture is relatively low. And unfortunately, we don't get spatial information, which is really important to know cell-cell interactions within the liver. And that's really where the biopsies, I think, come in. The technology, just like the single cell RNA sequencing for biopsies, is also seeing huge leaps forward. I mean, there's studies now published on imaging mass cytometry, looking at 30, 35 different markers in a biopsy simultaneously or high-parameter immunofluorescence. On top of this, there's multiple technologies for spatial transcriptomics where you can do protein analysis at the same time. So you can get multiple layers of information out of a single biopsy. And then, of course, you know, laser capture microdissection has been used and published to look at transcriptional activity of different HPV and more recently looking at the, in, the integrated derived transcripts. And I think this is kind of coming to the idea of being able to distinguish between integrated S and, and CCC and S produced from CCC DNA. And we, we kind of approached this, we had a biomarker paper that was published as part of the HBB forum just this past year, and we tried to approach this idea of biopsy, and ideally, you know, you want one at baseline at the end of therapy, but the ultimate recommendation is because of the frequency, and usually patients aren't keen to have them, if you could at least get one at the end of therapy, because you're going to have inclusion-exclusion criteria, which are going to homogenize the patients at the beginning, what you want to know is at the end, these patients that achieved cure, these patients that didn't, how do they do, how do they look different? So, the, you know, if you can collect them, it's best to try and collect them at the end. So I did produce, uh, I shared a lot of data from my, from my lab here. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, Sheeran, uh, Juan, and uh, Conan, who did most of the single cell analysis that I showed today. Thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions in the discussion. All right, so um, I would say three to four years ago, Adam, everybody I talked to said FNAs aren't working, they're not going anywhere, don't, don't do them, don't think about them in studies. I was on a recent ad board with MF in Boston, as you recall, we were talking about whether to do biopsies in a phase 1B or 1B 2A study, and the, the room was split. Some people said, oh yeah, biopsy, or yes, FNA, and others said, don't do anything. So I think the jury's a little bit out. How can we convince people? And you're probably the best messenger, but maybe a little powerful statement. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I actually had another conclusion slide. I was talking to Andrea. I think it got it got mixed up. But you know, your question. Actually, can you hit it? Maybe that was up there. No, the advance it one more. Is it up there? Nope. Okay. You know, because one of the questions was how we're going to use these in, in clinical, in clinical studies. And is it, can we do them in all studies? I mean, it's not practical in an ideal world. Yes. It'd be nice to do, but it's impractical to do them in all studies. And so I think, you know, in thinking about where we've been successful in understanding what's happening, I kind of already highlighted it out to some extent, but at least having one sub study in a phase two like it's like early on, because this data can then be used to support any any filing later after phase three, right? So I think you know, doing one good study in phase two, it would probably be sufficient for most of the drugs. So you don't have to think about doing it all the time because it becomes impractical and it's it is difficult to enroll. What about phase one B? I mean, those are entry yeah. points. You get signals there. That's usually ten to twenty patients. Yeah, it, and we are doing some phase one B work uh, again. You know. But you want to you want your phase one B to have the ideally have the dosing and timing you're going to move with for phase two, right? So if you if you're going to use a different dose and timing for phase one and collect the FNAs and all the data, it may not tell you as much about the schedule in phase two. It is dose selection and safety, mm -hmm. and FNAs may not or biopsies may not help you much with that. Well, and then our experience in doing the FNAs in phase one is patients are already hesitant because it's phase one. Right. So they're, they're savvy, right? They know what they're talking about. And, and they come in and phase one is, eh, and then you ask them to do three FNAs. So are you using Versed and fentanyl with your FNAs? What? Do you give any sedation? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's just, it's just local anesthetic, right? It's actually the, the only point that is that it's around the skin, 
when they do it because once you get to liver capsule you can't feel anything it's uh, it's a it's a it's an odd feeling but it's not painful and i've done over 7,000 liver biopsies every biopsy is always had versed and fentanyl and they're always willing to come back because they don't remember anything in fact they felt good <laughs> naoki yes bob uh, very impressive uh, from dr gross presentations it sounds like you want to prevent integrations therefore the final uh, prevention of liver cancer can be you know achieved so i wonder about all my clinician friends or colleagues do they do you then believe we should treat every dna right from the get-go i don't know how early you will say teenagers because the longer the integration happens the likelihood of cancer is so did I convince you uh, from Dr. Gore's presentation? And Dr. I, uh, I'd like to address that, tag on to that. Sure. This is exactly the point I wanted to bring up. I've been treating with tolerant patients for many years. I can't claim anything more than clinician's intuition that it has to be a bad thing for a young person to have all that replicating virus. Now that this information has come out, and I think you're, you've got exactly the same thoughts that I do. A question really for Dr. Grohl, but also you, uh, Bob, as president or, or uh, chair of the Hepatitis Foundation. Um, you know, you've got the Dr. Grohl's and Patrick Kennedy and Bill Mason and people like that who've done this work showing uh, the prevalence of these integrations. And they're talking to the world looking forward. And you've got the guidelines people sitting down with each other and talking to each other or talking to other people. But it seems to me the two parties aren't talking to each other. There's nobody who espouses this position who seems to be on the guidelines panel, or perhaps there are, and I don't know about it. Mm. What I do know is that the guidelines keep coming out in one rendition after another. ESOL has budged. They now say above 30. If you have a high level of iremia, it doesn't matter what the ALT is. But even 30 seems very arbitrary to me. So how do we get the parties talking to each other and maybe come to an agreement on this very important issue? Dr. Guo, do you have an answer? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer, but I do have some opinion. <laughs> so uh, first, I state that I'm not a, a, a physician, so I have never treated any patient. <laughs> so, but uh, I uh, uh, am a, a pure virologist. So from the uh, virologist uh, standpoint of view, so that, uh, yes, the integration that indeed occur quite early, and you, once the uh, uh, infection pers uh, persists longer, you will accumulate uh, more integration. So that integration indeed contribute to the HCC uh, development. Because about 90% of the HCC do have a, uh, you know, HPV integration. So theoretically, you treat as early as possible to uh, prevent the inhibit viral replication because up to inhibit viral replication, the double-stranded linear DNA were not produced. So you will, you will uh, prevent further integration, right? So that will be uh, good for prevent the liver cancer uh, to occur. So that is thoroughly from the virology standpoint of view. But you, you know, in the uh, clinical practice, you guys may uh, consider much more other, uh, you know, uh, factors into the, you know, the final decision of the treatment uh, guidelines. Say one thing, invite other comments on this. I don't know how as a clinician listening to a virologist like you and learning about this, I can withhold this information and the fact that there's even a controversy or discussion about this from my patients. Mm. And yet I think that's what's going on because I hear clinician after clinician to whom I speak, people who aren't deeply involved in this, who say, nope, we don't treat immunotolerant patients or high level viremia patients if they don't meet ALT criteria because the guidelines say not to. So now I'll leave it to others to comment. Indeed. Another sort of a piece of data that I think is important. Um, there was a recent JCI paper where um, they correlated HPV DNA levels with uh, liver cancer risk. And the, the picture that we carry in our mind is it's a revealed data that uh, it, as the DNA goes up, the cancer risk goes up. But if you go 
uh, remember, reveal data is mostly E negative patients, relatively low viral load. So if you go to the really high viral load, the risk goes down actually. And, and that, that trends um, and is, is seen in, in reveal as well. And the point is um, the really high viral load patients, they're young patients, right? Um, and, and, and not into the phase where the, the immune reaction occurs and, and perhaps the clonal uh, expansion um, started to occur. Um, it's, it's only, it's when the, the viral load starts to decrease, that's when the cancer risk start to go up. So the idea is if you can let our patients bypass that period, the phase and start from very high level and zoom them down to a low level, then can we entirely reduce that peak that occurs um, that without knowing uh, the patient knowing or us knowing that 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 is the patient is going through the phase? So I think that's a, a provocative data that um, may change our practice. But again, we agree with you, Ira, that there is a disconnect that these um, data that really has no hope of trend being translated into clinically sort of evidence-based information to reduce the risk. How do you, a, a rationally thinking person, translate that information into actionable guideline? That's, that's a challenge. I think Paul has a question, but I was gonna get MF to comment too, because there's data from Hong Kong about viral suppression on tenofovir and decreasing integrant activity and number of integrants, right? Dr. Shu, I think is at least one of the two, but Paul, you wanna go first? Yeah, so thanks so much. And I really enjoyed Dr. Guo's uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, as we get better assays to you know, quantify integration, uh, do you think we will be changing some of the endpoints of our trials? Meaning that, you know, um, if we can, you know, get rid of transcriptionally active CCC DNA, but more problematic maybe to get rid of integrated DNA, do we need to be thinking about different endpoints for these different groups? No, I uh, don't think so. That's uh, consider that the currently uh, do have uh, a fractional patients on the uh, nuke and all nuke uh, uh, interference therapy. They do uh, achieve the functional cure. And, uh, you know, those person, I believe they all have the integrated DNA there. So I think, you know, the, uh, the hypothesis have the integrated DNA that's also on the immune selection. So that's, uh, you know, if they express self savaging and uh, if there's the active immune response can uh, respond to uh, surface allergy epitope, those hypothesis can finally be eliminated. Of course, just like, uh, 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 you know, in, uh, uh, observed in, uh, uh, previously in the animal models, you know, uh, after, even after the uh, infection resolved, that you may still able to detect the integrated DNA, but this integrated DNA mostly is, uh, you know, uh, transcription inactive, or they not express the uh, viral protein. So I think, you know, uh, in, in this standard point, I, I don't think that uh, the end point should change. However, from the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, last year that's published in uh, Journal of Hepatology by uh, Stephen Weiland, that paper actually showing a small fraction of patients that the integrated uh, rate seems extremely high and, uh, you know, support widespread hypothesis express surface antigen from the integrated copy. For those small fraction of the patients, you may indeed need, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, gene editing or whatever technology to uh, directly target the integrated copy. Um, Over to you. Thank you for asking me to make a comment. In fact, I, I completely agree with Iowa. that we, are, we should think about treating patients with immune tolerance phase uh, just, just to decrease the integrants. And the study that um, Dr. Gao has already presented, we actually monitor patients with long-term looks, and then we find that the integration decreases, mm -hmm. as well as the hepatose, I mean, hepatocyclonal expansion. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, I mean, direct evidence that we should consider treating patients even 
with the immune tolerance phase. But then people will ask, how long should we treat then? Because these patients, they, they, once you start the treatment, there, there's no endpoint now. Uh, you, you, you suggest the patient to take the drug for, at the age of 20, 30, then they, he, he, he or she may think of, say, I need to take the drug for 50 years or, or 60 years. So that, that comes in with the importance of how we, I mean, we should sweep up uh, the, the, or we should target um, functional cure. Because in, in fact, when we, when we look at those patients who have spontaneous S loss, we also measure the integration. Compare their integration slow, the burden in the liver is significantly lower than D negative patients, D positive patients, and e immunotrans patients. So if we have medication or drugs that can shorten the treatment duration by achieving functional cure, then these young patients at the age of 20, they have some foreseeable um, uh, uh, duration of taking, I mean, long-term, I mean, treatment, achieving functional cure, and then that's it. And then that will prevent significantly the, the burden, I mean, the increase in the integration due to lifelong, I mean, infection. I think it's very important to give our patients this hope we talked about earlier, never use lifelong, never use indefinite. We have all these drugs coming. So my dialogue with my patients, and I, I'm not giving them an exact number. I, I used to like Greg, it was like seven years or nine years. I say in the near future, we're going to have many new therapeutic options with finite therapy. Let's treat you now. I'm treating everybody who's DNA positive. And you could see the Chinese guidelines that came out in the last week. And then Dietrich called the Saba guidelines came out. And you're almost going to treat everybody. Um, we have a work group from Hepatitis B Foundation we worked on last fall also that's really moving towards treating everybody. We've got to make this simple. The guidelines are a barrier to access drugs. The insurance companies use those to block us. And also they're confusing. And there's all these people in the gray zone. HIV, we treat everybody. Hepatitis C, we treat everybody. Hepatitis B, we have at least five reasons to treat everybody who's replicating. I think the guidelines need to catch up with reality because the guidelines have been out for 20 years and the death rate hasn't changed. So the guidelines aren't really doing anything for global hepatitis B health. And it's this type of integrant message that I think carries this, you know, what Ira was talking about. This is something we can carry forward to our patients. And I believe it's going to decrease cancer risk. I, I, I believe the data is there. Great. So um, when I talk to my patients about uh, treatment duration, um, I tell patients who are younger than me, who is most everybody, that in your lifetime, there will be there will be a, a way to stop that's a uh, good treatment. And that seems to do the trick. Um, I, I have a question to Dr. Um, I noticed that um, measuring integrant DNA was not part of the menu. You saved it until the core biopsy at the last slide. So is that intentional? And if we can measure integrant DNA from the FNA, is that, is it can that be representative of the whole liver and, and core biopsy obviously is it yeah so i won't say that it, it it may very well be possible it's not something that we've tried to do as i as i mentioned right so you we know that we can piece you can take the fna and just extract the rna and qpcr for hpv transcripts right from the five prime or the three prime and so presumably you're going to be able to detect some integrants in there as well it's just not something that we've tested and i think it's complicated because most of the single cell rna sequencing work because of the technology makes it harder for them to pick up because if you have a chimeric gene at the end you know you're you're into your gene is human and then the, the top of the gene is HPV. When the sequencing only reads 100 base pairs into the human gene, you may not see these chimeric sequences to some extent. So I think it's possible. It just hasn't been tested yet because we can see the transcripts. I don't know why we would be able to see the integrants. Neoki. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I kind of opened up the hornet's nest that <laughs> put, uh, put uh, Dr. King in the hot spot. But I, I, my, my feeling is that it's very important information, but the information that is lacking is that integration by itself, can they promote carcinogenesis by itself without other 
factors because we don't we do know that everybody who have hepatitis B will never get treated and get uh, control or functional control does not get into cancer. It's not 100% patient get cancer. So I wonder if there must be something in between, such as information or uh, other factors may contribute to the uh, carcinogenesis. And that might fit into your argument that, that when we look at the review study, that, that the high level viral, uh, viral uh, population is immune tolerant, and maybe there is some uh, patient may not develop cancer because they kind of drop after that high level uh, of the DNA correlating with liver cancer. So that's kind of the what you call schizophrenia that I have uh, regarding this issue. So uh, I just want to make that point that uh, for your uh, thinking about your difficulty about endorsing, you know, that completely 100%. Right. So this is obviously uh, observational data. And what was intriguing with the data is that, you know, we, we think about uh, very high viral load patients, immune tolerant E positive patients, but the same trend is seen in E negative patients. There are not as many people in that extreme, but very high DNA level E negative patients, their cancer risk was also lower than people in the middle, like 10 to the six um, at that level. So. I don't quite, no one at this point, this is an initial observation. We, we don't quite know what, what the biological underpinning of that observation is, but one partial application is what I stated that for young E positive patients, if we can let them avoid that natural history of going through the struggle of, of uh, immune activation and, and DNA reduction, that might be helpful, but no one has empirical data that it works. Ray, when you compare those two populations, the high and the intermediate patient viral levels, mm -hmm. you have to correct for histology. So maybe the patients in the middle of the range for HPV DNA have more liver disease? Um, so the, the analysis was done taking into account ALT. So uh, histology, they didn't have, but ALT. Should, should repeat that study with fiber scans. <laughs> I think we're near a wrap and time for um, beverages and food. If everybody's okay. Any final comments, Ira? Do you want to wrap up the session? This was wonderful. That's all I have to say. It's getting late, and I think people have plans. But I, if I had a beautiful summation prepared, I would be happy to give it. But uh, Adam, thank you for coming. Ray, wonderful talk. Well, with Dr. Gro, I've heard you once before, and it's a revelation listening to you. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, mean, I just uh, uh, added a, a, a few sentences about uh, the uh, integration uh, related with HCC. So for you, uh, for in human HCC, that integration seems appear uh, do play a role, but not a solely factor. And uh, that's uh, you know, uh, as a virologist, I have previous studies of woodchuck hepatitis, so that's virus. So because their integration is generally integrated into one single gene called uh, NMIC. So that is uh, uh, WHV is one of the most oncogenic virus I can recognize. After one year of the infection is about 30%, two years, 60%, after three years, almost 100% have uh, HCC due to that uh, integration into the NMIC. Of course, uh, uh, HBV is so much, um, much more friendly. So I think, you know, that was uh, randomly integrated and uh, just uh, hit on the certain genes that make a contribution, uh, you know, so that's that's uh, uh, good luck. And also on the uh, detection of the integrates. So I think, you know, uh, uh, the random that uh, assay you know, uh, the uh, FNA uh, assay, I, I think that was uh, very interesting. And also in uh, our institute, Bloomberg Institute at the uh, Hepatitis B Foundation, we have a lab that actually does a liquid biopsy. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we try to uh, measure the integrated DNA from the urine samples or from the, you know, blood samples, because that's actually sampling whole liver. So I think, you know, if successful, this assay could be pretty useful. 
Thank you. So Bob, my last comment is we have to get Dr. Guo and others like him in front of more clinical audiences, big audiences too. Mm -hmm. Please it. fuel the discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, good morning, everybody. We have a lot of people online, so we're going to start on time, even though we're still waking up here in sunny Southern California with no weather. It's fantastic outside, although still freezing cold. Uh, welcome to day two of the HBV HDV Act. I uh, here, my wonderful partner, helping collaborate on this. Brain power starting a year ago to set this up, and we really felt there's so many hot subjects, topics going on in Delta. This had to be a key part. We decided to cluster these uh, presentations uh, together with some fantastic uh, virtual presentations. And I've got a few housekeeping uh, items here with, with our wonderful pictures when we're 10 years younger. So that's a really good start. And we really want to thank all our faculty. The meeting yesterday was just absolutely outstanding, world class, and really super happy with the interaction with the audience as well. Uh, our agenda today is listed here. You all have this in writing. The only thing that's changed is Dr. Gordian's going to go first. He's in France. His wife had an accident with an arm fracture. There's been a lot of juggling at times and schedules. So we thought we'd let him go first, give him some flexibility on time. He's got a very robust uh, presentation. The rest of the items are here, including a break and a panel discussion, and then closing remarks. So I'll wrap that up. We want to thank Gilead Sciences for their wonderful support that's here. Also, all the supporters, including Iger, of the global meeting help support our HBV, HDV Act. So we really want to give recognition to all the supporters of this wonderful meeting. And the learning objectives you heard about yesterday, those are unchanged. And we really want to talk about drug development as well as clinical practice. We have accreditation statement and it's here. Disclosure documents listed, how to claim CME credit, use the QR code with tips on claiming credit highlighted here. They walk you through that if you're online as well as the people in person. We're gonna go back to our first presentation. Dr. Gordian's based in Paris. He's a, I call him a viral immunologist, but his virology in the hepatitis B and Delta space is global. You're gonna hear about a number of his accomplishments in a few moments. He's a person that I turn to for acquiring samples for Delta hepatitis. Uh, he was a key person in standardizing Delta assays in terms of performance characteristics. So I think this is also uh, really a major addition. You're going to hear about that data shortly. Emmanuel, bonjour, bonsoir. Are you there? Yes, I am there. Welcome to our team. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I am very honored to be there to participate in this uh, in this meeting. Well, I, I want first to 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 really uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and the efforts you made in this uh, let's say a little bit difficult period for me. Do you see? You will see my slide. Is okay for you? Yes. Right. Okay. So I want first to okay. Here are my disclosures, okay? So the, the, the first question we have to keep in mind, all of us, is that HDV is responsible for the more severe viral hepatitis. So I would like to, to, to thank my, my, my colleagues in the French National Reference Laboratory for Hepatitis Delta, and mainly Ségolène Bouchelet who will replace me in a few months at the head of this lab. So, uh, Okay, HDV infection occurs only in patients infected with HBV, I insist only. And you can understand this very easily on this slide, the next slide. Uh, we show you the, the, the viral particles. You can see here the, the, the DN particle, HBV infectious in BV particles, and a large excess of empty envelope are secreted, which are used by the delta to envelope its ribonucleoprotein composed of his genomic RNA and two protein, the small hepatitis delta antigen, P24, it's uh, according to his uh, molecular weight, and the large hepatitis delta antigen, P27. And then, next, 
HDV is a satellite of HBV. So let's just see in more detail the molecular biology of HDV. Next. So the genome. The genome is a RNA genome, a negative single-stranded, very small genome with a characteristic, next, of about 60% of GC bases in its sequence that uh, implies that, uh, and then this, uh, this genome uh, is have a self apparent about 70% of, 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 of its size. And we describe on this genome a promoter region. Next. And then the ribosome region, which is very important, and it's able to self cleavage and self ligate. And it is very important for the next, for the double rolling circle mechanism of replication of this uh, genome. Next. So the double rolling circle replication mechanism is next, is performed by how RNA polymerase two and maybe one and three. And this is a rolling circle around this, uh, this, uh, this circular, pseudocircular genome, and then give a long multimeric anti-sense uh, genomic uh, 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 RNA which is cut next by the ribozyme and ligate to form the antigenomic RNA, which is an intermediate of application. This antigenomic RNA is itself, uh, again, by the RNA polymerase two, only the two this time, to perform the same uh, 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 rolling circle to give a long, uh, anti a long sense genomic RNA, which is cut and then form the new genomic RNA next, which will be used for forming the new HVV particles. So in the same uh, 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 moment, you have also an rRNA, which is uh, produced to, 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 to form the, the, okay, thank you very much. Then you have the genome, you have the antigenome, and you have only one open within frame next, which is situated on the antigenome. And you can see here this open within frame and one open within frame, but you have one mRNA, which is next, permits the synthesis of the small delta antigen, but you have two protein next, and the large protein is produced after a mechanism of editing, which occurs on the antigenome, and it is uh, mediated by an host enzyme, which is an adenosine deaminase associated to double-stranded RNA. We replace the stop codon here in a tryptophan codon, and this lead to the formation of the large delta antigen. Next, so the two proteins are strictly identical, except for the 19 additional amino acid as the C-terminus of the large delta protein. And we can see on this protein functional regions such as, next, arginine rich motif, which are binding to the uh, nucleic acid and not only the genomic uh, RNA. You so also have nuclear localization signals and P27 and P24 are nuclear protein. You have to have that in, in mind. And then you have two dimerization sites, which allow formation of dimers. And this protein also have several post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation, sumoylation, acetylation, which is very important on the uh, lysine uh, 72 and methylation too. And you also have on the C-terminus here, on the cysteine at position 211, a farnesylation site with a main point where farnesyl and isoprenyl uh, 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 of binding on this, and this allow the morphogenesis of the virus. Next. So I told you that this acetylation in 72 position and this farnesylation are main point in the biology of the virus. Next. So the role of this protein are very different. The small delta antigen activate HDV RNA genome by recruiting and activating the RNA polymerase two, 
by a mimicry of, uh, of, uh, of East Stone. And you can see here a model have been proposed by Paul Denny and his collaborator, where small delta antigen can replace in this acetylation in 72 position to permit the transcription, the replication of the, of the, of the, of the, of the genome of the RNA genome. Next. Okay, next. The large enter protein itself inhibits genome replication by binding to the small delta antigen to form a dimer uh, P27 and P24, inhibit the genome replication, but also mediate viral morphogenesis and secretion of the viral particles after a phenylation of its cysteine, as I told you later. But one more thing is to know next that P27 is able to activate several host genes and transcription factor involving inflammation, proliferation, cell signaling, oxidative trace. So the large delta antigen has some side effects very important in the life of the cells. And small and large delta antigen form the, as I told you, the ribonucleal protein, which is enveloped by the envelope of the protein envelope of the HBV. Next. So if we see that in the, uh, the, the, the replication of the, of the virus, the cell, the, cells, the, cells, the, cell virus, the cell replication of the virus in the cell, in the hepatocyte, as you can see here, first, the virus will entry by the same NTCP, which is a major receptor, which binds the large uh, antigen HBS. Next. So HBV enters the cell, next and then give, as you know, an excess of subviral particles, which are empty envelope in a pore of the cells. And then next, we'll provide the uh, HBV uh, variant, uh, complete uh, infectious HBV variant. And another pore of the cell, it's very important to know that they do not ingress the cell at the same pole. Then HDV, by the same entry, by the same, then enter in the nucleus due to the nuclear signal of on the protein, delta protein, next. And in the nucleus, you will see what I just described you, genome transcription, next. Genome replication in antigenome, next. Antigenome replication to genome, and then next, antigenome will be subject to editing replication and transcription to give the mRNA of P27. And then you will have next production of new ribonucleoprotein, which are farnesylated, a major step in the viral cycle, next. And this farnesylation allow the assembly of the virus with the empty particles of HBV and then aggress to the cell by the same way, by the same pathway than the HBV survival particle. Next. Thank you. So this is the main cell cycle viral replication of the viruses HBV and HDV in the same hepatocyte. Next. Next. So Another point we have to keep in mind is that uh, HDV is very diverse molecularly. Next, it is one of the major topics of my, how my lab, and we performed several studies, and now we proposed to the scientific community that HDV uh, uh, segregated in eight genotypes, one to eight, and in several subgenotypes within genotypes, and as you can see on this map, with a geographical characteristic distribution. You can see that HDV1 is ubiquitous, but when you look carefully, you see that subgenotype are precise in some region, as you can see here. In Africa, you have four genotypes, five genotypes, genotype one, with three, at least three subgenotypes, and you have HDV5, five, five, four, six, seven, and eight. This is very important because uh, African people migrate, no, notably in France, and we have several patients, and most patients in France are from Africa. So this is of concern, this genetic variability is very important to be able to, 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 to quantify properly uh, these viruses when you want to uh, manage the different patient. Next. 
So I told you that HDV is responsible for the more severe viral hepatitis, but I just want to comment a, a study we perform next, what we call the Delta study. And what we know, what is important as uh, it is that uh, HDV must be systematically screened for HDV infection. This is very important. This is a main point. This must be a reflex, reflex testing of all HDV infected patients. Next. And this is achieved very easily. You just have to perform first total HDV antibody. Next. When it is negative, next, you conclude negative. When it is positive, next, you have to perform HDV RNA viral load, very important. And when this viral load is negative, next, next, you just have when it is negative to next follow the patient very precisely and to repeat testing if a new event occurs in the life of this patient. The clinic here is very important to perform this. And we have yet to discuss about uh, how long uh, how, how long we have to perform this test. It is very difficult. You will see in the following of the patient. When it is positive, you have to carefully follow these patients. Clinical surveillance is very important. Biopsy must be uh, uh, evaluated. Or you can use a, a non-invasive test. You have to screen for uh, uh, a cancer because I told you that uh, HDV uh, uh, worsened the uh, HBV uh, infection. And then when the patients are positive for RNA, you have to treat them. Two drugs now in Europe are used into ferron alpha and bulivotide, but new compounds are now in development. We will talk about this. But you never forget that you have an underlying infection with HBV. You have also to see what happened, and you have also to make HBV DNA, please, next, next, next. And then if it is positive, more than three long, you have to put, uh, uh, you have to treat the patient with nucleoside analogs. Then on this picture, what is important is that HDV RNA viral load is our main point. Next, HDV viral load allowed to identify patients, to identify the patient which are replicative or HDV, because we know that the replication of HDV is associated with a poor outcome of the hepatic disease. Viral load allows you to decide to treat the patient, allow to evaluate the efficiency of the treatment and the response of the treatment of the patient. Also, it allows uh, you to decide to stop the treatment when it is not necessary to continue, as because it is negative over several years, or as it did not become negative and you have to use compassionate treatment. And then HDV violet is very important to evaluate the new anti-HDV compounds that are in development now. Next, but there is a concern in on the diversity and the performances of the quantification of the by the different uh, assay uh, uh, you, uh, available now. We performed in 2004 a consensus uh, uh, PCR, uh, RT-PCR to quantify HDV RNA. And we, according to the high variability, we performed a consensus test by using very conserved, very conserved uh, 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 region of the genome. Next, and then, we decided to uh, compare our techniques, our assay, with those existing in the world. And we perform this first international quality control next. 28 laboratories all over the world participated into this assay. We're very good of that. I want to thank them a lot again. Next, we sent to them samples, very variable samples with different genotype, all genotypes except three and four, with virus viral load ranging from 2.5 to 7.5 copies per ml from different genotypes, as you can see. And then at this moment, there was a host standout who were in development. We sent back them a new set of samples with dilution of this uh, standard against with two negative control. Next, I show you here the result of this uh, quality control uh, expressed in a in a in a in a gray scale, the expected results are the lab twenty four our lab 
yes, with our uh, consensus assay, and as you can see, several, but most uh, labs failed to quantify at least one sample. And this was linked to the genotypes, as you can see, African genotype was very badly uh, 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 detected. As you can see here, lab three with the asterisk is a, is a commercial kit and you can see cannot amplify the African strain. But also Asian strain too was difficultly uh, uh, quantified by most tests and also HDV1 uh, uh, European also some labs failed to quantify them. Next. So we classified in four clusters this different lab. And as you see, only 43% of them uh, in, the, in this group, and you can see that here, we, we accepted up to two logs of difference with the expected values. So the conclusion of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, quality control was this one next, that most available assay and estimated or failed to quantify properly HDV RNA viral load. And this is of concern because next, I just want to next. next yes, we perform a Delta V study over 1,122 French patients followed uh, during three years, about three years. Next, with different patients, mainly from Sub Sahara, Afri Sub Saharan Africa, but also from Asia and South America, one or two patients. Next. And as you can see on this table, at the end of the follow-up, near 50% of the patients with developed cirrhosis, 25% had episodes of liver decompensation, near 10% had HCC, and 20% uh, of the patient will die if they don't have a liver transplantation. And as you see here, 70, 67% of the patient remain HDV RNA positive. And persistence of HDV RNA is of concern. As you can see, there is a significant evolution to cirrhosis, to hepatic decompensation, next, to hepatocellular carcinoma, and to survival without liver transplantation, next. And when we try to see what happened to 10 years with a statistical uh, method, we see that 25% of patients will die if they are not transplanted. 15% we have an hepatocellular carcinoma and near 60% we have cirrhosis. Next. So HDV is a more severe viral hepatitis. And the question is, what are the anti-HDV therapies available? And it will be my last next slide. And we come back to the to the to, to this slide to see that first. Yes, go. Next. Next. Okay. Next. Okay. The main treatment is a type 1 interferon, which act as on HDV and on HBV and stimulate the immunity, the innate immunity, and also the specific immunity. We have also entry inhibitor like Gudevertide developed by Stephanie Urban. And you also have inhibitor of arnesylation that block the, the synthesis of the viral particle. And you have also nucleic acid polymer that block the, 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 the secretion of the viral particle. And while preparing this, uh, this, uh, this conference, I ask myself why uh, the, 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 the HDV uh, antigen at the mRNA level or at the antibody level cannot be a, a, a good target to block HDV replication, to block assembly. So the take-home message are very easier to understand. HDV occur only in HBV-infected patients. HBV much screen in all HBV patients. HDV diagnosis rely on two uh, markers, delta antibodies and the uh, uh, HDV quantification, not only does HDV quantification I say exist, then you have to treat the patient. Mainly pegantafegon is used, but give only 20% of, uh, of, of Q. And next, anti specific anti HDV drug are now. Uh, 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 under development, inhibitor of entry, inhibitor of assembly, inhibitor of secretion, 
and it's very important to uh, 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 now to have uh, 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 guidelines to manage the patient because now it is, there is no consensus in the community. So let me uh, thank you for your attention. And sorry for the convenience because I could not manage myself my slides. Thank you very much. We uh, are moving the calendar around just a little bit, but since Emmanuel is on the phone and on the line, his uh, wife's in the hospital with uh, an injury, we thought we would do just Q&A with him for a moment, if that's okay, so he can go and go back and take care of his family. Um, Emmanuel, are you ready for a few questions? Yes, of course. Fantastic. Uh, if you have questions, please come to the mic. And looks like Ira's on his way. Hi, know. Hello, Dr. Gordian. Ira Jacobson. I'm working with Bob on this program. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a fantastic talk. I could listen to it quite a few times and keep learning from it. Do you foresee a time in the future, or perhaps even at present, where there'll be a clinical role for genotyping patients to stratify patients by either level of risk, prognosis, or more importantly, therapeutic choices? Or is it more of a scientific uh, phenomenon that's for clinicians a curiosity? You, you ask me about the, uh, uh, is, is it is necessary to perform genotyping? Is what you tell me? Well, do you think it will be uh, helpful or important clinically either now or in the future? I think for now it is uh, for research, for clinical research. I think it can be important because uh, uh, in our uh, few experiments uh, we have, we see that some genotypes give more uh, uh, aggressive disease than others. And we see some of others are treated more easily than others. So, but it's now a very preliminary studies. And I think that in uh, in research program, uh, the genotype should could be something uh, should be uh, implement in, in the in the following of the patient. Okay, thank you. A really important point, Ira and Emmanuel, is that the CDC right now is setting up a genotype assay to be available in the U.S. and they're setting it up to be an LDT. So you'll actually will get a a value back that actually can go in the chart and won't give you a bunch of research only. You know gobbledygook that we see in a number of our uh, newer assays. So uh, Salim Camellia is in the process of setting up that genotype assay right now with Tonya Hayden. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, question, Bob. Uh, I want to know more about the U.S. available HCVR and APCR. For comparison, a kind of Quest lab, compare their labs, the, 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 the studies too. How is HCV, HDV RNA here the test? And what about the genotype coverage too? Right. So the question has to do with Delta RNA PCR in the United States today. And this has really been a hot topic. I've been working on it over the last two years with the Gilead team, Grace Chi and Brad Collins. We've been on the phone about every 90 days with all the major labs trying to get them up to speed. Um, in this panel that was here, I think, Emmanuel, wasn't uh, Quest one of the uh, laboratories that you went to for your performance? Can you repeat, please? Quest Laboratory, were they one of the um, organizations you went to for your performance? No, I, I, what I want to propose is that uh, I think another uh, international external uh, control, quality control for all available uh, kits commercial kits or in-house uh, kits is needed. I think it's very important because uh, I know that several efforts have been made to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to ameliorate the different assays that exist. So I think we have now to, to, to do something. I think it's very important. For me, it's a key point. So to answer the question, Dr. Hu, so right now Quest has a quant PCR assay and an antibody, total antibody. They also have an IgM kit, but most people aren't using that. So Quest is up and running. Their performance characteristics were published, I think at HEPDART four years ago or three years ago. So their performance characteristics are online. AREP has had quant PCR and total antibody since 2013. 
They're moving to the new Roche platform, which has even higher sensitivity and specificity qualifications. So AREP's had a decade of experience in this space. LabCorp has nothing. They were doing some send out for qualitative PCR to an outside lab. They will have both antibody and PCR quant available probably by June. Mayo Clinic also should be online this year. And that's the four major labs. You want to go now, it's AREP or Quest, and they have very high performance characteristics. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Wiedemeyer, can you ask your question yeah. online? Are you live? I'm, I'm live. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. So uh, following the, the discussion you just said about after the previous question, and maybe Emmanuel may comment on that. Yes, uh, and I think we should, let's say your study was very important five or six years ago, but uh, obviously the, the new assays that are being developed, that have been developed are much better in performance characteristics. Still, my question to Emmanuel would be, and Pietro uh, presented a comparative study, I think at ASLD, that even with the commercial assays in different hands, there are still surprisingly big differences in the uh, yeah in the and then in the results that you get for individual patients. So Emmanuel, why is this the case? We have automatic uh, systems, machines, and still they lead to different outcomes. Is it sample processing? Is it handling? Why is HDV so different from HBV and HCV, where we have extremely robust commercial assays leading to uh, yeah, comparable results? And I'm not convinced that this will be the case with Delta. Can you comment on that? Yes, it is a, it is a main point. So you have first the RNA extraction. You know, uh, Delta uh, RNA is closely linked to the protein. And if you do not uh, uh, denature very well the samples, th this is a first problem. So you have to consider to the, the, the samples, how much samples do you use? You have to consider to the elution uh, 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 of the RNA, uh, extracted RNA. These are several points that uh, in when, in, when we, we perform quality control in France of all labs that use the same, uh, the same kits and you have very different results according to their PCR, PCR uh, 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 instrument, to their extraction method, to the, and this is of concern. This is why it is very important now to, to, to try to, to standardize all these steps, the extraction step, and the amplification step. And then the third point is the is a control, international controls I can allow to compare between different uh, assays. So I have a question. I'm maybe sorry. one comment, one, one comment, Bob, maybe we discuss this later during the discussion. But my question to Emmanuel, based on this, so do you think that is this reasonable, for example, for a guideline? If we would define based on clinical cohorts, let's say 1,000 international units as a cutoff for more severe or more benign disease or as a response factor where I initiate another treatment, yes or no. Do you think that giving an absolute value is really something that would work in clinical practice, like the 2,000 units cut off an HBV. So will this be the case, or you rather prefer, let's say, for example, during treatment, relative declines, which is less, uh, let's say, where, where maybe slight differences are overcome because a relative decline should be pretty much the same. So is an absolute cutoff really something that you see that could be implemented in clinical practice worldwide? Yes, it's, a, it's an important question, of course. Uh, what I, you, saw, you saw in our Delta V study is that persistence of HDV RNA is pejorative for the patient. So I think we have to have good uh, 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 quantification uh, assays. And I think we have to do something on this. I think this is the, this is the main point. You, you can you can you can conclude anything if you can if you are unable to quantify the, the viral load if you are unable to 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 see if a patient is still replicating in lower case it's still replicating 
it is why it is important to have. Uh, I think it will be also, it will be too important to, to to see the standard international standard. Maybe two two other one with other genotypes. Maybe it will be interesting to 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 to, to make to make them. I think so. But I think that we have to we have to discuss very precisely about the different steps that are uh, uh, that, that are of concern in the amplification of the HDV RNA. So I have a question for you, um, Heiner. Importantly, Emmanuel, are you yes. ready to do another grid performance assessment, especially including the U.S. labs potentially by 2024? Of course. Yeah, there are some efforts ongoing, Bob, uh, among European sites, obviously during the, the currently available treatments in Europe. Um, but uh, I agree uh, we should uh, broaden this to uh, several sites. We may discuss this. And during my presentation, I will invite you to Pietros in my meeting that we will have in October in Hanover. And maybe that would be a good time to sit together with all the people involved and plan this in more detail. Good point. Yes. Fantastic. All right. We want to thank you, Emmanuel, for being part of us today. Heiner, great that you're engaged early. We know your talks in a little bit, and we're ready to move on to our next presentation. I think we've answered the questions. Emmanuel, have a good day. Bonjour, bonsoir, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. All right. Our next presentation is going to be from Tatiana Kushner, who was an early investor in the Delta world. Uh, Tatiana, we're glad you've been so early and so tenacious. And we're going to talk about, should all patients with Delta be treated? And of course, we've already concluded that everybody with B should be tested for Delta. So now this is the next step. Welcome. Right, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me and for uh, Bob Gish and, and Ira Jacobson for organizing this session. I've been interested in Delta hepatitis for a while and it's great to hear that we have dedicated sessions for it. So it's good to be here. Uh, so I was asked the question, should all patients with Delta be treated? It's interesting because we're asking the same question with hepatitis B. Uh, and so I think, you know, it'll evolve in a few years, but I'll discuss kind of what we know now and what treatments we have available and whether we should take a universal approach to uh, offering treatment to patients. These are my disclosures. So we, we've already heard that Delta hepatitis is what the most severe form of viral hepatitis when compared to hepatitis B mononfection, hepatitis C, a higher risk for more severe liver disease, progression of fibrosis to cirrhosis, increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and increased risk of decompensation in the setting of liver disease. And so that suggests that we should really be very aggressive in offering treatments. Uh, and we've heard uh, just from the prior presentation, and uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at the idea of having persistent HDV viremia and how that independently is associated with worse uh, outcomes and clinical events. Uh, so this is a study from Spain that looked at patients with um, persistent HDV viremia versus not, and saw that there is an increased risk of liver decompensation, liver-related events. So we need to address the viremia in order to improve outcomes. Uh, this is another large study uh, in Taiwan looking at patients with uh, uh, Delta co-infection and again demonstrated that among patients with cirrhosis and without cirrhosis, there's an increased risk of the development of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients who are viremic. So if we don't address the viremia, then we have increased risk of developing HCC. Uh, this is a study that was just quoted earlier uh, from France, also looking at predictors uh, that are associated with the incidence of HCC in patients with uh, Delta hepatitis, over 1,000 patients, and saw that having persistent uh, viremia, uh, detectable HDV RNA, was uh, indeed associated with, uh, was a, a strong predictor uh, for the development of HCC. In addition, there, there's data that has looked at quality of life and uh, patient reported outcomes. This is uh, Maria Beauty's uh, study, which looked at uh, 
uh, quality of life, patient reported outcomes in patients with uh, Delta hepatitis, with active Delta hepatitis, and uh, saw that there were uh, significantly worse uh, patient reported outcomes in patients living with Delta. And so aside from the clinical endpoints, we need to think about the patient as a whole, and potentially if we can offer treatment and uh, improve uh, viremia, then actually their quality of life uh, may improve uh, as well, which is obviously quite uh, important. Uh, but then that brings us to what we currently have available. So yes, of course, we would like to improve the viremia, to improve their liver-related outcomes, potentially their quality of life, but our treatments currently, especially in the U.S., are a bit limited. So uh, we have uh, the availability of pegylated interferon. It's off-label use, and it's weekly injections. Uh, it's an immune modulator, as we all know. Uh, and then in Europe, uh, fortunately, bolivertide is available in um, in some countries, and so that is uh, also a possibility to offer patients in Europe, but is not here in the U.S. Uh, so unless our patients move to Europe, we can't really offer that yet, but hopefully soon. And so if we treat uh, the patients, is there an improvement in outcomes? So we know that having worse, uh, higher viremia or persistent viremia is associated with uh, liver-related outcomes. But if we use uh, existing uh, available treatments, does that actually make an impact? Uh, so this is a, a study that looked at 136 patients with uh, chronic Delta and followed them for at least six months, but with a median follow-up of five years. And looked at a, it, uh, it was a retrospective look at patients who were either treated with interferon versus not treated with interferon, and found that their cumulative event free survival was significantly better if they were treated uh, with interferon. So that shows that, uh, yes, suppressing the viremia is the goal, and yes, that actually treating with interferon improves their overall mortality. Uh, this is a, another study looking at uh, 36 patients with uh, Delta. It was a randomized control trial, a little bit of, of an older trial, uh, looking at different doses of interferon and saw that people on the higher doses uh, responded better in terms of viral suppression, so dose-related response, and then again followed them over time with a follow-up of 2 to 14 years, so long-term follow-up after they were treated with the interferon and saw uh, and a significant improvement in their overall survival. So again, demonstrating that actually the currently available treatments that we have in the US actually, if we can use them, can improve overall survival in patients with uh, Delta. Uh, and then we have a number of trials that have been conducted with pegylator interferon for Delta. And although the studies that I showed that showed overall improvement of mortality are excellent, but who actually responds to Delta? So not every, uh, who actually responds to pegylator interferon? And what we see here is that across the uh, multiple studies that have been done using pegylator interferon for Delta hepatitis, in terms of virologic response, it ranges anywhere from 13% to maybe up to 60%. Uh, and so it shows that, yes, we can offer uh, interferon, but actually even in the clinical trial setting, that response is incomplete. So only a relatively small uh, percentage of patients has have virologic response when using pegylated interferon. And then when you look at sustained virologic response, longer durable response, uh, those numbers are even lower. So ranging from 17% uh, to 43%. So we know that ideally we can offer something to our patients, but we also see that even in the clinical trial setting that many patients won't respond uh, to uh, what we have available to offer. And really, I think one of the aspects is we need to understand better what are the predictors of response uh, and who would potentially uh, benefit from uh, the available therapies. 
Uh, also, I already alluded to this, but even if they do respond to peg later interferon, we know that late relapse is common. So uh, they may respond initially, but then uh, relapse can occur down the line. And then when we think about overall benefit on uh, uh, clinically relevant endpoints and overall uh, mortality, does this uh, actually, uh, uh, does this matter that even though they responded initially, then they have late relapse? And who are the people that will have late relapse and how can we predict that better? Uh, and this is uh, uh, from the one of the peg later interferon uh, trials and basically just uh, emphasizes the point that even when you do offer peg later interferon in the context of a clinical trial, many patients are not eligible. So in, in this study, only 66% of the patients were eligible. And then when you think about how the percentage of them that actually responded, so then that goes down to 26% of all the uh, people that came uh, for treatment initially. And then even fewer had sustained response. So it shows that when we, if we offered it to all comers, uh, you know, probably less than one in five patients would actually respond and benefit from uh, treatment with interferon. And why what is that? So one of the reasons for not being able to uh, tolerate or, or uh, uh, not being eligible for treatment with peg later interferon is that it, as we all know, is associated with significant, significant uh, adverse events. So uh, peg later interferon is associated with flu-like symptoms, uh, autoimmune disease, psychiatric disease, hematologic abnormalities. So if patients have some of these conditions at baseline, you may be hesitant and they may be hesitant uh, to try pegylated interferon alpha. Uh, fortunately, uh, we are now studying pegylated interferon lambda, and hopefully that will uh, decrease some of these associated side effects, so make it available to more patients in the future. With belavertide, again, which is uh, available in Europe, there are some side effects, but really overall it's well tolerated. So that's something to look forward to, that hopefully we will have uh, uh, therapies that we can offer to more people with less uh, side effects. And then we have to think about the current guidelines. So uh, what are the guidelines in terms of what we have available now and who should we treat based on the uh, current guidelines? So the AASLD does recommend that you can use pegylated interferon alpha for one year in patients with elevated HDV RNA and elevated ALT, which reminds us of the hepatitis B guidelines that elevated ALT is, is part of this. Um, and then uh, Apozil recommends pegylated interferon also for over a year, although optimal duration of therapy not well defined. Easel, uh, very similar to AASLD, recommends pegylator interferon for uh, 48 weeks in patients, again, with uh, compensated liver disease. Uh, and so across the board, the recommendations are similar. So you can uh, recommend treatment with pegylator interferon for patients with evidence of active disease. Who are the guidelines recommending not to treat? So we know that in patients with decompensated liver disease, peg later interferon should not be used. So uh, patients who have decompensated liver disease uh, are not eligible for treatment with uh, peg later interferon. And in addition, another point to make is who do we use a nucleoside nucleotide analog? So we have those available for treatment of hepatitis B, and there's a little bit of a discussion about whether we should be recommending uh, these medications for patients uh, for Delta. Uh, as we know, uh, they likely have, they have no uh, activity against the Delta virus itself, but there's some differences in guidelines in terms of who do we recommend a nucleoside nucleotide analog. Therapy. So AASLD guidelines say that if HPV DNA levels are elevated, concurrent therapy with uh, entecavir, tenofovir uh, is indicated. So if there's an elevation of HPV DNA, and actually many patients with Delta may have at least some elevation in uh, HPV DNA. Easel says that in HDV HPV contacted patients with ongoing HPV DNA replication, NA therapy should be considered. And then Apozel interestingly says that in patients with co-infection of hepatitis B and Delta, it is important to determine which virus is dominant and the patient should be treated accordingly. 
Uh, so it'll be interesting maybe to ask in the discussion what current practices are about using nucleoside nucleotide analog therapy for uh, patients with Delta. So then when we put all this together, what are the uh, pros and cons of potentially offering treatment to patients with uh, Delta hepatitis in the current landscape, considering what we have available really with a U.S. focus uh, because we're uh, here? So the benefit is that we have seen and we know that HDV is an aggressive disease course, and we hope to slow the progression. So we've seen that Viremia is associated with liver-related outcomes and overall mortality. And so if we address it, hopefully we can improve their overall uh, survival. And we know that viral response is associated with that. Uh, in addition, hopefully, if we can treat them now, this could serve as a bridge to newer, more effective therapies and, and uh, prevent progression of disease or slow the progression of disease until we have uh, better options available. Uh, and potentially, can it delay transplant? So treat them now so that hopefully they have a, a, a better outcome. Also, for us as providers, we like to feel like we're doing something and that we are not just seeing the patient without offering uh, treatment. So I think we, uh, you know, at least we have something that we can offer patients and, and that's important. Uh, but I think, you know, the downside of offering treatment is that, uh, you know, it's a long-term commitment, one year of pegylator interferon associated with significant adverse effects. Uh, patients that I discuss this with are not all very enthusiastic, you know, especially if they may not have advanced fibrosis at this point, uh, to take that on and incorporate that into their lives. It's injections. Uh, patients aren't uh, overly enthusiastic about in injections. Uh, there's also a risk of disease relapse after a uh, pretty significant uh, risk after treatment discontinuation. So you may treat them, they may respond, and then uh, they have a relapse after. And then uh, hopefully new treatments will be available at that point, but uh, obviously it is disappointing. And again, uh, we can't offer it to all of our patients. So patients who uh, have decompensated liver disease would not be eligible for peg later interferon. So in summary, who should we treat for Delta? Uh, well, per the guidelines, patients with detectable viremia and elevated ALT, I think we also need to incorporate into that uh, assessment uh, fibrosis. So patients with advanced fibrosis, obviously there's more of an urgency to treat. Uh, so we uh, should offer treatment to those with advanced fibrosis or risk factors for fibrosis uh, progression. We should not treat patients with decompensated disease. Uh, we should uh, treat patients who can tolerate pegylator interferon. So if they have pre-existing conditions such as psychiatric disease or autoimmune disease, uh, then they may not be able to tolerate that. And so we need to uh, be aware of that. And of course, we should treat patients who have access to the newer therapies and access to clinical trials in, in that context. And that is it. Thank you. All right, we're continuing to build on the interferon story here with Christopher Coe from the NIH, who is a, a PEG interferon expert, but also a Lambda expert, works in close collaboration uh, with Dr. Theo Heller. Dr. Heller gave a great presentation in downtown Los Angeles two days ago as part of the ASLD meeting on Delta. So we're really building the Delta story in front of many people. Christopher, uh, welcome. Sunday morning. Thanks for joining us. Are we live? Hello. I'm honored to have the opportunity to present on the role of interferon therapy in hepatitis D infection today. Worldwide, approximately 20 million people are infected with hepatitis D. And of these, up to 80% of patients with hepatitis D may develop cirrhosis within five to 10 years. Patients infected with hepatitis D are at higher risk for hepatic decompensation, leading to death and the development of liver cancer compared to mono-infected patients. So my task today is to discuss the role of interferon therapy in chronic hepatitis D. As you all know, the interferon pathway has long been studied and used for the treatment of viral hepatitis infection. In fact, for many of us, we remember the days of using thrice weekly interferon alpha injections and later weekly peg interferon injections for patients infected with chronic hepatitis C. 
So our experience and our research has largely been with the type one interferons and their associated pathways. In this cartoon, we see the type one interferon signaling pathway starting in the purple receptor, um, also known as the interferon receptor alpha one and alpha two. And ultimately it progresses down the JAK-STAT pathway. From there, we ultimately get the formation of the STAT1 and STAT2 heterodimers binding with interferon regulatory factor 9 or IRF9, and the complex activates transcriptions of genes with interferon stimulated response element or ISRE promoters. Separately, we also see another pathway with, without IRF9 where STAT1 and STAT2 heterodimers uh, bind with gamma interferon activated sites or GAS promoters. So our experience with type one interferons and viral hepatitis um, are, are quite robust. And I'll be reviewing what has been done in the field of HDV. Next, we'll also talk about the investigational use of type three interferons and hepatitis D as well. In liver disease, lambda interferon, which is a type three interferon is currently undergoing exploration in patients infected with hepatitis delta. Today, we won't be talking about type two in interferons for hepatitis D as none have been explored in this disease. So let's first talk about interferon alpha for delta hepatitis. So if we look at the history of interferon alpha therapy in HDV, the earliest reported use of interferon in HDV dates back to around 1987 by J. Hufnagel, Francisco Rosina, and Antonia Smedley and other colleagues. Since those initial studies, there have been many studies globally exploring the use of interferon alpha and delta hepatitis. Both interferon and pegylated interferon have been explored. The use of interferon in combination with other therapies have also been explored. And even longer durations of interferon therapy has been explored with one study going out to five years of interferon therapy. Some of these studies are shown here on the slide. What I would note, is despite all of these different interferon derivations, the goal of undetectable virus six months after therapeutic discontinuation, also known as a sustained response, has largely gone, has largely only been around 20 to 30 percent, as shown in the right column here. So interferon as a monotherapy, or sorry, interferon alpha as a monotherapy, or in combination with available hepatitis B therapies, have largely been unsatisfactory in delta hepatitis. More recently, continued exploration of nucleic acid polymers by Replicor, prenylation inhibitors by Iger, and entry inhibitors by Gilead has utilized PEG interferon alpha as a backbone for combination therapy. So the PEG interferon alpha continues to be used as a potential modality for hepatitis D therapies. So what are the takeaways for interferon alpha? Well, early interferon-based strategies as monotherapies or combined with approved hepatitis B therapies are largely unsatisfactory in delta hepatitis. Next, interferon alpha is still not an FDA-approved therapy for use in HDV despite the recommendations by various societal guidelines. Finally, interferon alpha continues to be explored as the backbone for some investigational therapies. So the use of type one interferons may continue for some time in the future. Next, let's move on to the discussion of type three interferons for HDV, namely lambda interferon. I would note that one of the unique aspects of type three interferon, which differs from that of type one interferons is that Type one interferon receptors are expressed almost in almost all nucleated cells. So their function and their side effects are largely systemic. Interferon lambda type three receptors are much are more isolated and highly expressed on hepatocytes with limited expression on hematopoietic cells and central nervous system cells. So this potentially has a benefit in terms of less systemic side effects of therapy in patients with delta hepatitis. One of the very first forays of lambda interferon in liver disease was in hepatitis B. Namely, this was the Lira B study. 
In this phase two multi-center randomized parallel double-blinded study of, for 48 weeks of lambda interferon versus alpha interferon monotherapy in patients with E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B infection. Patients were followed for 24 weeks um, after treatment to assess off treatment response rates. The primary endpoints of the study were the number of patients with serious adverse events and discontinuations due to adverse events and E antigen seroconversion at post treatment week 24. Regarding the results from this study, lambda interferon demonstrated greater earlier effects on HPV DNA and surface antigen. At the end of treatment, there were comparable serologic and virologic responses. And this is shown in the figure on the right where the white background meets the shaded background. Post-treatment, looking at the primary endpoint, E antigen seroconversion rates were found to be higher with alpha compared to the lambda with alpha at 30% and lambda at 13.8%. Regarding the safety endpoints of this study, Lambda patients experienced lower rates of flu and musculoskeletal system, uh, symptoms compared to those who received alpha. The yellow arrows on this table also show the various adverse events that seem to occur at a lower rate in lambda compared to alpha. So now that we've talked about lambda interferon for hepatitis B, let's talk about lambda for delta hepatitis. Here, is the first study exploring the use of PEG interferon lambda for patients that are co-infected with hepatitis B and Delta. This was a phase two open label controlled study known as the limit one study, where investigators from Israel, Pakistan, and New Zealand explored the use of PEG interferon lambda in 36 chronically infected Delta patients for 48 weeks. In the study, there were two dosing arms a lower dose, 120 micrograms per week dose, and a higher dose of 180 microgram dose and also administered weekly. In this study, the primary endpoint was to evaluate safety, tolerability, and efficacy of PEG interferon lambda in Delta infected subjects. In the higher dosing arm, the 180 arm, 60% had, greater, had a greater than two log decline while on treatment, and 40% achieved undetectable HDV at RNA at the end of treatment. At 24 weeks of post-therapy follow-up, 36% of patients maintained HDV RNA levels below the lower limit of quantification, and 36% achieved ALT normalization. In the higher dose group, which is shown here in this figure, the mean decline of HDV RNA from baseline was slightly over two logs after four weeks of therapy. This was greater than the lower dose group, which had a mean decline of 1.2 logs at week 48. At the end of therapy, HDV RNA below the lower limit of quantification was observed in 36% of the patients in the higher dose group and 16% in the lower dose group. At the end of study, which was six months of, after completion of treatment, the durable virologic response which was defined as undetectable or below the lower limit of quantification was seen in 36% of patients in the higher dose 180 microgram group and 16% of the lower dose 120 microgram group. If we look at ALT normalization with PEG interferon lambda, a surrogate marker of hepatic necroinflammation, at week 48, 11% of the lower dose and 14% of the higher dose group achieved ALT normalization. At week 72, ALT normalization was seen in 26% of patients in the lower dose group and 36% of the higher dose group. Regarding safety, elevations in hepatobiliary enzymes were consistent with previous studies of hepatitis B and C. And incidences of bilirubin and ALT elevations occurred in patients mainly from the Pakistan cohort. ALT and bilirubin levels returned to baseline values following dose reduction or interruption or drug discontinuation. So what's next for PEG interferon lambda monotherapy for delta hepatitis? Well, 
The LIMIT-2 study, which is a phase three study, current, is currently enrolling and dosing patients in 13 countries and 50 sites. The intent is to treat 150 patients for 48 weeks and then follow them for an additional 24 weeks. So we are eagerly awaiting the results from this study, which will likely be about a year from now or more. Next, let's look at the investigational combinations utilizing lambda interferon and delta hepatitis. Namely, this is the combination of lambda interferon with the prenylation inhibitor lornafarnib. So here's the first combination exploring the use of peg interferon lambda with the prenylation inhibitor lornafarnib. This was a study performed at the NIH Clinical Center that was a phase two open labeled controlled study exploring the use of 180 micrograms of pegylated interferon administered weekly with twice daily ritonavir boosted lornafarnib at 50 milligrams for a duration of 24 weeks. After treatment, patients were followed for an additional 24 weeks. The primary endpoint of the study was the ability to tolerate the combination for 24 weeks and a greater than two log reduction of HDV RNA at the end of 24 weeks of treatment. Here are the results from the study. 88% of patients completed the study and by per protocol analysis, 78% achieved the primary endpoint of greater than two log decline at 24 weeks of therapy. The figure on the left shows the median changes in HDV RNA based on response. The dark turquoise line demonstrates the path of individuals who did not achieve a greater than two log decline of HDV RNA at 24 weeks. The bright turquoise line shows the course of individuals who achieved the greater than two log decline at 24 weeks of therapy. The purple line shows the course of subjects who achieved either undetectable HDV RNA or below the lower limit of quantification at 24 weeks of therapy. And the yellow line shows the median change in HDV RNA in those who remained undetectable at the end of follow-up at 48 weeks. At the end of 24 weeks of, of therapy, 39% achieved undetectable HDV RNA and 13% achieved undetectable HDV RNA, but below the lower limit of quantification. At six months of post-therapy follow-up, 11% had, had a sustained undetectable HDV RNA where 8% remained below the lower limit of quantification. Next, if we look at ALT normalization, this, which was a secondary endpoint in the study, in patients that had undetectable HDV RNA or below the lower limit of quantification at the end of follow-up, significant ALT declines were seen with a median decline of ALT of 44. If we look at adverse events, the most common adverse events were GI-related and largely ascribed to lornafarnib therapy. Hyperbilirubinemia as described with other experiences with lambda interferon occurred in 19% of subjects. All patients that discontinued subtherapy were followed through to the end of study and returned to their baseline status. So what does the future look like with the combination therapies that include lambda interferon? Well, the group in the NIH that completed the 24-week lambda interferon with lornafarnib and ritonavir study have planned a follow-up study for treatment for 48 weeks. They are going to explore the same dosing combination for 48 weeks rather than the earlier study for 24 weeks. And the hope is that longer therapy will allow for more of those that had a greater had a great response to maintain their response. This study is scheduled to start in a few months at the NIH Clinical Center. So what are the key takeaways from what I presented today? Interferon therapies still have a role in HDV in current day management. Some of the investigational therapies for HDV include the use of interferon alpha as a part of a, a combination strategy. Newer investigational interferons appear to be more tolerable, making it a possibility for a multi-pronged strategy against delta hepatitis. And finally, future therapies are likely to continue incorporating the use of interferons as a part of its therapeutic regimen, at least for the near term. Thank you for listening.
We're going to go ahead and get started to stay on time. Thanks. I'll introduce Dr. Jacobson, my wonderful partner in this uh, fantastic event. And he's going to bring us to the therapeutic section and we'll do a wrap up panel discussion and see where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first part of the session was fantastic, and I'm sure the second part will be uh, equally so. Uh, we're uh, going to feature uh, two of the world's leading uh, clinical investigators and physician scientists in the HDV space specifically. Uh, first, Pietro Limpertico from Italy, and then Heider Wiedermeyer, excuse me, uh, from Germany, uh, who we heard from earlier in the Q&A, and we'll certainly hear from again shortly. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Pietro Lampertico. Uh, Bob and I have both had the pleasure of knowing him for many years and learning a lot from him. And Pietro, I know you've been very active with Boulevardtide. We look forward to hearing from you about its use in uh, clinical practice and especially uh, how you've been using it um, with questions that I've heard you discuss in sessions we've been at together about whether it's a maintenance therapy, whether you give it with interferon, very important practical questions that we're all eager to hear about. So welcome. Well, good morning to everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for this invitation. My topic is hepatitis delta, and specifically, how should bulevertide be used in clinical practice? These are my disclosures, and these are this is a long list of questions that uh, I've been asked to cover in my next 20 minute presentation. Uh, I will try to do my best to cover most of these topics. First of all, just a brief introduction to the topic. As you know, Delta aging was discovered in 1977 by Mario in Italy. It's a very small RNA virus uh, with a specific and unique mechanism of replication. It's also a defective virus, which means it needs S antigen for its propagation. Is always a co-infection with HPV, and approximately 10, 20 million S antigen positive carriers are also co-infected with hepatitis delta. This hepatitis delta is also unique because it's a, the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis, more rapid progression to cirrhosis, cancer compared to HBV more infection and HCV more infection. The other very important topic or issue is there is basically, there has been no standard FDA or EMA approved therapy for the last 45 years, basically. Nuke for HPV are used, but they're not really effective for uh, Delta. Peg interferon has been used for many years, is effective in 20% of the patients, cannot be used in many patients or has many contraindications. So there is overall clearly a need for new therapies. Before we start with new therapies, I'd like to cover briefly the endpoints of therapy. The most important endpoint is survival. To improve survival, we need to reduce complications. And to reduce complications, we need to achieve a antigen loss and RNA undetectability or a antigen positivity, but RNA undetectability. And in some specific conditions, mainly the interferon setting of therapy has been shown that the combined response RNA decline more than two log and ALT normalization has been associated with improved outcomes. The other very important point I'd like to discuss is that there are strategies that we could use to achieve this end point. There are basically two strategies. The short-term therapy, less than one year, the end point is virological, PCR negativity, 24 weeks of therapy or the long-term therapy, more than one year of therapy, the endpoint is combined, RNA decline plus LT normalization on therapy at week 48. And there are four different strategies that today we can think for for Delta patients, but most of my presentation will be uh, related to bulevertide. And the reason why I'm covering bulevertide is that bulevertide is really the drug with a more advanced clinical um, development. It's a synthetic lip lipopeptide. Uh, it's an entry inhibitor. The, cell, the target is a cellular target, which is NTCP, which is the bile acid rece receptor. is localized on the surface of the hepatocytes. 
By blocking NTCP, this drug is able to block the entry of B and Delta virus, which means new infections are prevented, which means viral spread into the liver is prevented. Is a self-administered sub-Q injections every day has been conditionally approved by EMA in July 2020 at a dose of two milligram. And the indication is for adult patient with compensated hepatitis delta. This is a summary of the virological, biochemical, and combined response rate in a patient treated with bulevertide 2 milligram, 2 milligram monotherapy for one year. Virological response, approximately 70% of the patients achieve this endpoint. Biochemical response, uh, between 50 to 60%, and combined response, approximately 45, 50%. And there are several good uh, news from these studies. First of all, this is the first time ever in 45 years that we can stop viral replication and normalize LT without interfering. Second very important point is that this drug was effective in patients with cirrhosis and without cirrhosis. Third very important point, the efficacy in randomized control studies like this one, which is the 301 registration were very similar, were very similar to the real life studies from Germany, from France, and from Italy, because this drug has been available in Europe for almost two years now. Unfortunately, though, none of the patients achieve a antigen loss, and none of these patients were able to stop therapy after one year. And if you look at the PCR negativity rates, were approximately 20%. So many patients more than two log decline, but only 20% approximately PCR negativity. However, in the registration trial, we were able to show that uh, not only a virological response and biochemical response, but also a decline of fibro scan in the treated patients, but not in the untreated, an improvement of necroinflammatory activity into the liver in liver biopsies in 59% of the treated, compared to only 15% of the untreated, no significant changes at the fibrosis level, a significant reduction of uh, intrahepatic replication of HDV virus in treated but not in the untreated, and also a significant decline with two milligram of the delta antigen positive cells in the treated, but not in the untreated patient. So significant changes also at intrahepatic level. So the next question is whether you could use the drug in very difficult to, to treat patients, such as those with compensated cirrhosis and GSPH, which stands for clinical significant portal hypertension, which means splenomegaly, high fiber scan, and almost all these patients had esophageal viruses. In this Intentional to treat analysis from or 18 consecutive patients from our center, we showed a very significant and favorable RNA decline on two milligram monotherapy and a very good also and very fast biochemical response. In terms of virological response, 23% PCR negativity at year one and 78% virological response with 50% combined response and 56% biochemical response. But the most important point from this study probably is here in the lower left panel. We were able to show, I think for the first time uh, with bulevertide monotherapy, that uh, due for, um, uh, during therapy, we demonstrated a progressive and statistically significant increase of albumin, which means an improvement of synthetic function of the liver in patients with already a very severe liver disease. What we were recently shown also is the possibility in Italy to extend therapy in these difficult to treat patients with compensated cirrhosis up to week 72. This is a multi-center um, Italian real life study, 93 patients enroll, baseline week eight, week 24, week 48, week 72 responses, different colors on the left side, I think there are two main messages. One, the longer you treat, 
the more favorable are the virological and uh, combined responses. And by week 72, you had 38% PCR negativity, 75% virological response, 81 biochemical response, and 63 combined response. Again, all these patients were compensated cirrhotics. But in this study, we also showed normalization of AST, normalization of GGT levels, but again, more importantly, albumin and cholinesterase significantly improve in this cohort of patients. Again, evidence for improvement of synthetic function of the liver, a very important variable in these patients. In this study, we showed also a significant decline of artery and a significant decline of FIT4. While I don't think this is a, a decline of fibrosis, I think this is a major decline driven by ALT normalization because ALT are included in both these uh, non-invasive tests. There is a lot of experience from France. This is a, a large multi-center study from France. What they did on the left, they used two milligram monotherapy up to two years in a small number of patients. And what they showed Again, a progressive increase of virological and biochemical and combined responses by extending therapy from week 48 to week 96. But on the right-hand panel, you see that also they were able in some selected patients to start what we call a de novo combination therapy, two milligram plapeg interferon. And what is very interesting is the week 48 virological responses were excellent, 63% PCR negativity compared to 33. So much higher virological responses in combination compared to monotherapy. However, if you look at week 96 data, you see that the data in terms of biochemical and virological response are very similar to the um, what has been observed with two milligram monotherapy. So probably a very good structure at the beginning, but I'm not sure I don't think this is a good strategy uh, if prolonged for more than one year. But what's about patients with decompensated liver disease? Actually, you know, you cannot, or you could not use this drug in decompensated patients because the EMA approval is only for compensate, child A. However, in this study, which has been um, presented very recently, very recently published by a multi-center European, a multi-center German study, while they look at the five patients uh, with uh, decompensated liver disease, but be careful, four child B, uh, only one child C. Two milligram monotherapy, RNA decline, ALT improvement, and even some improvement of platelets. And these are really the first data on child B patients. So what we did, we also look at our cohort of patients. We did, we identify eight patients with decompensated liver disease defined mainly at child B patients. And again, you see LT levels, RNA levels, bilirubin, alpha fetoprotein, albumin, INR. Again, no major disadvantages uh, in, in these patients and maybe definitely a virological response and also a biochemical response. But remember the EMA indication is only for compensated patients. What's about extension of therapy for more than two years? There are two paper, two patients which has been published. This is from Italy on the right hand side, the one from Austria, published uh, one year ago, Jay Patal. While well, these two patients were treated with long-term monotherapy after three years, excellent biochemical virological response in both patients, no virological breakthrough at all during therapy. And in red here, you see in our patient, excellent, and I mean really excellent clinical response. Platelets almost normalized, liver stiffness almost normalized, esophageal viruses disappeared. Well, then the question is, can you stop therapy? Well, actually, we don't know really whether we could stop it and when we could stop therapy with bulletproof type monotherapy. But this is a nice single case that we published very recently on Jay Patol, and this is a case of the, who was treated for three years with monotherapy and then stopped therapy 
decontinued TDA for hepatitis B, but stopped any therapy for hepatitis delta. He underwent two liver biopsies in the last liver biopsy of therapy. There was no evidence of cirrhosis anymore, much less fibrosis. He had compensated cirrhosis with viruses at the beginning of the story. And then most importantly, no evidence of delta antigen, no evidence of HDV RNA in the second liver biopsy, but also in the first liver biopsy. And very interesting, he remained as antigen positive. So it's, it is possible to achieve delta cure with bulevertide monotherapy? The answer is yes. Is frequent? The answer is probably no. What's about safety? Well, only one slide, which is summarizing the data presented by Heiner Wedemeyer, you know, almost one year ago, and is showing the increase of bile acids in the 301 registration study in patients treated with control, so no active therapy, two milligram and 10 milligram, is there is clearly a dose-related increase of bile acids, and when you stop therapy, you see a decline in normalization. This was not associated with pruritus, itching, or any specific uh, symptom. And also in our clinical practice, this drug is very well tolerated. We do see increase of bile acids, but no uh, side, uh, you know, um, side reinjection reactions. None of our patients ever discontinued this therapy for drug um, complications or adverse events. Is this the, a perfect drug for hepatitis delta? Well, it is not. It is a long list of issues still open with this therapy. Daily injections make adherence, patients' adherence very relevant. For now, it is not a short-term therapy. It is a long-term, duration unknown. Monotherapy may be in some patient combination with interferon, but it is unclear. There is no S antigen loss. There is basically no cure of hepatitis delta for now. There is 10, 20% with primary virological no response. The complete response PCR negativity is only 20% at year one, but increasing over time. Safety beyond year one or year two is very limited, and there is no evidence of clinical efficacy, no data or hard clinical points, but I have to tell you, and I showed you, we were able to show an improvement of albumin levels. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I think there is a lot of excitement, excitement in the scientific community, patients association, in our patients, because for the first time ever in 45 years, we have a new approved, at least in Europe, drug for hepatitis delta is bulevertide, is first in class entry inhibitor, targets NTCP, preventing viral spread into the liver, has been approved by EMA in 2020 at a dose of two milligrams sec subacute treatment for adult patients with compensated liver disease. The strategy for now is a long-term suppressive therapy, optimal duration unknown. Phase two and three showed efficacy and safety of the drug. Many real-life data confirm that this is also efficacious and safe in patients with compensated disease. Extension for or therapy for more than one year is effective and safe. And there are very preliminary data from Germany and from Italy suggesting that this could be used eventually in child B patients. But again, we have to be very careful on these very few patients. There is no evidence yet that bulevertide monotherapy improves outcomes and survival, but albumin levels are increased. Overall, probably combination therapies will be likely to be required to cure most of our Delta patients. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Pietro, for that very clear and uh, thorough exposition. We'll, we'll get back to you during the uh, panel discussion. I know I have several questions for you. And now we'll move on to uh, Professor Wiener, uh, who uh, has made innumerable contributions to the hepatitis literature uh, on an international stage for many years and uh, has been focusing very heavily on hepatitis D. Heine, welcome. Thank you. Um, very nice uh, to be part of this. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Um, I have control now of, of sharing the slides. It would be great. 
Um, so uh, the my task is basically to discuss with you the other drugs being in development. And uh, uh, Chris already covered uh, interferon lambda in extent. Uh, so I will rush through some slides and say some slides, and then we may have some, some more time for the panel discussion. So again, um, uh, the, the field is very interesting. I'm right now here presenting from Hanover Medical School, um, uh, rather green city. And uh, the advantage for us is that we really have a, a very good translational environment where we can not only follow clinical cohorts, but perform translational studies. These are my potential disclosures. Um, and uh, this includes companies developing drugs, both against hepatitis B as well as hepatitis D virus infection. And um, so obviously if uh, I've been asked to talk about alternative therapies, the question is why uh, we discussed the pros and cons of PEC interferon alpha with limited efficacy and side effects. And Pietro just uh, very uh, nicely uh, showed you the benefits of bulivitide, but also the unanswered question, including long-term treatment, uh, the still uh, not for all patients, we may have the optimal dose. Um, uh, he showed very good response rates, but not all patients response. So we do not have the 100% 100 response, 100 response here. It's a drug that needs to be injected. Um, we have this bile acid elevation, which um, in the long term, uh, we don't know really the consequences. Uh, uh, we also have to keep in mind that there may be some drug-drug interactions, and uh, we have uh, the very few inverse data and decompensate patients with um, uh, Pietro just mentioned to you. So Lambda, I will rush through this because... Was, uh, Chris uh, commented on, on this compound elegantly. I just have to highlight uh, that the drug has already been studied in mice um, and that there have been similar responses um, when they compared PEC alpha versus lambda and entecavir. This is from the group of Maura Dandri in Hamburg. Um, and uh, of note, there were also some S antigen declines. And I think this is still something we have to keep in mind also with lambda, uh, which is the ideal endpoint in the long term, obviously. And they had very nice uh, 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 pictures uh, from these mouse models and also with human uh, that were transplanted with human hepatocytes. And you can see here uh, the HDV positive cells, and uh, you'd find them in lesser extent when the mice have been treated with alpha, but obviously also with lambda, which was very important. And the clinical trial, uh, which was published on February 20 um, uh, by the group from Israel and Pakistan, Chris uh, uh, explained to you in detail, and therefore I will not go into this uh, in more time. I just want to highlight that we have a patient flow here that um, also with lumbar, some patients discontinued in both arms, and that uh, uh, there were uh, two patients actually in Pakistan that were switched from the initially uh, intended 180 microgram um, dose to the 120 microgram dose because some bilirubin elevations which were observed in Pakistan uh, that did a very nice follow-up uh, on these patients and there was no evidence of severe uh, dili uh, in this respect. Uh, we can may talk about this during the discussion and uh, therefore not much more to add on lambda at this stage. Um, what I think, and this is the last point I mentioned here, so the response factors for lambda are needed because Chris showed you the good responses. But again, not every patient is responding. Uh, we have um, in that trial, we had the 36% response rates. And so, um, and then in the long term, if we would have lambda in our hands, the question is, should we give it to all patients up front? Are there factors um, that would allow personalized use of lambda? And then we may need to go back to alpha. So uh, uh, also for alpha, we do not really have good factors. And we just summarized um, with Lisa Sandman and Liver International um, uh, a lot of data that have been published for alpha. And then when you look at response factors in interferon treatment for chronic HDV infection, um, it's important to note, for example, that liver cirrhosis per se is not a negative response factor in Delta. 
And we need obviously similar data for Lambda, but it's likely that some of these response factors which have been identified or not or excluded for alpha may also be important for Lambda. Uh, then when we think about alpha, we have to talk IL-28B genotype, which um, actually there's no data for strong evidence that this helps in Delta treatment. Uh, viral genotype, yes, there is this uh, data from France and from the UK, the genotype 5 infected patients which may respond better to interferon treatment, but this may be heavily biased um, by a very different patient characteristics in these cohorts. So the genotype 5 infected patients from Africa were usually younger, they had milder liver disease, and, and this may have... Uh, it may explain in part the better response rates. Um, then obviously all these viral factors, viral load before treatment, viral kinetics during treatment, viral dominance patterns, uh, B versus D, um, there is some evidence that let's say a better viral decline may translate into better long-term response but it's not as clear as in hepatitis C or B, that in hepatitis C in those days when we measured HCV RNA at week three, or at, at, at day three, at week four, at week 12, and could really personalize treatment duration, we won't have these data for hepatitis D virus infection. Then I've been asked to cover briefly nucleate acid polymers. Um, this is uh, something which is uh, very interesting. Uh, so the HDV RNA uh, uh, and PUD envelopment is uh, inhibited by these drugs. Uh, let's say excretion of uh, particles is blocked by these nucleate acid polymers. Um, and uh, there have been quite some studies being published uh, in vitro and also in animal models. And we have seen these data of patients, uh, 12 patients being treated in Moldavia for, for 10 years now, um, where patients received the nucleate acid polymers um, for um, uh, three to four months, and then interferon was added, and then interferon was maintained for a year, and then patients were followed. And one can see really here dramatic HPS antigen decline, basically two groups. HDV RNA decline was observed in almost all patients. Some patients relapsed already during the interferon phase, um, and a uh, few patients relapse after the end of interferon treatment. So the data are obviously uh, impressive, but this was associated also with a significant increase in ALT levels in the majority of patients, which were considered of being benign or beneficial ALT flares, which occurred mainly during the phase when interferon was added and not so much during um, uh, the NAP monotreatment, but also some patients really had a flare. The long-term follow-up of these patients has been published, uh, I think, three years ago in hepatology communications. And uh, it was it's quite interesting to note that the patients who had an HDV RNA decline, that uh, uh, this was usually maintained. Um, if this was observed uh, 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 at the end of treatment, then this was target not detected, maintained uh, in seven patients for 3.5 years. Um, here were four patients who relapsed. Um, and uh, it's uh, considering also the boulevardite data that Pietro just mentioned, it's important to note that even with the NAPs, there were some patients um, who maintained an HDV RNA response, even though HBS antigen uh, reappeared in the long term. So you can see here these three patients that had a quite substantial S antigen rebound, but these patients maintained HDV RNA undetectability, which I think is um, quite interesting. And you can see here that even if the patients had significant flares uh, during this treatment, which I showed you before, that in the long term, most of these patients had uh, very low or normal liver enzymes. So these uh, transient flares, even though it, it's obvious, an obvious concern in patients with liver cirrhosis, uh, they did not have um, long-term persistent elevation of ALT. If RNA was target not detectable, if HDV RNA uh, was detectable in the long term, then some of these patients also had elevated liver enzymes as to be expected. So um, the, for these compounds, we, we, we lack really uh, controlled larger trials, prospective trials. But during the last month, we have seen additional case reports presented uh, during ESL, ASLD, and also 
in February during the Apasal meeting in Taipei. Uh, this is just one example uh, where patients, uh, for example, even after bulivertide treatment in France, have received um, uh, nucleot acid polymers and they showed a substantial decline, as you can um, see here in uh, uh, markers of HPV, uh, HPS antigen. Here's the HDV RNA shown. This is just one example. There have been uh, 10 to 20 cases being presented during the recent meetings. Um, and I'm sure that we will see more data also during ESO this year. Uh, it's uh, Interesting, but obviously the most important thing is that we have a standardized controlled trial to really judge about this um, interesting data. And finally, Lorna van Nippa, I've been asked to cover uh, the whole story started and Emmanuel Gordion explained to you the biological background, why to use lornafenib um, that's uh, as a prenylation inhibitor, uh, basically uh, building of the particle and release of the particle is blocked if you if you block this process. And Chris Cole published on Lancet ID, uh, the pivotal study performed at the NIH where dose-dependent HDV RNA uh, decline was uh, seen here uh, during treatment. And you can see here this um, during the first four weeks of treatment, all patients had this HDV uh, RNA decline. And this was clearly dose dependent um, and was uh, linked to the mean serum lonafenib concentration. So the higher this concentration, the more pronounced they, uh, was the HDV RNA decline in these patients. And then the first uh, larger case series exploring different doses was published by Gian Yudaidin in 2018. Uh, importantly, uh, the drug can be boosted with ritonavir. And uh, you can see here that this, this led to a more pronounced HDV RNA decline, also considering that the drug may induce a dose-dependent uh, GI toxicity. And therefore, this um, boosting uh, was uh, uh, considered to be one strategy to uh, have optimal doses without further increasing side effects. And then the other point was obviously to combine this with pegylated interferon. And there, here, they could also see interesting declines. Then this was the first, basically, screening of very few patients per groups. Then the, the follow-up then with larger numbers um, was published, published by Chian Jodaidi in, in hepatology in 2021. And again, here using this lower dose of lornafenib, if I would go back, you can see here doses up to 300 milligram were used or 100 milligram boosters with ritonavir. They then went for the lower dose of 50 milligram BID in combination with ritonavir. And there you can see if you combine this with interferon, a much more pronounced um, HDV RNA decline was seen. So very promising. Then a large and the thus far largest phase three trial ever in Delta uh, was initiated by IGA, and we do not have a full scientific presentation or a full scientific uh, publication, but we have a press release. And this press release, uh, which uh, was made, made, made available in December 2022, uh, contains, there's also on the IGA website data and slides, and uh, which I just copied here. And uh, the, the trial was investigating 175 patients, lonafenib plus ritonavir for one, 40, one year, 48 weeks. Uh, and what was available now is a week 48 data. So we do not know yet the follow-up data. Then there were 125 patients receiving lonafenib ritonavir in combination with alpha. Uh, there was also a group receiving alpha alone, but this was smaller. So when we talk about efficacy, we all have to keep in mind that the initial trial was not designed to, to identify differences between um, alpha and these respective arms. The hypothesis was to compare this to placebo, uh, but this was just added to, to get a better feeling of the kind of responses, which I think was a very wise decision. And this is uh, the primary endpoint, which um, or uh, the virological response, not the, the combined endpoint. This is the slide from the deck. So showing the virological responses to log decline or more only and the ALT normalization. And you can see here, 
that learner from the balloon achieved this endpoint in 14.6%. If you combine this with um, interferon alpha, one third of the patients received this virological decline. But this was also seen in 19 of the 52 patients receiving alpha alone. And this translates into the respective normalization of ALTs. Why again, if interferon alpha alone is used, then uh, on treatment, this is week 48, less patients normalized ALT. Now you may ask, so, this data looked different to the, the previous paper published by Chian Yodaidin, which was 20, week 24 data. And I think this is probably the most important slide of this um, IGA deck, uh, where you can see here that uh, the lonafilip and known patients, with, um, they had a viral decline confirming the, the previous data, but this response was lost during further treatment and week 40, until week 48. This is the mean log HDV RNA decline. And this translates also on the right side. You, you have many patients improving liver enzymes, but then with this increase in HDV RNA, also ALT levels increased again. And then when you look at the, the combination arm, you have a, and again, this is perfectly in line with the paper published by you have a more pronounced HDV RNA decline if you combine lonafenib with alpha, and week uh, 24 was presented in that paper, and you can see here a very nice uh, difference. And during further treatment, then also some of the responses in the combination arms were lost, while with the alpha alone, we had a constant further decline during one year of treatment, and then therefore there was no difference anymore. And uh, while if you use alpha alone during early uh, uh, times, you do not have an LT decline here. So I think that is interesting. We may discuss what this means. I think we need um, more data of treatment. What was interesting also that they come for the first time really showed uh, paired biopsies and a substantial number of patients. And here uh, in the combo group, they had a combined endpoint, uh, two-point improvement in inflammatory scores and no worsening of fibrosis. And again, this was seen in 53% in the combo group um, and uh, in 27% on the placebo groups. Um, obviously, this is the effect that we know from all liver trials, NASH, uh, previous hepatitis C trials, that also some patients, if you include them in trials, they have a different behavior, they drink less alcohol and then improve liver and uh, histology. And there's also a sample uh, variability. And therefore, I think this explains, but uh, this effect was clearly more often observed uh, in the combination group. Um, the drug uh, the, uh, had uh, led to some treatment discontinuations, which I think is important, um, which we have to keep in mind. Um, uh, so it's not free of side effect, even without interferon, um, but the overall number of patients with serious treatment adverse events um, was, uh, let's say with 15% in the range that may have been um, expected and also in the placebo group, some patients had um, um, uh, uh, serious treatment emerging um, infection uh, events uh, slightly higher, um, but let's say not something that really surprised us. Uh, and finally, and Chris mentioned this, is lonafenib has also been uh, studied in combination with lambda. And as he presented this data in detail, uh, I will just remind you, we may come back to this in the discussion. And that is my last slide. So um, we have ongoing clinical trials uh, for lonafenib. Off-treatment data will be important. The lambda phase three trial is recruiting. We have um, nucleic acid polymers and uh, phase two data have been presented presented. Uh, I want to mention that also as iron against HBS antigen are being studied in phase two trials and as well as monoclonal antibodies against HBS antigen, uh, which obviously is an interesting approach and would be, uh, I'm curious to see more data on these two additional ideas which are currently being tested in HPV infection. And lastly, we would like to invite you to Hanover uh, following the last extremely successful Milan meeting um, uh, with uh, on Delta Cure, uh, which Pietro organized um, in Milan, and we invite you to Hanover October 5 to 6. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Heiner. Thank you so much for the very thorough and uh, clear talk, and we'll get back to you with some questions shortly. And now, last but not least, to conclude the uh, didactic part of the program, my uh, dear friend and colleague, 
Bob Kish who will give us a summation of the current status and where we've come from. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Fantastic meeting. Great morning. Thanks, everybody, for staying for this. And I was uh, asked to just talk about the last three years, and I'm going to make sure what you hear now is a, in any of the other talks. I think the talks have been great. They've been complimentary, a little bit of overlap, but with you know the twists and turns that uh, each individual expert could talk about. But we're going to talk more about some real world settings. So screening for Delta hepatitis has been a huge problem. Every article about epi keeps stating, we don't have good epi because we don't have good testing. We don't have good tests. You heard that earlier this morning with Kachin's question, can you even get the Delta testing in the US? You know, LabCorp and Quest probably make up 60 or 70% of the reference labs. And one of the two main labs doesn't even have Delta testing. So how do we even know what's going on in the US? The uh, program that's the Hep B Echo in Philadelphia that Catherine Freeland uh, runs, we keep talking about checking for Delta and they say we can't get Delta because our contracts with LabCorp and LabCorp won't send it out to anybody else. Though so we've got problems. So we're trying to get those resolved through a number of our different pathways. So what about guidelines? Our guidelines are pretty succinct. They're pretty focused. Like, I think they could be better and just saying everybody needs to be tested. But what's actually happening in the guideline setting in both academic and primary care settings, this is looking at the easel guidelines in 2017 in Spain. And I think it's really important to look at this screening cascade along the, the left side and talking about antibody screening in this setting was, I think, 8%. Uh, so this is a huge problem, uh, places not following the guidelines. And uh, finally, in those people who had antibody screening, who are antibody positive, there's another problem with not, uh, all the patients getting HDV RNA testing done. So we'll talk about reflex testing and call back in a few moments, but this is a you know superb academic hospital linked with primary care centers, and they can't follow the guidelines at a major level. We've talked about long-term outcomes today. Tatiana went over this in really good detail, as well as Emmanuel Gordian. So I think this is important. But this is bringing us up to what's happening today. This is a German study, 175 individuals with Delta infection, co-infection, uh, um, and following those people, and then comparing them to hepatitis B mono infection. When I'm saying co-infection here, I'm talking about simultaneous infection. And those patients with cumulative event-free survival on the left showing really, really poor uh, outcomes in HDV infection. And then the middle graph is looking at patients without cirrhosis. So we're saying, well, the patients with cirrhosis are going to do worse. That's usually pretty obvious. The cumulative event-free survival is all comers. But let's take out the patients who should have a better prognosis. We've got a very, very good long-term follow-up here going out 15 to 30 years showing that these patients do uh, worse as well. A couple of just key points in the little grid on the right side and looking at the multivariate analysis, what I always teach my primary care providers when I call gastrohepatologists is you've got a lab test right in the chart that can help you stage your patients, and that's the platelet count. And I think the platelet count just carries forward with a lot of our other FIB4 and APRI and other tests. That's a, a way to detect those patients with more advanced disease. So I think there's some little pearls that are um, buried in these uh, different articles, I think, that are quite useful. Well, liver transplant patients, uh, this is a, a publication from Italy. It's a retrospective single center study, but there's a large number of individual patients, 290 patients who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive. This is quite current. This is over the last decade, 2010 to 2021. And they looked at those individuals and they found 50% of those hepatitis B patients were Delta infected as well. Now, this is Italy. This is probably not quite reflective of what we're going to see in North America. But if we have under testing in the US, we're going to have an underestimation, even in the transplant setting and stage liver disease setting, about who has Delta infection. The other pearl that came out of this publication is very similar to what was published almost 30 years ago from DDA Samuel and New England Journal of Medicine that patients who are co infected or have simultaneous infection with B and Delta have better survival. And this relates, we think, to Delta suppressing hepatitis B. And in the immunosuppressed setting, patients with Delta infection don't appear to do worse. And in fact, they may do a little bit better. 
It's also interesting that in this setting, these patients are immune suppressed and these centers are not describing flares or reactivation or more aggressive Delta infection in the setting of immune suppression. So I think that's a very important uh, finding. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this because the patient perspective is what we do at the Hepatitis B Foundation. We're really trying to carry this message forward. I've emphasized in many different settings that the guidelines seem to be academic, written for academicians. They're not really talking to the patient, talking to the provider about talking to the patients. Stigma, quality of life, other important issues such as infectivity, which comes back to stigma as just not grasped. So we really need to be doing with our next guidelines, taking into account that we're really dealing with human beings. We're dealing with patients. And this looks at the HDV disease burden and what is actually happening in the patient setting. So dissatisfaction with, uh, with disease information on diagnosis, 100%. Negative impact on patients' mental health, 80%. Stigma from healthcare providers, 30% worse in the family and social environment, 70% family and friends. And then this healthcare practitioner awareness of HDV drove satisfaction with care, 90%. So there is many, many flaws that we need to deal with here. Motivated uh, to persist with uh, relevertide, 100%, which is good in the sense that we're actually carrying a message forward when you're going to be treating a patient. So I think our Hepatology providers who are experts in the bulevertide world are keeping these patients on. And although this is a daily injection, it's got very, very few side effects. Um, and then there is this issue about feeling of hopelessness without access to tolerable treatment. This is back to the U.S. We've had a delay in getting access to bulevertide. So this is in the news. It's in the, the Delta community, but we don't have access in the U.S. yet, although I'm optimistic that'll take place next year with changes in manufacturing and administration. This is a really important paper from Homi Rizavi and his work with his son, taking a look at prevalence uh, data. They selected a series of countries where they had access to accurate information. And some of these are high, some are moderate, some are low uh, prevalence uh, environments. So this isn't really a bias sample. It's more of a sample where they would felt that they would have accurate information. And they had unadjusted and adjusted calculations of anti-HDV positivity and RNA positivity. And a lot of the problems with um, epidemiologic data in the past has been people sometimes report Delta antibodies, some report Delta RNA, some report both. Uh, and as you know, some labs have defaulted to IgM testing in the past. IgM testing for Delta infection has a very, very narrow utility, and I discourage clinicians from ordering Delta IgM. I don't think it's useful. You can actually order Delta I, uh, antigen testing in the U.S. through one of our reference labs, which I also think doesn't have clinical value, and its accuracy in the setting of establishing epidemiology is also a problem. So now we have 2.2% of this global uh, anti-HDV positive among hepatitis B surface antigen positive patients. And then we have a number here of 68% are being Delta RNA positive if they're antibody positive. I think this, the message this morning from Emmanuel Gordian is we can trust Delta antibody to indicate either current or exposure to Delta infection. We're improving our trust level on RNA testing. I know a number of the labs that I work with, including Quest and AREP, have gone through refinements of their Delta testing to come up with very, very high performance characteristics. So having a false negative HDV RNA in the US, if you go to AREP or Quest, I believe is under 2%. So if you have a negative Delta testing in the US, you're, that's very likely to be an accurate value. Now I'm gonna come back for a moment and just put a question mark behind that because of this issue of genotype. I work in San Diego at an FQHC. We have a large population from East Africa and from Sub-Saharan Africa. I have a number of patients, about 10, who are Delta antibody positive. They're all HDV RNA negative. I said, how could that be? We really should be finding between 40 and 60% of patients who are antibody positive should be RNA positive. Is it because we have a challenge in the US with genotype testing? And we do because it's hard to get African genotypes to standardize a US test. It's hard to get access 
to serum banks or um, accurately profiled patients. So if um, when ARUP goes through their next phase of bringing their um, Roche assay online, I'm going to go back to my Delta antibody positive patients in San Diego and retest those. The good news is all those people who are RNA negative had normal ALT levels and minimal fibrosis on fiber scans. So we actually staged them. In the end, it may be accurate that they're RNA negative, and it may be something peculiar about the um, African genotypes where they have a higher chance of spontaneous clearance. But in the end, I do trust antibody testing. So there's data on reflex testing. Uh, Nancy Rowe, who's here with us, has really done a good job on um, describing under testing in the U.S., specifically in her Chicago population. And there's data coming out that reflex testing does enhance care. There's a really good study in England that has been published. I'm not going to review, but this is about patient recall. And I had a meeting this morning with Steve Taglienti, who's our leader for the CLDF meetings, about going into the U.S. and doing recall in large GI practices to get these patients to come back and all get Delta antibody testing. And this is quite productive. It didn't change the anti-HDV antibody prevalence. You're in the 6 to 5% range here. But they were able to bring in a large number of patients for testing and identified a substantial number of patients who are um, HDV uh, positive and, of course, link those patients to care. So I think recall testing, because we have EMR, we have databases, will be part of our next phase of uh, managing Delta in the United States and hopefully globally. Uh, this is a really important study that Robert Wong did. This is a screening in special populations in the US. He's been doing a lot of work both in the VA and in the safety net um, hospital networks that are present also. This came up with a low screening rate, although a little bit better than we've seen in the past at about a 30% and a 9% prevalence of HDV among chronic hepatitis B patients. In the VA, the screening rate was a little bit lower, around 20%. That's typically a number that we use um, I, when I describe Delta testing in the US and where that's been a failure and a lower prevalence rate of 3%. But if you put the 3% and 9% together, it kind of brings us back to the 6% value that we think about in the US if we're going to be describing uh, Delta prevalence in a general population. I do work in San Jose. We have a very, very large population of Vietnamese and Chinese patients. My uh, colleague in that group, Hui Chin, and some of his colleagues started testing for Delta, didn't find it, and then they quit. I think they probably tested about 50 patients. I think in the Asian immigrant population in the U.S., unless there's high-risk behavior, it hovers around 1%. But I think at a 1% of a 70% fatal disease, that it is still time to be testing everybody who's surface antigen positive for antibody. The antibody test is inexpensive. You don't I mean, Then you reflex RNA testing, and that is, I believe, cost savings. I think this is my last slide. This is the Mount Sinai Health System data, looking at over 11,000 patients with hepatitis B. Very, very low screening rate for anti-HDV uh, in those individuals. And what I'd like to highlight here is that 18%, that's a little red bar, had no risk factors. So we know risk-based testing for HIV has failed. We moved to testing everybody. Hepatitis C, risk-based failed. We need to move to testing everybody. As of a week ago, hepatitis B has finally moved into that space after much contemplation for over a decade. And I think Delta testing really needs to be all patients. Risk-based testing fails. And this is a serious illness, very high mortality rate. You've heard this natural history data today. It's just time to make this simple. We really need to make hepatitis B and Delta testing reflex testing and linkage to care as simple as possible for us to get to elimination. The guidelines are extremely academic, very well detailed, but they haven't moved the dial. We have the same death rate for B and Delta that we had 10 and 20 years ago. And I think the guidelines need to take into account. We have uh, elimination goals. We have goals of decreasing cirrhosis and liver cancer, and we're only going to get there by a very, very simple uh, process. Finally, Prevalence of Delta and an HIV hepatitis B co-infection model. This is looking at almost 600 patients who are co-infected. 
eight sites, 597 patients were looked at, 4% were uh, Delta antibody positive, and about half of those patients were HDV RNA positive. So I think in this population, they also need to move through almost like four level of reflex testing, making sure we have B, C, and of course, if they're B positive, Delta information on those patients. Uh, there is this deficits in HDV care that was published by Nathani also. Under screening was the rule and no risk, significant absence of risk factors and a large number of patients. And I'm going to stop there. The next set of slides go into a little bit more detail on Robert Wong's uh, evidence, but my time is up and I think it's time to move to our panel discussion, Ira, if that's okay. Terrific, Bob. Thank you. Thanks. Come join me here. Tatiana, would you like to come up? And uh, I think everybody's still on virtually. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so Pietro and Heiner, are you there? Yes, we are. Wonderful. There, there are parallels in the data sets you each presented in terms of relapses occurring while patients are still on interferon-based therapy. Uh, first, uh, Pietro, you show the French data showing returns of virus uh, with pegan and bluvertide, and, and then Heine, you certainly showed us uh, from that press release that that's happening with peg with one ritonavir. So first, Pietro, what's what's going on psychologically in these patients? And then I'll ask the same question of Heiner. Well, you know, data from France are, are very, you know, very limited in terms of number of patients being treated with a de novo combination, PEG interferon and bulevertide, and the overall outcomes are very limited. So there is a, an initial impression, very initial, that if you use a de novo combination for one year and then you stop both drugs, you might get some patients with a sustained virological response uh, while if you treat for bullet, with bulevertide monotherapy for one year, this is not the case. So a potential advantage for a de novo combo, but again, very limited number of patients. I think we need more data. Today, I think it's very difficult to define which is the role for interferon in patients without cirrhosis. Thank you. And Heiner, are you, are you puzzled about what you shared us in the... Uh... <laughs> Triple arm with lenofarinib and pegatinafurin. Yes, I am puzzled. <laughs> I have to say, uh, I think we need to. This I can. I've seen the data. We can speculate a lot. Um, but uh, maybe Chris may comment whether he has also uh, seen, uh, let's say, rebounds during treatment in individual patients when this was combined with lambda. But again, that was only twenty four weeks. So I think we really have to to see because this. This uh, rebounds in the combination treatment were in the second half of uh, the year of the treatment. So um, it, it shows that something is happening with lonafenib, that you basically lose the responses and that that cannot be overcome with interferon. That's all what I see from this data. I don't know, Chris, whether you want to comment, whether you saw already maybe, maybe between week 12 and week 24, some of these increases in, in your trials. Yeah, thanks, Heiner. I mean, I, I think... For our early studies, you know, they seem to flatline and plateau. Um, uh, we, I, I think some of the artifactual appearance of the, um, you know, what might look like rebound was largely just due to small numbers and, and, and you know, putting all the, the, the data together. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're planning on doing a 48-week study um, with the addition of, you know, with Lambda and Lauren Harnib, and I think that will be really much more telling at that point, because then we'll really have the hard data. Are we pretty secure in assuming that since you're inhibiting prenylation, which is a host process, that we're not getting resistance? Um, I, so, so we have done um, resistance testing um, for uh, numerous of the Lauren Harnib based studies. Um, and we haven't really seen much in terms of resistance. Okay, thank you. Bob? I have a question about this um, episodes of elevated bilirubin that was reported in Pakistan. And I thought also in the BMS data with lambda interferon, when they did their large Chinese study, there was also some um, elevated enzymes and bilirubin. 
what do we need to do to figure this out, Chris? And maybe you can talk about the rest of the team here. Um, I think we need to sort it out, but do we need to do genetic testing or just not treat Pakistani patients? What, what are your thoughts? Um, so I, I think you bring up a, a really good point as it relates to the bilirubin elevations. I think even in the earlier studies, you know, that, the, that, that gave that signal, you know, they weren't necessarily solely Pakistanis, right? So, I mean, I think we have started doing um, some, uh, uh, you know, testing, genetic testing to see if there is perhaps um, something associated with that, but our numbers, again, just sort of too small. Um, you know, in, in, our, in our initial combination study with um, Lambda, you know, there, we only had about four or five patients who had bilirubin elevations. So it's hard to really, you know, do, you know, test them to see whether or not, you know, they're, you just can't do, there's just not enough end to put the data together yet. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping we, we, that's a plan to do in the future and we'll have to see, but I do agree with the group that we probably do need to figure out, um, you know, what's going on there with the bilirubin elevations. Yeah, Thanks. I think in the, in the paper they, they mentioned in the discussion that uh, they did read an extensive DDSIM platform analysis and uh, that, uh, let's say, this computer uh, computational model uh, basically excluded a direct uh, toxicity and it suggested we rather a transporter-based mechanism as the most plausible explanation for this uh, development of hyperbilirubin in the uh, and obviously this cries for some maybe also then genetic backgrounds in these um, Asian populations. Um, and uh, yeah, it will be simply interesting to, to study this obviously in the ongoing phase three trial. Fantastic. Um, Adam. Is our mic live? It's not. Uh, yeah, no, it is. Thanks. It's Adam Gehring uh, for those of you online. Um, you know, heard a lot about the interferons, lenofarmid, and uh, bulevertide, and, and, and Heiner, you were the only one that sort of put there on your last two bullet points on your conclusion slide about the HPV monotherapies, the SIRNA, the VIR-34, the anti-HPS oh. antibodies, and well, I, I, yeah, I wasn't aware of this data, and I was wondering if you know, the panel would ideally like to speculate on these, because it really seems like these could have a, a really massive effect, even in combination with bilivertide, you know, preventing in, in entry and also potentially even secretion of these viruses. What are your thoughts on how effective the siRNA, ASO, or, or the anti-HBS antibodies will be? Well, the, the trials that are ongoing are listed in clinicaltrials.gov, and we have, simply have to see. Hopefully, some data will be presented at EASL, and abstract has been submitted. Um, and then uh, we, we, we see more. Obviously, theoretically, it's quite interesting to block S antigen. Um, how effective this will be, the trials have to tell us. And there may be a profound difference in the idea of blocking S antigen production within a cell. And then, uh, obviously, you have still delta being around, which is not packaged, versus uh, blocking um, uh, let's say uh, targeting particles swimming around in the blood, preventing also entry, and then you may have partially also the bulivertide effect with this uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, so, so I suspect this, these two ideas are completely different. Maybe there's their even additive. Um, it's an additional interesting idea, and uh, the usual answer, we have to see the data. Of course. Thanks. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I have a question for Professor uh, Lambertigo. Uh, one is a clarified question. So those patients are continuing to nuke, right? Over the trial for patients. And for your case, you call it a cure. Has that patient lost the surface antigen or not? Will continue to nuke? Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, was not clear the question. Are you referring to the case no, no, that we discussed? You stop the treatment. So he was asking you whether the patient that has that had the maintained sorry the maintained response whether that's this patient's lost s that was the question. Yeah, right, right. S remains positive. He did not lose s. 
Uh, he, he's on nuke therapy long term. I would rather like you a question, maybe. Uh, would there's any uh, predictive value of baseline surface range level to the treatment response to uh, uh, blood, uh, the blood not, not in our studies. We did not see any. Um, any level of S antigen a baseline being able to predict anything. Actually, we showed no changes of S antigen during therapy. Heiner, any probably you got the same, right? No, at least let's say it may has not been investigated in each of the cohorts in detail because, for example, in our German cohort, uh, quant S levels were not available for all of the patients. Uh, but there was basically no clear, let's say that the patients with 50,000 S antigen responded less well, which I think was the question. This was not the case, but you have to keep in mind that most of the patients had S levels, let's say between maybe 2,000 to 10,000. So there were not that many with very high S antigen levels. Thanks. Dr. Crow. Hi, thanks so much. I'd um, like to ask a question to Tatiana, uh, and thanks so much for your discussion. When you were talking about indications for treatment for hepatitis D, you, you had said detectable viremia. I believe you said plus minus ALT elevation. Um, and so I was wondering in your uh, review of the literature, did you find anything about the prevalence of more advanced disease in those with relatively normal ALTs? One of the things I've just noticed in the protocols that come through and in the guidances are that we want an elevated ALT. We often fiber scan these people and do other non-invasive measures. They have significant fibrosis with ALTs that are seemingly innocuous by everybody's uh, guidances. And I'm hoping that we can move toward uh, addressing HDV without regard to ALT so much as a priority? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, as I mentioned, it seems like the guidance for Delta within the hepatitis B guidance is very similar to the guidance for hepatitis B where ALT elevation is involved. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know that it's specifically correlated with fibrosis stage. So I think, you know, even if they don't have elevated ALT, it's possible they have advanced disease and you really should offer treatment to those right. patients. Uh, so I agree it's probably more about the viremia and fibrosis stage as opposed to ALT elevation, particularly because I think a lot of these Delta patients are very um, inflammatory and, and it can mean many different things. They have autoimmune features sometimes that, that we see and um, ALT can mean many different things. So I think really ultimately it's about viremia and fibrosis stage. And you know, uh, it's even more parallel to hepatitis C. We went through a phase early in the evolution of HCV therapeutics where we regarded normal ALT patients somehow a different population. They weren't even allowed in the early trials in the interferon era. And of course that went away. I, I can't imagine that it won't be uh, the same with HDV once we have effective therapies, right? Sounds like you agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Hey, do you think they should be included in clinical trials at this time? I personally do, but what's your opinion? Uh, ALT cut off as an entry criteria? Yeah. I mean, it is the end point, right? So you, you want, uh, you know, so I, I, it's mixed because I think, you know, I have had patients with normal ALT actually who didn't qualify for participation in, in some of the clinical trials, even though they have HD viremia and they may have fibrosis. So mm -hmm. uh I would think that probably it makes sense to not include it because again, uh, they may have active disease and you know not not completely elevated ALT or two times the upper limit of normal, maybe mild ALT elevation. So why do we have the could ALT and HDV RNA levels really be on the same platform in terms of importance when we talk about endpoints? Should we have a composite endpoint or is it really all about the virus like it is in other realms? I've wondered about that. And we need to go to Heiner and Pietro about that question because we had a heated discussion for months about that white paper, right? So how many hours do we have, uh, Bob, <laughs> to discuss? <laughs> uh, <I> so, <laughs> no, no, and again, we, we, we mentioned this several times. I think the, the agencies, as far as I understood this, they, they wanted to see if, if you tested the drug, that the drug 
reduces a virus if it's an antiviral drug. So you need some kind of viral decline and the two lock is a compromise. That's all we can say. And then the other point is the agencies wanted to see as long as this association between viral decline and improved clinical long-term outcome, you, we have an orphan disease, we have biases, has not been established, um, uh, let's say on a, on a very hard level, uh, as a hepatologist, I believe in normal liver enzymes. And if you have an elevated liver enzyme, you can normalize this. I'm strongly convinced that this is a good thing for the patient. And uh, then basically this was combined for these regulatory purposes, which I can completely understand It's reasonable. Yes, this endpoint has not been associated with improved long-term outcome yet. Pietro mentioned the improvement in albumin levels, but... I think is very important. Um, and uh, uh, that's the best we have right now. We have to do our homework. And um, uh, let's say to what extent a distinct viral decline, whether this is uh, reaching a certain cutoff, which we discussed with Emmanuel earlier, or whether it's one log, two log, three log decline, uh, this is important. And we reported in our JHEP uh, reports paper that even those patients without the two log HDV RNA decline, that they had a profound improvement in ALT levels. And um, uh, so I think these are all questions which have to be addressed in detail. We will combine our data, but I'm 100% I'm convinced that this is um, a very pragmatic, good endpoint for clinical trials. And in real world, we have to analyze them separately to identify really which patients may benefit on, on which level. Yeah, how about the Delta ALT? So, um, for instance, uh, you know, we have central labs that we screen patients for. A upper limit of ALT is 51. Somebody comes in and, you know, their ALT is 45. You know, that's, we know this from the, as Iris said, from the hepatitis C and the hepatitis B days. I mean, those individuals, if you truly clear uh, and have truly good antivirals, they, they should have ALT levels much lower than that. And, and I just think moving forward, um, I, I think there is a pool of Delta patients that we're not including in these trials who need to be treated and hopefully we'll be able to evolve toward including them and just maybe redesign the endpoints uh, so that we can capture useful data from this population. Pietro? Yeah, well, I agree with Paul. Uh, I think um, ALT are very relevant as an endpoint, but we do have many or some Delta patients with normal LT and Delta active disease, maybe not really normal or near normal or, you know, very close to the normal range. Uh, and uh, in the endpoints, ESL ACLD conference that we had last year, and hopefully the paper will be submitted very soon to hepatology and J-hepatology, we highlight uh, really this issue. Uh, and we highlight how, you know, um, in some specific situations, you might want to start therapy independently, irrespectively of ALT levels in Delta, because of the natural history, because of all the issues, all the considerations that we made today. So indeed, we do see these patients. Actually, I think I've told you this privately before, but the single most eloquent and unforgettable moment for me at the end of this conference a few uh, months ago was when we publicly thanked the uh, European agency person sitting on the podium for the approval that they rendered in 2020 for Bulevertide. You said explicitly that that saved a lot of lives. Uh, I, I wanted to contribute to the way you said that. It's, it has stayed with me. For both you and me, I'll be fascinated to find out how the type gets approved uh, in the United States when her clinicians will be operating in the backfield. It's a turn to both of you because you are training in houses and knowledge about how to use the type and how you've been using it. I'd be very interested to hear if there's complete concordance between the two of you as opposed to any level of discordance about how you're both using the drug. Again, there's monotherapy only, is it long-term? Are you currently giving it as a maintenance therapy? You know the question. So Pietro, can you start with that? And then let's see what Heiner has to say. Well, you know, uh, this drug has been available in Italy only as a monotherapy. 
and only four patients with compensated cirrhosis with or without clinically significant portal hypertension. So we were not allowed, we were not allowed in the last two years to treat anybody else. And we were not allowed to use a de novo combination with PEG interferon. However, one month ago, uh, the local, let's say EMA, the national EMA, or if you wish the national FDA really approved the drug for everybody. So in exactly the same EMA indication, anybody with compensated chronic liver disease delta. So now we are going to start probably monotherapy, most of the patients, but maybe in some patients with my liver disease, we might think about the de novo combination. Heiner? Time. So in Germany, since September 2020, we can use the drug and we could have used this even in combination with interferon. Um, it has rarely been used, to my knowledge, in combination with interferon for the obvious reasons that the patients have been exposed before, they were afraid of side effects. The data on treatment that you have a synergistic effects are there, there's no doubt. My argument was always that this synergistic on treatment response has not yet been shown to translate into to robust off-treatment response. And if I have in the long term no benefit, why should I expose the patient to side effects? However, from the French cohort, they are now the very first data presented at ASLD that indeed the off-treatment response may be slightly higher, but compared to 10 out of 12 patients or something like this, so very small numbers. And they are eagerly waiting for the 204 data which uh, hopefully will be uh, presented soon. And then um, we have the answer and then I may change my mind. But at this stage, until I have this data, I'm using bulimatide as a monotherapy. Okay. Uh, and that's our current practice. And Chris, a quick question for you, then I'll, I'll yield back to Bob. An obvious question. Has there been any uh, consideration of combining lonofarinib and bulimatide? I think that would be a great opportunity to explore that from both, you know, scientific um, uh, level and also for a patient level. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, we're, we're all exploring different, um, you know, drugs that have different actions. Um, and there is, a you know, potentially com combining them just like, you know, he hepatitis C is done, it may be the way to go. Um, you know, I'd be happy to hear what Heiner and Pietro have to say, but I, I would love to see that. That's good. So I was going to ask Tatiana, we now are in 2024. You've got a patient in front of you, Lonafarnib's approved, Bulevertide's approved. How are you going to decide which one to use? Or are you going to make this jump to combo therapy? That's a good question. I mean, I think... One aspect is I hope that by 2024, we'll have more data to inform our choices, you know, pre predict predictive rules to say which type of patient may respond more to one versus the other. And in that way, no, you know, patients with certain fibrosis stage from certain ethnicities, maybe of certain genotypes may respond better to one versus the other. Um, but at this point, you know, we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons. And, and I think a lot of it will come down to kind of administration and side effect profile and a discussion with the patient about, um, you know, what is the most important to them and what are their priorities in terms of, uh, you know, quality of life uh, impact and, and side effect profile. So CDC is up and running late this year with genotyping. Who will you send to the CDC to figure out their genotype? Well, at the moment, I'm not sure it will benefit us because we don't have those treatments available. But again, I think as we learn more, hopefully that will be part of our um, criteria of thinking about who would benefit for one treatment versus the other. Uh, but at the moment, I'm not sure that, you know, genotype testing will inform much of what I do. I mean, you know, there's mention that genotype five may, may you know, cer certain genotypes may have worse outcomes, but, um, I don't think we're there yet for implementation and clinical practice. Yes, we talk a lot in hepatitis B circles. I'm sure you know this, 
about how long we'd be willing to give interferon if it proved to be beneficial in combination with some of these new antivirals. Is there the same sense that there may be a dosing, uh, in terms of the duration of therapy, dose limiting interval during which you can give lonofarnib? I, people talk a lot about the GI side effects, but obviously I've never used the drug. You have a lot of experience with it. How do you think about that? So in terms of the, you know, the GI related side effects, at least from our gathered experiences, you know, a lot of these side effects tend to go away by about, you know, week eight to 12. Um, they, they, and, and they're able, you know, from to, to continue just to go through the trial and, and be fine. You know, I, I think, um, you know, there is some experience with, with, you know, there's, you know, growing experience with 48 weeks of, of Lorna Farnib. Um, I think we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, it could, it, could it be, I, I think it could be potentially used more long-term. Um, you know, I, if you sort of look at the progeria cohorts, I mean, they're, you know, although the, you know, slightly different, they are using them really long-term now and they're in kids too. Right. So, I mean, um, I think, you know, they're sort of the forerunners of whether or not that could be used in long term as it relates to side effects, but um, we'll wait and see. Chris, can you comment on the dose that is used in progeria? I, that sort of escapes me. I think, I don't, I, I honestly don't recall. Ingrid, what's the dose of lonifarnib in progeria? We have Ingrid Chung here, she's coming right to the mic. Yeah, Lonafarnib um, has been approved uh, for progeria and processing deficient progeria laminopathies um, for 50 milligrams BID, 75 milligrams BID. Is that for long-term use, indefinite use? Long-term use, yeah. and there are patients who have been on that dose for over 10 years, mm -hmm. children. Uh are the GI side effects fairly easily in, uh, countered with uh, over-the-counter antidiarrheal preparations or the like? Yes, yeah. So they, they encounter similar types of these GI side effects that we're seeing in HDV, but they have been able to be managed and um, also has been shown that after typically around um, you know, uh, four to six weeks, they, they tend to mitigate, which I think Chris has also um, uh, witnessed in some of the earlier phase two studies. Mm, thank you. I have a question, Heiner. Um, there is, or there was a Delta database or Delta registry, I thought, through HDIN or through your institution. Am I hallucinating or was there a registry and does that still <laughs> exist? No, the, uh, the, the, the well, now I have an echo, sorry. So um, obviously the, the HDIN registry and we published in 2018, let's say a very brief descriptive analysis of uh, I think 18, 1400 patients or so. Uh, there is a follow-up um, of these patients uh, that actually uh, will or has been submitted for publication or is close to submission. And uh, uh, but uh, this is a, a very, let's say, scattered database. And it's a very, um, let's say the data have to be seen critically. There's no monitoring. There are now additional activities ongoing on different European countries to combine data. And this is uh, certainly very important to have, let's say, natural history data of more than one, 200 patients per site, but to have 700,000 patients and this is ongoing activities in Europe. I have one more question, if it's okay, Ira. Sure, sure. Uh, this is, goes to Pietro as the guideline master. Uh, how can we harmonize easel, apostle, ASLD? And the reason I think it's, I mean, it's important to have differences because that leads to more research, more dialogue, but it also leads to confusion, especially in something relatively simple like Delta hepatitis. Do you discuss when you're writing easel guidelines, do you have a connection or a bridge or an ombudsman, ombudswoman, I guess, to uh, a puzzle or ASLD to try to bring them closer together? So in terms of screening, I think US is moving to the European position. So screen everybody. 
So there is no need to talk too much about US colleagues because you are changing your opinion. And I think that's very good, very practical. In terms of antiviral therapy on the management of Delta, as you know, there is a, a easel Delta specific guideline CPG being developed right now. Uh, this will probably be available high in, in a few months, probably. And that's probably will be the first ever uh, Delta dedicated CPG for Europe. And probably that will be the first overall. And we are not discussing with unfortunately Asian colleagues or US colleagues uh, during this um, guideline is a fully European guideline. Tatiana, can you tell us a little bit if possible about what you're studying with regard to test screening and testing, reflex testing and so on? Yeah, so I think as some of the studies that Bob shared and, and one of the studies that we did back in the day in the VA cohort, obviously screening rates are very low, I think. Reasons for very low screening rates is really unfamiliarity with what is Delta hepatitis among uh, primary care providers and even gastroenterologists. And so people just don't think to screen for it. Um, and we have looked again, you know, in New York City recently, kind of looking at all the institutions together and again, found very low screening rates, even lower than Mount Sinai health system data. Uh, so we are actually embarking on implementing reflex testing, actually, in our health system. So we have lab buy-in, and they actually think it is very important. And so, uh, and thanks to your advice and getting grant funding to do that, we will be implementing it. And I think we'll be probably the first in the U.S. to actually do it kind of on a health system basis. So we'll see. We'll see if we're able to identify more cases. And then along with that, we'll have a linkage to care program so that they're referred to liver specialists and uh, potentially can benefit from treatment or participation in clinical trials. Just to give you an update on reflux testing, we're pushing pretty hard on AROP and Quest and hopefully LabCorp soon and Mayo when they're up and running to have all of them offer reflux testing. And we've gotten verbal that they're interested and it depends on there's a lot of bureaucracy involved with getting these set up there's also reimbursement issues and you don't want to retest somebody who's antibody positive too often for rna you really need to like we talked about today should be clinically indicated to retest somebody and then nancy you're uh, you know the master of under testing for chicago what what is happening in chicago i come up to the mic just so that there's a lot of people online. Thank you, Bob, for um, pointing out our success, unsuccess story. So I think a lot of it is the same thing that you said. When you have um, limited resources and contracts with something that doesn't offer a test, it's really challenging to get testing done. And so we know that there are hot spots where Delta is more likely to be present. And we do our best, like Iger had a beautiful program where you could get um, reflex testing um, in a hep B surface antigen positive patient to Delta antibody testing, mostly so we could help recruit for the study. And you hand those out and they take them to lab, but that lab won't send the sample to the place that the test can occur. And so I, I think that we're still driving awareness. We are still trying to use the EMR to recall patients, flag those. Um, but when you're, you know, the same thing is true with hep C, right? When you go to a primary care practice and you tell that primary care practice in the low prevalence area, please screen all of your practice for hep C. And they look at 15 people, not a single one of them has hep C. They're like, that person's stupid. I don't have any hep C. And so when we look at our data and we are just now um, working with county to look at all the HIV hep B because that's going to be enriched in IDU right we're auditing them to see how often they've looked for delta every single delta test has been negative and so when I'm telling county hey listen you really need to do this you have a high risk population they're like well look I did it on 15 people none of them have it it's hard for me to motivate them to say you have to keep looking because at a prevalence rate of 5%, some of them are gonna have it and it's gonna change their, their course. But we're, we're working on it. Um, you know, so okay, stay tuned. Every year we're gonna, I'm gonna be able to present, we have a 1% improvement in, and eventually in a hundred years, I'll be like, oh look, we've, we've screened them all. Thank you for your efforts. We love it. We've got the West Coast, got the Midwest, got the East Coast, got all these good representations here. So I think we're uh, making progress. I had one other question about establishing 
some type of serum bank for Delta. And I don't know, Chris, if that's something the NIH could or would do, or is there something that uh, exists? Because LabCorp came to me and said, how do we find Delta specimens? We want to work on our antibody and our PCR assay. So I sent them to a lot of people, including they called the manual. Manuel said, yeah, we have all these French rules because of COVID and shipping specimens. And oh my God, it was just impossible. How can we harmonize these testing and be able to ship specimens and help labs get new assays set up? Does anybody have a, a, a cure-all, one-stop shopping? I don't, I mean, I think, I think, um, sharing you know sharing of samples is or or finding us a, a way to develop a central repository um at least within the united states to to you know work on these samples together as a group is really important um within our uh, the nih we have samples you know going back probably about 20, 30 years now. Um, so we have a pretty robust uh, uh, repository of, of samples that, you know, we have um, shared with colleagues and, and you know, uh, to, to look at ways to, for testing and, um, you know, other things related to, to, to learning more about the virus. But I think, you know, as test as tests become more available commercially i think you know we probably need to figure out a way how we can create a centralized repository so that everybody can can have access to them um you know because delta is rare right i mean there are you know i think a lot of people in the audience probably you know don't have large cohorts that they can you know uh, pull on to to you know further study or even explore so I, th I think we just need to figure out a way to do it. Yeah, but yeah, right, Bob, uh, you could come to Europe. Together with Heiner, we are putting together a 1,000 Delta patients court. Uh, we have more than 200 Delta patients in my unit only. So that's easy. Just ask whatever you need and we will provide to you. In the meantime, the US colleagues will organize a sort of national or regional repository. But in the meantime, we can provide you all the serum, all the plasma you want for testing, for genotype, whatever. You know, we are available. Heiner, um, are, you, are you okay? Yeah. Nothing to add. Just ask. No problem. I'm going to send LabCorp to you next week if they're still okay, having no problems. Problem. Bob, as you very well know, some of the areas of the world with the highest prevalence of HDV infection are under-resourced. And I think that may even be an issue in terms of who the predominant numbers of infections are here in the US. You of all people must have been giving this a lot of thought. Can, can you comment on how we're gonna get these medications to patients who need it around the world? Fantastic question. I, you know, I would specifically have Mongolia, Pakistan, and the upper Amazonian Orinoco River valleys, right? Those are the, I think the three hottest of all hot spots. And I think once these drugs are approved at the US, and also we've got this EMEA blessing on these patients, obviously early access, then the companies need to start balancing out. That's similar to what the Gilead did with HIV and you know, look at dollar costs per GDP or some other economic you know, scale and get the drugs to these countries that need it. They're not gonna make money off Pakistan or Mongolia, but you know, I'm glad they're making profits off you know, EMEA or EU and make profits out of the US because we kind of fund the world. So it will be dialogue. I think as we, Ira, this is probably the most important question of the, the more, of, uh, the, the most important question because I think it's really, uh, it's an ethical question. We've been talking about screening and reflex testing and that's important. Let's say that uh, risk-based screening never works, but it's an ethical question to identify a patient with a disease uh, if you do not have to offer something. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then it's uh, the question whether screening is really ethical. And um, I think this is really the, the most important issue for the next years that uh, if we identify patients around the globe, that uh, we make uh, treatments available to these uh, uh, patients. Uh, and otherwise, um, uh, yeah, this was really a big problem. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Okay. Yeah.
Well, we think we're done with the panel. Any wrap ups from Heiner, Chris, or Pietro to give us some closures, at least on the Delta section? I'll, I'll wrap up the B section in a minute. Maybe one word from my side. I think uh, this is so important to have this uh, this discussion. And uh, even though in different circles we ask similar questions, but I think it, it's really important. Uh, still, we have to. Delta is rare, and uh, we also have in the end to personalize treatment. Not every patient is developing liver cirrhosis. We can wait in many patients, uh, and we have to find factors. Uh, addressing responses to all the drugs we discussed, Lorna, Lambda, Alpha, uh, as well as Bolivotide. And uh, we really need personalized treatment approaches. On my yeah, side, what? only one, one word, which is collaboration. Is a, a orphan disease, is a rare disease, is re rare in Europe, is rare in US at least. We need to collaborate, collaborate at any level, from serum samples, from the uh, clinical efficacy data from, you know, whatever long-term outcomes is really, is really, is really important to collaborate and to put together all the data we have and we are available. And I think from my perspective, you know, um, uh, both Heiner and Pietro, you know, hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have come a long way um, in this field and will continue to push further. You know, I'm, I'm excited that there are, you know, looking at, at, at who's in, interested in Delta nowadays, you know, this is a growing group. Um, back in the day, there were just only a couple of us. And, and now, you know, there, there are many young people who are interested in the science and, and finding therapies for Delta. And I think, you know, with collaboration and continued advancement, we will get there. Beautiful wrap up. Thanks so much. And we'll uh, let you all get back to your Sunday, various time zones. Thanks so much for being part of our Delta section of HBV HDV Act. We'll see you at Easel for HDIN meeting. That's next. And then, of course, Hanover in October. Uh, we do have momentum. It's fantastic. Thank you. Bob, I, I don't think it would be possible to spend three hours listening to a better series of talks or being enlightened about the state of the art in HDV science and HDV therapeutics. It's been a pleasure to, again, uh, organize and conduct uh, ACT HBV HDV with you. And I'll just pay a little tribute to you. I am uh, in never ending admiration of your energy, enthusiasm, and maybe as much as anything else, your passionate dedication to global public health. I just wanna share with the audience uh, an observation that I've made about Bob in our extensive and very pleasant interactions. In the organization of this program uh, and in my general dealings with Bob, I have found that he's usually in either one of two places, either some far distant country around the world, which the extent of which amazes me, or the other thing he might be doing is sitting in a car on the way to the airport to go to some far distant country around the world. I don't know how you keep going and doing this, but you're kind of unique in this way. And uh, you do have my admiration. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with you. And I re I'm going to call you now from my ballroom dancing event. So you'll have to, you have to add a third one on. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank, you, Thank you very much.